Welcome everybody and a very good morning to all of you. Um, as we present a very exciting program on the occasion of International Women's Day 2023, we have a fantastic list of very inspiring women who will participate today and I would like to thank each and every one of them for agreeing to participate, for agreeing to tell us about their very exciting research and for also uh, participating as panelists or the chair, okay, in what promises to be a very engaging panel discussion. Um, this program is part of our, uh, the RRI Platinum Jubilee celebration and so let's get going. I'll ask Professor uh, Tarun Sauradeep, our director, to kick it off. So good morning and uh, welcome to the Raman Research Institute. So let me first begin by you know, uh, extending my greetings, uh, convey my greetings and best wishes to all the women on this uh, women, uh, Women's Day, International Women's Day. And also, uh, in addition to what Ranjini said, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the invited party, uh, you know, speakers and my colleagues who are have joined here and also uh, the colleagues who have worked hard to organize this wonderful event. And all the members of the audience, uh, I understand that uh, there are a lot more online uh, than offline here. So let me begin by expressing my deep gratitude to Professor Rupmanjiri Ghosh uh, for agreeing to be the chief guest. She has been a pillar of support for the Institute and I really appreciate that. And also I'm sure that she'll be very inspiring for the younger uh, people in the audience uh, as a role model. Um, in this, on this day. Uh, Shubhra Priyadarshini, senior science journalist and editor Nature India, would be talking to us about the importance of communicating science to the world and to the general public. And then we have um, um, Tanushri Sahak Das Gupta talking on quantum materials in this era of you know, our thrust in quantum technologies. We have Sudeshna Sinha from Isa Mohali, who will talk about uh, understanding complex systems, and Shubhapati Goswami from Physical Research Laboratory, who will take us into the fascinating world of particle physics. So this is indeed a science feast, and, but however, in the context of the International Women's Day, it is important to realize that many such achievers have had to struggle past uh, gender inequality, you know, conscious, subconscious, social, cultural, professional, all kinds of biases. And uh, that remains very prevalent. And this is why we celebrate this day to remind ourselves that this remains a problem. And while we celebrate the commendable success of all our speakers and many others in the audience, we should also perhaps reflect on the many, many more who have been marginalized due to this uh, prevalent uh, inequity. I look forward to the panel discussion today, uh, which is on the UN theme, and uh, where uh, Professor Rupmanjiri Ghosh, uh, Professor Rohini Godbole, uh, Urvashi Sinha, Anushu Abhomi, who will discuss the challenges and promises of the digital world as we are walking into it. I mean, and in this context of, you know, gender inequity, equity and how it would address it, or is it going to present both challenges? I, I look forward to it. I don't know what the discussion would be like, but I would really look forward to it. And so once again, a very warm welcome and greetings on the Indi International Women's Day. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to call upon Professor Rupmanjari Ghosh, who, as Tarun said, has been a pillar of support for you know, many RRI activities in the past and, of course, will be today also. She's also our chief guest. So Professor Ghosh is the former vice chancellor of Shivnadar University, formerly from JNU. Uh, we've heard her giving you know, very exciting science talks. As you all know, she works on experimental and theoretical quantum optics, laser physics, nonlinear optics, quantum information, quantum measurement, and magneto optics. I would li now like to invite you to address the audience. So good morning. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, come to RRI, and today is definitely a very special day. Uh, special thanks to uh, Tarun, 
uh, your energetic director, and I can't forget uh, Professor Urbushi Sinha, who arm twisted me actually to be here <laughs> all day. Uh, but you know, I can't say that I'm regretting it. Uh, and it's a, it's a great honor uh, to be here for the International Women's Day, particularly because of what uh, you mentioned, that it's your Platinum Jubilee celebration part of that. Uh, I feel that we are celebrating uh, by today's uh, speakers, you know, as role models that uh, younger people can look up to. And really, <coughs> it's an honor to be sharing the stage with all of you. And uh, the future leaders would emerge from all the students and other members of RRI. What I thought I'll do in this very short presentation, and we'll come back <coughs> to the theme of the International Women's Day as given by the UN, and that says a digital innovation and technology for gender equality. That's the theme. And we are going to unpack it in the panel discussion, but I thought I'll throw my ideas today. Probably it would be easier uh, the, to, to, uh, to take it up from there though all the other panelists are not present uh, right now. So I start by reminding ourselves, uh, not today, but uh, 11th February as it is celebrated as the International Day of uh, Women and Girls in Science. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. So every 11th of February we do this. Uh, the theme this time was Innovate, Demonstrate, Elevate, Advance. That's the short form of idea and bringing communities forward for sustainable and equitable <coughs> development. <coughs> so the focus was on how the SDGs connect to the role of women and girls in science. So a lot of talk going on in there, and what is that goal of uh, UN Sustainable Development? Goal five SDG says achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. So the theme for me is really is about equal participation in decision making. If you could ensure that, the rest should be done. And I'll harp a bit on this word equal, uh, what it means. You know, in December, we had a very nice symposium here, and I talked about it a bit, but today I'm going to emphasize on that a little bit more. Uh, what does it mean to be equal? And we re do we really need an equal world, or we actually need a very unequal, diverse world, but ensure equity? Uh, so, as I said, that uh, the theme, uh, what we are going to discuss throughout the day and later, through examples of these great talks and the panel discussion more, is uh, innovation and technology for gender equality, again equality. And uh, the theme would be basically about talking about technology, innovation, and inclusion. So the technologists and scientists that would talk about how they have excelled, and then inclusion, how that leads to sustainability is a goal. <clears throat> so a little bit stepping back and uh, setting the stage right is that, uh, of course, today you can see by the presence in this room and on the online uh, participants, if you do a survey, you'd see that women are indeed playing a very significant role in higher education today. But there's still barriers. <clears throat> and Tarun mentioned that. And these are often invisible barriers, because in India, officially stated policies have no gender bias. And th these uh, barriers can prevent women from reaching their full potential. That's all that I care. Not that you have to be somewhere else, but whether you are being allowed by the system to reach your full potential. Each individual is different, and we need gender parity in the system. Now, uh, the main thing about a higher education institution, particularly a research institution like RRI, is that uh, we need to count on this resource that each individual <clears throat> is unique, and that's very important. So you do not want all rasgullas. <laughs> uh, you want variation, and that's essentially the thing about research. You need uh, diversity of opinions. You, need, uh, you do not want perfect harmony and homogeneity, because then research would be dead. There will be no creation of new ideas if there is no conflict, for example. So each individual is unique, and higher education institutions stand to benefit the most from this diversity. And the real challenge, therefore, as an institution, not individuals, I'm talking about an institution, is to frame and support policies and systems that cater to and respect the uniqueness and choices of an individual. Now, there is a very fine line between anarchy and a system which actually does that. So most people, it's not the military, right? You don't think in the straight line, don't follow orders. So you need to allow academic freedom you have to al allow diversity to flourish, at the same time maintain 
uh, a system uh, you know that is not anarch anarchic so whether it's a woman or any other gender i put it as the same problem whether you are a fat boy or a thin boy whether you are a strong woman or a weak one doesn't matter what you are but your strength should be fully utilized by the system and can we actually frames and support such policies and systems. So uh, <clears throat> there is still uh, uneven gender representation in STEM education. We'll talk about this a lot in the panel discussion uh, because the situation is indeed improving. And we'll give you some data, hopefully, from the panelists. And the major problem is the leaky pipeline between education and employment. You can say PhD to postdoc, postdoc to employment, in whichever way you take. Uh, there's fair representation of women in India in the education sector, but then somewhere you lose them, and there are reasons for that, the age, the family pressure, all of that. So we'll talk about why is it still like this, and I talked about this, I think, last time also, but I've sort of elaborated on that a bit, that uh, when you ask the question why, most people give you two reasons. Women tend to avoid competitive situations, whereas men prefer competitive tasks, so to move up, you need to be competitive, okay, whether you agree or not, but this you would hear a lot. Uh, then the second reason of the why people talk about an imposter syndrome, I hope uh, you probably feel it, I feel it sometimes, that involves feelings of self-doubt and fear, that your own skills are not sufficient. Now, it's not peculiar only to women. Men also have this uh, imposter syndrome problem, and uh, you struggle with this, but perhaps more women are affected because of this. And my one line, understanding of this is analysis is that these are conditions primarily acquired through our socialization. Uh, in patriarchal societies, this is what you see. So I'm just summarizing it up. There is not much time today now to talk about it. We'll probably come back to it when uh, we go to the panel discussion, if time permits. But the point is that it's not natural. It's not organic to that extent. It's conditional. You are conditioned by your socialization in the society to actually believe in that. There are also additional barriers and often unintentional. In a crowded bus, you step on somebody's feet, you don't even realize you're doing it. Uh, that's put up along the career path of women in science and technology. Some women ignore them and move on. You have enough examples here. But this is often at a high personal cost that nobody talks about. Okay, so I think we need to be aware of the situation so that, you know, I'm an optimistic uh, person, so that we find solutions of this together. So what are our goals today, the way I look at it? I need to feminize the higher education sector in general. Uh, it's not just throwing up leaders. If you could feminize the higher education sector, then women leaders will emerge or organically. More women participation, so leaders will emerge from such massification. I don't know if this is good English or not. But for, for now, we don't have it. So for now, leaders have to drive the change. The few people who are here who are in positions of responsibility, we all are actually. Whichever position you're holding, there are always people below you. You are responsible for them. So the leaders have to drive the change and lead the chain of empowerment. That's important. And the stories of successful women in leadership roles may serve as an inspiration, motivation, and model for others. I hope all of you take that back home where, at the end of the day today. So uh, we need to plan to build new and strengthen existing networks. We are doing that a lot. Uh, to develop strategies for and to sustain successful professional careers. Uh, and most importantly, we need to prevent a division of men and women into two opposing interest groups. Uh, with a, this is often lead to a net negative sum. All right thinking people have to be in this together. It's not that only women raise and fight for what people call women's issues. Come on, this is not women's issues. So uh, this is something that I really urge us to remember, that there is no segregation. There is only one right way of being. And uh, having said that it's morally correct to do it that way, I'm going to talk about how it is not just morally correct. It makes business sense to be in this together. So uh, our goal specifically for today, you know, this is not written by me. This I took it from the UN, so you don't have to read it really. Uh, we'll come back to this, um, uh, but today the deliberations hopefully would serve these goals that uh, digital technology advancements, if you look at the last one in particular, that present enormous opportunities, but only for who? So opportunity should be for everyone. I think that's 
what we should be working together. And therefore, if we could do that uh, for particularly humanitarian and development issues, then you should be able to uh, really achieve the SDGs that are set forth in the 2030 agenda. Now, I come to that point that I men you know, mentioned that uh, it's not just morally correct way that you know, everybody should have the opportunity, women should be treated at par. Uh, I stress on this that scientific progress is only possible and greatly accelerated if you have gender equality. For the time being, tolerate that word. And uh, I prefer, you know, I, last time also, I mean, I've been saying it in many forums, I don't think our policy should be just gender equal or gender neutral, as they say. We are all different, and I want a gender rich policy, which this would acknowledge the differences. Physiologically, we are different, uh, our strengths are different, our ambitions are different. So, a gender rich society is both desirable and beneficial. I'm going to talk about that uh, briefly. Uh, that uh, several studies have shown, and there are very recent ones that I came upon uh, even earlier this year. Uh, this has shown that more gender balanced world would benefit not just women, but everyone. Okay, so I think that's, uh, let's just get into that. <clears throat> when I sit in selection committees, the idea is to engage the very best people, not the best men and the next best men and the next best men. Right? I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? So you'd be looking at the full, the, the entire pool, and if you want to stay competitive in business, then you engage and select the very best people, irrespective of whether they're men or women. And we cannot be competitive in a global economy if half, it's less than half in India, but whatever, about half of our human capital is not allowed the opportunity to work up to its potential. There's a Harvard Business Review article in November 2016. The title was something like Diverse Teams Are Smarter. And uh, this is extremely important. If you read it, the, the examples are mostly from the corporate sector, but it applies to us. Uh, it says diversity, and in, so I'm concluding, uh, and inclusivity are not just morally correct principles for an institution, but it makes perfect business sense to promote them. It's extremely important to know. And this I had heard you know, my friend asking me, if you have something, why should I give it up? That's the answer. You have certain privileges. You just ask people to do it because it's the morally correct thing to do. My generation probably should have worked still. And now I think you really un have to understand it makes perfect business sense because diverse teams are smarter. So uh, of course, any form of affirmative action is welcome but we should not fall in the trap of stereotype casting. And there are many that are happening now, particularly from the government. Uh, policies, as I said, need to be fair and ideally gender rich, but paying the salaries of two employees for the same job while one is away on maternity leave. In small companies, I've heard many examples of this. This stop people from employing young women. The facts that we can present that this happens. So uh, there are ways of handling this. And uh, that the society should take the holistic view of the problem, not just individual cases. Uh, here, the maternity leave policy remains gendered. And uh, I think that uh, it harms women by raising the cost of hiring them. And I think particularly in sciences, in professional careers, uh, it's not just a stupid thing about increasing the maternity leave period is actually going to put you away forever. Uh, you will never be able to come back. So I think that's not the way to do it. The idea is to provide support systems for women to do something that the society needs them to do. I've been struggling a lot to say that change the maternity leave, call it family leave, let the families decide how they want to handle it, and don't put the burden on the woman alone. Uh, but you know this has to be done, and maybe we should look at it. Today I don't want to get into all of this. In two minutes I want to just conclude. Uh, as I have already stated that here the problem is more difficult. Uh, officially stated, hiring policies have no gender bias. I can give you lots of stories of what I have faced. Uh, but the official norms and procedures are not discriminatory. That doesn't mean everything is honky-dory. Discrimination is subtle and indirect. And that's much more difficult. When you know what you have to eliminate, it's much easier to do. When you don't know what the problems are and you face something, you can't quite quantify it. Uh, so then that's really, really difficult. 
<coughs> so, main concerns of conscious and unconscious biases, unstated discriminations, and sometimes very confusing affirmative action plans. I mean, I'll not get into the examples. We're running a little late, so, but these are nice anecdotal stories that I have a lot of those in stock. So the basic understanding what is the story that I want to emphasize on, it's not just about treating everyone equally, it's about understanding the differences rationally. Ensuring equity, and as I mentioned, and making the best of everyone's abilities and choices. That's what it is all about. So uh, any individual in our institution should be able to work in and contribute to the academic life on campus to the extent and at the level appropriate to personal choices or abilities. S sounds very simple, shouldn't it be obvious? Sometimes you need to say the obvious because it's not really happening. So gender should not be a constraint for you to you know, put out your best. <clears throat> so the emphasis should be on gender sensitization, proactive support for the cause, and a lot of this is advocacy of the kind that we are doing today. And I think I congratulate you on that. So I also wanted to say this is uh, what I mentioned that it makes business sense. In an academic institution, that business sense is actually excellence. This is a pursuit of excellence. If you are fair, the commitment to excellence is by fairness. By providing an efficient place of work and study, free of discrimination, harassment, intimidation, or exploitation. Now, <clears throat> just one minute on this. Everybody is talking about it, and I have said, even in December, that technology can be a great leveler. And you say that because, you know, when I was a PhD student, I couldn't lift a vacuum pump. I had to call the boy from the next lab and say, help me middle of the night, because it was so heavy. Today, you don't need that. Women are driving trucks, you can drive, uh, well, not a good example, but fighter planes, whatever. Uh, but, so it's, your physical strength doesn't really matter because technology is providing you the efficiency. So uh, it's reducing the dependence on physical strength, et cetera, et cetera. It's also very transparent and promises that is easy to personalize and then scale up as necessary. <clears throat> so definitely it presents an opportunity to narrow gender gaps. But is it really going to do that? And that's what we're going to discuss in the afternoon. Uh, so welfare services, ID, financial services, information, everybody's talking about it. The government is actually saying a lot about that. So access to all of this is definitely gone up. If you have digital technology, so then you eliminate the gender gap. Uh, but uh, what about data security and privacy? That's another, uh, today I will not touch upon this at all. But that's a very big problem, particularly when it comes to women, if you look through the gender lens. So uh, one issue is development of technology that I think most of you have probably heard some stories that uh, as you, know, you want to design pro uh, digital uh, products or technological products to provide personalized service, but who, are, who is that person? And they should benefit men and women alike. But we have examples, early speech recognition software struggle to recognize women's voices. Airbags fail to protect women. I, you know, there are earlier medicine-related issues because how medicines were tested only on men and women were taken to be just scaled-down version of men, weight-wise. These are designed by and tested on men. Stupid, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't work, but you still try. So development of technology, that's issue number one. We really need to go a lot on this the development and then the effects of digital technology. So the issue two is on the effects. So you have, uh, this is a general statement. You, uh, there could be two kinds of digitalization. One I am calling destructive or replacement digitalization. The other one is truly transformative. The replacement one, why people are scared of it? Because, oh, there's a scared future of work. Uh, all the road jobs are going to be automated. And with a, in a country like ours, with a, where you have abundant HR, human resources, whether this would be the right way of going about it, I'm not sure, but I won't get into the details of it. For both measures of this, you normally see this effects more pronounced in the manufacturing sector than in services. Uh, so how do you actually face it? Routine manual skills can be automated, as I said, but analytical and interpersonal skills, you know, even your syllabus is changing, right? Because everybody's talking about soft powers to be 
taught in a multidisciplinary framework. Why? Because this is what it needs. Where analytic and interpersonal skills represent bottlenecks to digitalization. So a higher level of formal education decreases the impact of destructive digitalization, replacement ones. You cannot be replaced so easily if you are highly educated, but then you are more strongly affected by the second kind of digitalization that I'm talking about. So COVID-19 showed us the digital divide, showed us that some people have, some people don't. And if you apply the gender lens within that digital divide, it's a shocking story. And we have to be aware of that to prevent that, to make sure that uh, it, this doesn't happen. The two points I have written, that women are less likely to benefit from advances of any kind, both the development kind and the effect kind. So then we need to be really, really careful that nobody is left behind in this. So uh, moral of the story is that one needs to be cautious when implementing digital solutions to ensure that do not lead to further division. And we'll talk about it, how to actually prevent it. It's important to develop inclusive science, technology, innovation system that takes into account the needs of disadvantaged groups to ensure that no one is left behind. Very, very important today to take that pledge. And uh, women's contribution to STI and access, not just contribution, but access uh, to the use of digitally transferred benefits of many kinds, that financial that I talked about, are constrained by factors that go beyond issues of regulations, infrastructure, they're mostly conditional, societal, and other issues that I mentioned. And that's something to be kept in mind. You cannot just take care of regulations, you cannot just provide the infrastructure and expect that everything would be all right. So uh, it's a top priority, it's a strange story. Sometimes when you do studies, and I came across this, uh, 2018, uh, IMF found that women, well, found that if you have a standard model that uh, do not differentiate between genders in the analysis, then they find that there is a favorable impact of technology on, the, on business. They forget that actually it was, <laughs> if you look at the last statement, for countries ranking in the bottom half of gender equality, closing the gender gap could increase the GDP by 35% on average. It's not bringing in technology, leveling a uh, level playing field. It's not highlighted often, and I thought I'll bring this to the fore. That this is, uh, so what should be your priority? Digital, digit all, or level playing field? Uh, which one should be the priority? Because this seems to be giving you uh, 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 increase in what we call, I don't know what it means, growth, development, all of this. But if that's your target, this is the way to go. So I stop uh, that uh, with the question that top prioritize permission of advanced technology or top prioritize equity? Participation and representation of girls and women in every sphere, tech or otherwise, since we seem to be lacking in both. And I think that's something that we need to look at. Uh, today, uh, this is my last slide, that we still have uh, very few role models of women leaders in higher education. So women like you who have make, made it to the top have a major role to play in empowering other women. And leaders have to drive the chain and lead the chain of empowerment. Uh, it's another topic to talk about what I mean by leaders. But uh, in a very brief quote, a successful person finds the right place for himself, take it himself, everything. But a successful leader finds the right place for others. That's the way leader is defined for me. And I welcome you to this leadership summit uh, uh, today and look forward to the deliberations. Uh, and here is wishing that someday soon, we do not need to have just one day of the year marked as the Women's Day. 365 days should be Women's Days and Men's Days as well. Okay, so. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so thanks, Professor Ghosh, for that very insightful uh, talk. Uh, time for our first lecture. So our uh, sp first speaker today is uh, Shubhra Priyadarshini. Shubhra is an award-winning science journalist and currently the chief editor of Nature India. Um, she has been keenly following the evolving science, research, and innovation climate in Asia through the last couple of decades. She's uh, kind of, you know, dabbled in 
reporting, you know, uh, she's been reporting on a variety of issues till the time, you know, she decided to focus on her first love, that is science, and launched Nature India in 2007. She's worked as a journalist with major Indian dailies, the Times of India, the Indian Express, the Asian Age, the Telegraph, India's premier news agency, PTI, Press Trust of India, and Down to Earth magazine. She worked briefly for the Observer London. The title of her talk today is as relevant as it could be, Why Scientists Must Communicate with Society. Okay. Shubhra. Thank you, glorious. Uh, um, first talk is what I meant. Uh, and, and I think, <laughs> and I think, I mean, I have been having these conversations with uh, Dr. Ghosh forever. Uh, and I remember you talking about some of the things that we spoke way back in, say, 2015 or 16. And I was thinking the more things change, the more they remain the same. We talked about, you know, having family leave way back then. And we're still struggling to see uh, something of that sort. Uh, you know, taking the light of the day, even today. So um, at the same time, I was also thinking there are so many issues that we have highlighted today. If we are able to even scratch the surface of one or two of them, that would be a win for us today. Um, I am an outlier for all of you. And specifically, if it's a... Uh, physics crowd, I'm always an outlier. <laughs> I'm from a zoology background and I feel like science communication is something that uh, of course applies to everybody, every scientist worth their salt. Um, but uh, at the same time, whenever I have this topic, why scientists must communicate with the society, there are some in the crowd, I think, many in the crowd who would say, why should they? Why the hell should they? So that's the question we'll sort of try and deal with today. And um, my bread and butter comes from storytelling about you all. Uh, I get my salary from telling beautiful stories about people like you and your work. So it's, uh, it's a slight nudge on our part, on my part, uh, for you all to sort of take on the mantle from people like us who are science communicators who may not always do the best job of communicating what's so close and so dear to you, your science. So um, I, I feel like one could argue to, be, to start with that it's taxpayers' money that you use, so why the hell not? would you communicate the science that you are doing to the people who would ultimately benefit from it. But uh, that's not the only reason why you should communicate your science. And we'll go through why and what are the other reasons that should compel you to come out of your... Many times it's described as the ivory tower that scientists sit in and have no connect to the rest of the society. So let's dwell upon that a bit and I'll start with a story because I'm a storyteller and uh, what better way than to tell you about a story of these two gentlemen you're seeing on your screen uh, and it's Women's Day and we are beginning with a story about men because it's got a lot of lessons for us women as well women in science uh, so on your screen are two legends one is uh, the British physiologist Robert Edward, and the other is the Indian physician scientist Subhash Mukherjee from Kolkata. And uh, their scientific uh, passions were identical. And the way they did science was almost identical. They created the world's first test tube babies, almost first. Uh, um, on, on the right was the first. and. Uh, on the left was the first and on the right was somebody who claimed to be the first innovator of the technology that he pioneered but uh, he actually re the, the, the experiments that he did resulted in creating the baby a little later than uh, what Edward did. So 
these two scientists led sort of scientific careers that were starkly different from each other. And one of them actually used science and science peer-reviewed communication and popular communication to his benefit. The other, in the absence of that kind of uh, wherewithal with him, actually had to die a very tragic death by suicide in his own lab uh, just after a few days after the baby, test tube baby was born. So this was history making for both of these scientists. Uh, how did they, their lives differ is the question you might want to ask. So this uh, scientist Subhash Mukherjee, he was a Calcutta physician like I said, he was under constant uh, lonely battle to, to sort of create something that he was experimenting with on his lab mice. Uh, and uh, and he almost sold everything he had, including his wife's jewelry, to get to a point where he could say that in vitro fertilization was a reality. However, Robert Edwards actually was working in a wonderful lab in Oldham in England and in Manchester. And he had all the wherewithal of a fantastic lab and a great collaborators to succeed in IVF uh, before Subhash Mukherjee could do that. So this story, of course, has a resonance for all of us because using IVF, Edwards and Stepto gave uh, the world its earliest test tube babies. Louis Brown was born on 25 July 1978 at the Oldham General Hospital. And close on their heels, Mukherjee finally struck gold when he gave birth to baby Durga in, in, a, in, a, la, in a small uh, nursing home in Calcutta. She was called Kanupriya. And uh, she was born on during Durga Puja, so she was actually nicknamed Durga. Uh, and all of this happened while they were working into very different setups. One in, and this is a tale of two cities actually, in Oldham in UK and in, in Calcutta, which was um, known for its uh, disenchantment with anything enterprising at that point of time. You know. so, uh, so that is the story and I wanted to take a little time on this story alone because I want to tell you, and the reason I picked it is not just because I'm researching this very heavily for a book I'm writing, but at the same time also because it's a fantastically layered story of, of strands of, it has strands of science, its communication, how one exceeded, uh, um, you know, did exceedingly well in communicating his science to not just his peers, but also outside. And the other one failed to do that and had to actually do, uh, you know, get into a very tragic end. Uh, life is always not this dramatic for scientists. But even then, we have sort of the great case study here on the methods of science, of peer review, and of science communication. So from here, I'd like to take a little bit of time to tell you about peeling these layers of conventional thinking about science communication. Uh, and let's discuss them a little bit in depth. And, uh, and I must tell you that these are the, uh, uh, you know, what I call the rumblings that, that I get from every time making this presentation to a group like you. You know, I, I, I feel like uh, most times I fail to convince even half of you about why we should communicate science. And that's a failure on my part because I'm not doing my storytelling in a, in a way that convinces you. But at the same time, I feel like even if I have, you know, made an inroad into a quarter of you to, to communicate your science better, I would have made my win today. So in being rooted in research and training and in academia and family life, 
forget some of the simple truths of why we are doing our science in the first place. We are very busy people, right? We don't have time for communication. That's an added thing for all of us. And believe me, whenever we have had a survey with scientists, we have always found the number one reason for them not to communicate their science is because it takes it away from them. It's an extra thing. The second thing is, what will my peer think of me? I'm trying to sort of promote myself. I am trying to, you know, tom-tom uh, -tom my work in the media or in social media. That's not a done thing in science, generally, in India. Elsewhere, it's another story. We don't feel like we should go ahead and talk to the media or write a popular article. We feel that's something that our peers will, you know, look us down upon for. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. Let's just say that. The third thing that most people tell me, most scientists tell me, is that, okay, I go ahead and communicate my science, but most often I'm misquoted in the media. Or something that I've said comes out as absolutely something else, without context, without, you know, mm, and, and many times they use the word dumbing down of science, making it so simple that it doesn't look like science anymore or sound like science anymore. Again, uh, you have to realize that the audience you're talking to and the medium you're using have their constraints. The audience actually doesn't want to know how many years you've put in to write that manuscript, what the details of your mathematical findings are, or what complexity your problem has. They are bothered about what we call in communication as the so what question. So what? You've been in this research for 25 odd years, and then you've come out with something incremental. So what? How does it impact my life? How does it change the way I look at your science? What is so exciting about it? What's the relevance of the science, etc.? So, uh, and I could go on and on about this topic, but let me just stick to what is on the slide right now, which is uh, science's bearings, as we all know, are multi-headed. They actually impact a lot of people. Believe it or not, they, your science in high energy physics or particle physics or, you know, something that may not be so decipherable by people beyond your lab actually has a bearing on, on a lot of people that is invisible to you. And that's why I say it intersects with everything we do. It's, it's got it's got social impacts. It's got political, economical impacts. Each of the stories that we do, I can, I can actually dissect them down to all of these hydra heads and show you how exactly it happens. And I do this with examples. We don't have time right now for, for so many examples. But I could tell you how, for instance, a story around, around photon communication could actually be told in such a manner that that has a bearing on a person's life who has nothing to do with that kind of science. And um, communicating these hydra heads coherently and beautifully actually brings it all together, all these heads together. They, puts, they, they put uh, the, the buck where it is, you know, the, it, it makes it a whole product. It makes it something that unites us with society. So it's not just important for you to write a manuscript to inform your peers, but it's equally important to go beyond your peers. Sometimes, and we had this fantastic conversation last night over dinner about how the language of one particular discipline is so tough even for a sub-discipline to understand. So how is it that uh, you know people beyond your discipline will even understand? So at Nature, what we have done now, and you'll see that with each of Nature's papers, is the abstract is uh, written in such a manner that anybody from any discipline will have an inkling about what the paper is saying. So it's for the scientific community, so it's just relegated to science and science scientific people. But at the same time, that abstract could actually be read by 
somebody who's a 10th grader and still have some relevance for him or her or them so what i'm trying to say is and convince you today is that and uh, uh, dr ghosh also mentioned this in her talk briefly about some things being soft skills for us forever i don't think science communication can any longer be called as a soft skill it is a skill you all must have it is a skill that benefits all of you in a multiple in multi multiple ways and i'll come to why um uh, why is it that we should communicate science is what we are discussing today and these are some of the very obvious altruistic benefits of doing your science i mean i begin with this because scientists often say oh then i'll be seen as somebody who's trying to promote myself uh it's not always the case there are other benefits there are benefits text bookish benefits like these which are you know you are somebody and we saw this so much during covid 19 uh covid 19 actually presented to us a case study of why every scientist worth their salt should be speaking out if not communicating through an opinion piece or a blog or a podcast or whatever means you have but at least speaking out telling people what is the truth what is science what is evidence why we should all be rooted in something called evidence and covid-19 has these had these great examples of uh misinformation disinformation floating around in real time very quickly way quicker than information was getting out there that's because science uh again has its limitations science is produced over a period of time it's produced in a language that's not always like i want to say and keep saying palatable for everybody uh it's in a language that's difficult to decipher jargon laced and misinformation is in a language that's so easy to understand and in a format many times in in videos that's so beautifully presented right so there's misinformation for you and my father gets a whatsapp message about uh, uh about a group of um scientists or uh, physicians sitting in switzerland or geneva talking about uh, how covid-19 is just a myth and how uh, masking is not needed etc and he's a doctor himself and he believes it because all these people are sitting in their black coats around a table and they have a who logo on top of the video and that is circulating with everybody it's it's stark misinformation and it still makes its way to well meaning people who would who would have otherwise not believed it but still believe it because it's covid-19 it's an emergency situation we want anything that helps us you know reinforce our beliefs to 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 believe in those kinds of things and science is on the opposite hand so difficult to understand for them so that's when you as scientists have a role to play uh, in scotching those kinds of misinformation in real time uh, the same applies for informing people it's isn't it our goal of science to do something for the society ultimately so what stops us from taking that middle path of also going out and communicating about that science to others informing people it raises awareness about your discipline many times physicists find themselves in a spot as opposed to biologist or you know healthcare professionals who have easy stories to tell and easily understandable stories to tell physicists might not have that easy uh, a story to to communicate so uh, by doing that often by communicating your science often and in a better way you could actually be raising the profile of your discipline of your institution um of course inspiring the next generation of researchers how many of us actually became scientists because we read something in a newspaper or in a magazine article when we were younger or a book 
and it fueled her imagination and said this is what i want to become right so it's payback time for all of us right we we really want to be those kinds of people who have inspired the next generation to getting into science and what what a better way to do it than with with communication so there are these altruistic benefits and these are some of the practical benefits of why you should be uh communicating your science uh, um, if not anything if not anything at all you are developing what is a so called soft skill as of now right so you are uh, getting into the mold of writing communicating through say a blog or a podcast or a multimedia kind of content or even a popular science article in a popular science magazine right so uh, you are developing you are going to and fro with the editors or content creators and trying to see how you can bring it down to a level uh, which is again understandable by a lot more people than just your peers and in the process you are becoming somebody else so that's a soft skill soft skill that is no longer going to be a soft skill in in future for you to develop uh, all of these other reasons you know why you should be communicating your science it's actually mandatory in many countries now to have a column in uh, in your impact statement when you're giving it back to your funders they ask you for impact what have you done uh, to show impact and dbt and dst are also sort of thinking of i don't know whether they've introduced it as as a column where you show impact of what your work has been and your next tranche of funding actually depends on that impact so why not start doing that impact now <laughs> so the power of storytelling is something i want to uh, dwell on for a couple of minutes about why telling a good story in a good way is actually uh, important for scientists and we've touched upon the language of science being indecipherable but at the same time i want to make a case for making this kind of an activity uh, something that you think of as making science accessible making science understandable and making science usable ultimately for a lot more people than just where you work for so the power of storytelling is something that uh, is is very important what makes for a great story for people like i said many times the relevance of your story is something that you want to highlight when you're communicating science so what kind of stories would be relevant for an audience that you might want to cater to uh it could be you know a story that um like i was talking to urboshi yesterday and she told me about uh, communications about uh, the, the popular misconception around teleportation for instance and uh, and these are things that trigger popular imagination and they can be told very beautifully these stories and they are very relevant to people who are working um you know in our daily lives we you all of us use communication encrypted communication all of you us would like to understand how it happens so the glory of this kind of science the glory of what scientists actually do to make all of this happen is something that people would like to read about and that's what i mean by relevance to their lives the other other thing that people want to know is you know the thing that picks their interest is are your results something that would fall in the category of interesting exciting unexpected or unusual or amazing and i take an example from the biological sciences but but it could be anything it could be astrophysics it could be particle physics it could be anything that you and the biggest stories of excitement of science are told in particle physics right Uh, and astrophysics so so if we can if we can understand what picks the interest of our audience that's half the battle won uh also unique if your story is something that is making for a first time use i am sure 
there will be an audience for it. If it is it's something like a superlative, like the largest, biggest, tiniest, tiniest is so much more uh, you know, uh, important for you guys, you are talking about nano levels all the time and so, and so if those superlatives are, are somewhere in your paper and you think oh yes that makes for a good story, why can't I communicate it? So think of those things uh, in this manner of, of something that is a first or a superlative. Think of your research of uh, 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 as something of importance, of immediate importance, of currency, of newsworthiness. Uh, if you have a story that can be told immediately for a wider audience, uh, why not? Why not? Why not pick it up and say it? COVID-19, like I said, presented us with an example of uh, how virology and epidemiology became household names and household disciplines. Everybody was talking about spike proteins, for instance, right? And uh, and people didn't find it unusual for for uh, their dinner table conversations to have uh, things like spike protein or uh, vaccines, uh, clinical trials, or stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, so if it's in the news, it's a good time for you to also start thinking about your story to be in the news. Um, images. We also saw that black hole image some time back that made a great story, right? And, uh, and it was on the front page of all newspapers with a reason because uh, people are so intrigued by these kinds of things and people are always amazed with great images. If, you, if your story has a good image, it's worth telling. I would say, please use that uh, instance to 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 tell a, a nice story. Many times, that image itself is a story. So, so try and think in those terms to to increase your repertoire, as it were, of communication communicating good science. I will skip this session section because uh, I mean we've we've talked about most of it. What a pandemic really taught us in terms of communicating science. There are lots of lessons that we as science communicator got from it. And uh, I, I believe that many of us who are doing science have these questions of, so this is such a tiny thing I'm doing. Will it be of relevance? Will it be so important as to weave a story around it? Believe me, the, it will be if we tell it well. And many times we figure that science is incremental, right? It doesn't have breakthroughs every single day of our lives. And so uh, is there a story in those increments also? Uh, science always doesn't have to be breakthrough. The stories also don't always have to be breakthrough. So if we can, if we can make a case for telling those small stories of science, of the rigors of how science is done, is itself a beautiful story that not many people know of, right? So how about thinking in those terms as well? So I'll just, uh, you know, just let you think about the imponderables of what science can give to us, um, the answers that you constantly seek in science, and the problem questions that you constantly feed into your science are something that uh, is of interest to public. Uh, it may not always have the answers, but do it transparently and honestly, which we failed to do many times during COVID-19. We put up a front that said, India is so and so, right? Which wasn't always true or transparent or honest. We didn't have answers, but we posed as if we had. So that's not something you do as scientists, and that's something to avoid use data creatively. You see this graph and everybody again in their dinner table discussions was talking about flattening the curve during COVID-19. It's such a technical thing but we all knew what flattening the curve means and it was made possible because somebody had this brilliant idea about representing that data in just a curve and feeling people's imagination around that curve. And so you could do that too, using your data creatively, imaginatively to the benefit of a larger audience. Um, 
and we have talked about how science is not just about science. It's about how we have interlaced it with so many things in our society. So in our daily lives as scientists, we many times forget the basics of, um, of why we are doing our science ultimately. So it's a good way of taking a step back sometimes and reminding ourselves of those goals of ultimately why we are doing our science. Um, this is uh, towards the end of my talk and uh, this is uh, something that I present very often and people take screenshots of it because, uh, because they find it so useful about how scientific communication on the one hand and popular communication uh, are just an inverse pyramid of each other. And how as scientists the language we speak is something that merits looking at from closer quarters to invert if we are writing a popular story. So here goes. Uh, when you do your science and you write a manuscript, what do you do? This is the pattern you follow. You have a broad background of your story in the beginning. You try and create a specific narrative around that background in a couple of paragraphs. You, you state a problem statement, give a motivation of why you're doing that research. You then go into your methods, your results, the context of your finding, your conclusions, and then the implications, if there is any, for a larger audience. Or it's interdisciplinarity, if you think you can think of something beyond just the discipline. Now, popular science communication, the way we do it, is just reversing this on its head. What is of importance to us communicators and to people at large is the so what question, your conclusions. Why are you doing that science? What did you conclude? What's your key finding? What's the implication of that finding? Right? So that's the order we would like to take. So keep this in mind whenever you're trying to uh, write a popular piece or do communication. Try and think of the results as the most fascinating piece of your work. Try and think of the key findings next. Try and think of the wider implications. What was the problem you were trying to state? What was the context of this finding? What's a broad background? And then if you have still time, the, Im uh, the larger implications you know, or, or, or space. I, I must just admit here that many times uh, I spoke about uh, scientists being misquoted or misrepresented uh, in, in popular media, you have to understand the constraints within which popular media works. And so if you have your communication upright and you are presenting your story in just three bullet points to the person who's going to communicate it further, don't, don't give them all the d massive amount of details that you think are important. Just, you know, pick up the top three ideas that you would want to communicate to a larger public. And those top three ideas, repeat them again and again in your conversation with those people who are going to communicate it. Or if you are going to do it, then do it that way. So how can you as scientists make a difference? And this is my last slide. Uh, I think by immediately getting involved with people who have some expertise around this, uh, about communicating your science to a larger public, it would help. So get involved if you have a press office or if you have a public relations person in your institute, uh, try and get, invo get involved with them. Try and uh, figure out what is their requirement. Many times, like we were having this discussion yesterday also, uh, you know, there are several iterations that your text might go through. That's only to make sure that people beyond your discipline can understand what you're trying to say. It's not just, it's not because, you know, somebody wants to oversimplify your science. It's just because 
your science might be important to you, but there are other people for whom the findings might be more important or presenting it, at a manner, it in a manner that might be interesting to them might be more important. So there's always a middle path to be found uh, in, in between these two very tough decisions to be made, right? So let's try and see whether we can do that with patients, with people who are trying to do that. Um, I would strongly urge any of you to come into one of our newsrooms. I always welcome people who want to come and see how we function as a publishing group or as, as a newsroom which is constantly dealing with news stories that come our way. So I'll have say 100 stories every day that will fill my inbox, but I'll choose one or two at most. Why do I do that? What's the kind of context that makes me do that? What's the kind of scientist that's actually picking my interest uh, in, in choosing those two stories every day? So that is p made possible when you visit a place that is dealing with all of those things on a daily basis. It becomes interesting and it's, it's very interesting like you take me around your labs and show me things. I also take you around my lab and show you things uh, that work for me and don't work for me. So that's uh, that's something I uh, say. And uh, get hands on if you can. If you have a web page, try and sort of amplify it as much as possible. Get on social media. Many times we are shy of doing that. Like I said, is it too promotional? Will it will people take me less seriously if I did that? It's a whole lot of, if I may use the word bullshit. It isn't the case. Many times we find great stories just from social media and, and the best scientists in this country are increasingly on social media. So, so get there, even if uh, just to listen in or to see what's happening around you uh, and network with people. Lots of great networking and collaboration is happening on social media right now. So I'll end there. Thank you for your patience and for listening to me. Thank you so much for that very uh, thought-provoking talk. So it's interesting that this talk comes this week because last week uh, we had open day when RRI opened its doors to anybody who would, you know, care to visit and we dem demonstrated experiments and, you know, so it was, it was really nice. But we have some time for questions now. Okay. Uh, you hit upon uh, several aspects of science communication. Um, not all of them are necessarily, um, how, how, how should I put it, compatible with each other because, I mean, science communication to people can, does not have to involve media. And uh, science outreach very often does not involve media at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, because at some level, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, is it the science communication or is it, is it, you know, where is it that we're targeting? Who is it that we're targeting? Which is the society that we're trying to target? The other question, I mean, other thing that c came up uh, is, are scientists really free to talk about things like science policy anymore? Um, because these are things that I think, like you said, okay, you know, miscommunicate, you know, trying to make sure the people don't, uh, you know, f for the COVID, in the COVID vaccine case, you know, get the right information out. But there are many things that as scientists, as people who have some responsibility towards society, uh, the idea of science policy, how do we believe science policy should be, should go, as an opinion piece, uh, do we really have that freedom to criticize government science policies? And I believe that that freedom has actually has gone away uh, at the moment uh, significantly. And uh, in that context, then, is it only self promo I mean, you said, okay, you're not tom tomming yourself, but at some level, it is tom tomming yourself just to talk about your own science because our, our relationship to society, hopefully, is much more than our single relationship to our work, right? I mean, telling everybody how what a great job you're doing, that's not, I think, what you were saying. I think no. you're saying that it's a much broader issue exactly. of engagement with society. The yeah. question is, what society, which part of society, and in what way? Because then it seems very constrained that if, if this is the only thing through media telling people what they want to hear. Because sometimes, you have to tell people what they don't want to hear. Exactly. And do we have the freedom to do that anymore is a question. Great Thanks questions. for the Thanks for the talk, by the way. It, it did 
bring up a lot of thoughts. Thank you. That, that's uh, three questions in one. And I would say uh, two things. One is your audiences and your freedom are for you to judge and uh, for you to make and take control of. For me, the audiences would be anybody who listens to, cares to listen. But uh, for you, the audiences could be multiple. For a communication piece that you do for the media, the audiences are, you know who they are. They are wider than just a policy person or an educational institute. For a policy piece that you're wanting to do, your audience is the policy people. For an educational piece that you, or an outreach piece that you want to do, your audience is the people you want to educate or inform or in some cases entertain as well. Because communication has all of these multiple roles. It may not just be about communicating science. Uh, having said that, to your question of freedom, I feel like you are very right. Uh, there are people in, in academia and, and in the policy making bodies who have got very unpopular by expressing their op opinion in the past few years. But I see that it hasn't stopped them. So what I meant by saying your freedom is for you to take or grab by the horns, uh, I meant to say that it's twofold. I, I feel, feel your pain. I do understand that you might have so many constraints within the job that you're doing for the next tranche of your funding again to come. For you to write such a piece might be difficult for you to express yourself or uh, to be the person who is next to the director of an institute who has got a gag order uh, for not speaking out, that would be difficult. And we have seen so many of these instances in this country and it is difficult for us as communicators also to reach out to those people who matter, who can speak but cannot speak. right? So I totally get your pain. But at the same time, I feel like there are some role models in this area also uh, who haven't stopped being themselves despite all of these questions. So it goes both ways. It cuts both ways, I feel. Uh, uh, there was another question about uh, Tom Tomming about yourself and your science. Clearly, I have not convinced you. But uh, what I want to again say is, it is not you as a person that you are talking about in that communication. You are talking about your science, which is overarching. Whenever somebody comes to us and say, I did this, my group presented this, I am the sole on owner of this idea, we take it with a pinch of salt again as communicators. If somebody comes to say, uh, to say this is the science we are espousing, or this is the science we want to talk about. That's again, as communicators, we feel like, yes, that's what we also want to do, right? We want to put science way above and beyond a single person or an institution or an academy. So I hope, yeah, I hope that answers a bit of your uh, question, but this is a very long debate and we can have it offline as well. So uh, would you like to respond? <laughs> oh, no, okay. You're welcome. No, no, no. Go ahead, yeah, please. Sorry. Well, actually, she probably asked uh, three of the things I probably was going to ask. But I just wanted to comment on one thing. So thanks, Shubhra, for bringing out how important it is uh, you know, to, to communicate through media. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, you know, flag one more thing. Mm -hmm. Every single uh, day, uh, a whole bunch of us, say, in ICERS or IITs, reach out in that sense, communicate science to undergraduates. Right. Like I literally teach hundreds day in, day out, and they are teenagers, okay? So they are not that old or anything. So I feel that, um, you know, uh, while uh, it is extremely valuable to have uh, communication skills which go through media, 
it is also the fact that you know teachers day in and day out are doing this um, i i want to have a shout out for those communicators because they reach an extremely Absolutely. large number Absolutely. and they work really hard at it yeah. oh, and i don't think they are appreciated much because their names yes. don't come on right i mean right. we are a course instructor and you know but, but you know thousands have passed through our hands right i mean literally so uh, uh, i think maybe some of the skills could also be communicated to them to help them maybe jazz up the first lecture mm -hmm. second lecture is going to be textbook <laughs> well uh, no escape <laughs> but at least maybe the first lecture and you know uh, once in a while you know to keep people in class uh, but uh, this is just to say that communication is probably wider than media and i hope people remember that for yeah. the teachers in the audience yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i agree and i feel like my part of the communication business is what i can you know stand up and speak about for for outreach for public engagement of science it's it's a huge world it's it's something that uh, people like you like you said do day in and day out and some of the theories of communication that i just discussed could as well apply to the, that kind of outreach activity and engagement so so can we have a round of applause for that that kind of engagement as well because it's really really cool and important i just uh, was going to make a comment uh, connected to what you actually already said that it in fact it is a great challenge for a technical scientist to communicate the science to a larger medium I mean, a larger audience to the public it takes a lot of skill to do that it's, it's actually much harder than writing a technical it is. paper it is that's so because have i have done it so i i know that I it know. is harder i know it's and very difficult yeah. and that's why beasts like yeah. us exist um, to, to to sort of be the go between if you and will and the second point is that in the process of writing such an article it sharpens you it clarifies clarifies better to yourself what you have done exactly so it's not an easy skill it isn't yes yeah, i mean many people say that oh, you are dumbing it down and things like that as you also mentioned it is actually a lot harder than writing a technical paper Thanks. Just, yeah, just wanted to add something, uh, you know, related to the context of today. Do you see any gender bias in people who are communicating their science? Do men communicate it more than women do? And secondly, if, uh, again, you know, from the people who are communicating, do you see any gender bias in the reception? If a woman is communicating her science, is she taken to be tom-tomming her science a bit more than, let's say, uh, a non-woman uh, counterpart? Very good question. I don't know if I have a direct answer to that, but I can just quote some figures for you uh, from the public publishing house that I come from. 70% of my workforce is women. And we do a great job of communicating science. And uh, we are equally receptive of women scientists who come out and say, I have a story to tell. Um, that's absolutely because we have this sisterhood going around right we should promote more women why not uh, in, in sciences and uh, in its communication um, this morning we did a nice video with some indian scientists women scientists and uh, scientists uh, around the world and communicators science communicators around the world around the theme of digital and how technology digital technology and innovation is actually empowering a whole bunch of women in coming out and telling their story more effectively. Um, while that is a one-off Women's Day event and is not representative what we, of what we do the rest of the year, um, I can say that, and I can say this very strongly, that women who stand up and say things about their science, not necessarily about themselves, like we just discussed, are taken equally importantly and with merit and it takes a little bit more for a woman scientist to come up and tell their story because there's also the family and the caregiving that's woven into their job daily job like we know so communication for them is absolutely an extra thing to do most times and yet, when those women do it, 
and this might be my bias and absolutely not any empirical evidence, I feel like they do it better. I feel like, uh, well, with no offense to the men in the house, I feel like women have this clarity in their head about one, two, three, and how it should go out uh, better than, you know, and not exactly generalizing, some of the best communicators in this country are men, mm -hmm. science communicators in this country are men, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very, very blotched answer, but I, I feel like, um, I feel like I, I am at ease with most women who who's want to communicate their science. Let's just... I mean, this is going so well. Yeah. I mean, we are late, but I think we'll take one last question from Prajwal. Actually, to be honest, I had two. Okay, <laughs> you can, you may ask <laughs> two. One was a quick response to okay. something related to what Urbashi laid, uh, raised. Um, it is, I think, uh, s r the responsibility of science communicators to communicate that everybody can do science. Uh, and so science magazines and uh, media reports and panels for outreach, etc., must have uh, must show that science is done by everybody. And this is an idea that uh, I, for instance, have had a very hard time pushing, even with very straightforward things like the magazine resonance, which comes out of this compound. Um, so that was uh, one thing. And I don't know how we can change that and how we can uh, build that awareness that there's a abdication of responsibility if we don't do this. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that in my own experience, uh, uh, the challenge to uh, be able to do science communication, there's one more challenge, which I think you didn't mention, which is that uh, within elite institutions, it's looked down upon. And we get negative points for doing science communication. So I have had to, like, always moonlight uh, my science communication uh, as much as possible. But even so, it is uh, given negative points. There are some institutions which are changing. There are some institutions which do give brownie points yes. for doing science communication uh, because it's, after all, a matter of what criteria are there in hiring and promotion. Right. And so it's a structural issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so this structural issue is very deep. And uh, so I don't know if you had any insights in your interactions with uh, policymakers. Agree, agree, agree. I think uh, the one thing that I have taken away from my interactions with people who create these policies is that they are wishful. They want to do certain things. Uh, but when it comes down to institute level, academy level, uh, resonance level things, they might not be really reflective of what the policy intended to be. So the wishful thinking actually ends there and it doesn't come down to like uh, Dr. Ghosh also mentioned in her talk. Um, my idea of all of this is um, there are some institutes which are doing marvelously well and these are the examples that need to be really you know, talked about in the institutes that aren't doing it so well. Um, so while I don't have a direct answer to how we can change it, I can say, invite me to your institute. Maybe I'll sort of, germ, you know, put the germ of an idea into some of these men and women who are making policy at, at, the, at the policy level. I can quote institutes like NCBS, Indian Institute of Science, some of the ICERs, who are doing such a fantastic job now and who are mandated to, to do science communication uh, in, in a way that really goes out to the public, uh, way more than what it was, say, even five years back. Um, so while the ecosystem and the, and the thought processes are changing, we really have a long way to go in terms of how we can mold opinions. I know I didn't answer that, but I'm sure, you know, if we keep having these discussions. I mean, this conversation itself is a first starting point of the problem itself. So maybe we'll have answers sometime in the future. OK. Thank you so much for your participation. So now we will head to high tea. But before that, uh, let me thank both our wonderful speakers for those you know, lovely presentations. So here's a token of our appreciation. Oh, lovely.
Thank you. And Tarun. We kind of forgot because you know. That's okay. Uh, is Tonushri Saha Das Gupta. Uh, so uh, Tonushri is the is a senior professor of and the director of uh, SMBOS National Center for Basic Sci uh, Sciences. Tonushri is a highly decorated physicist and has made key contributions in the study of electronic, magnetic, and optical properties of complex materials, materials at the nanoscale, disordered order, uh, alloys, and in understanding strongly correlated electronic systems. The title of her talk today is Quantum Materials by Computation, Challenges and Opportunities. Thank you, everyone. And welcome back. Uh, let me start by thanking Ranjini and uh, Goshi for having me here in this uh, very special event. And uh, thanks to everyone being present here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, as the title says, quantum materials by computation, challenges and opportunities. And I was not very sure of the level of the audience. So I will keep it really, really at the basic level. And maybe no, our science communicator will be happy. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, I will try to say something not terribly wrong. Uh, but at the risk of you know, diluting some of the rigor. <coughs> and I come from the Department of Condensed Matter and materials physics uh, and as well as a part of the thematic unit of computational material science of SNBOS National Center for Basic Sciences which is in Kolkata and which was established by Department of Science and Technology to honor the life and work of Professor Shatendranath Bose uh, in this audience I don't need to say that but uh, in whose name Bose of Sar half of the fundamental particles of this world are known by his name. And uh, let me also start by congratulating all the women achievers in science in particular uh, on this special day. And I have here a cartoon picture which basically shows the two staircases and one taken by a man and another by a woman. And as you can see, as you go older and older and trying to climb these stairs, the stair heights becomes different. We all know that, but I think I must con congratulate RRI in basically gathering few of the women who are not scared of these step sizes and still <laughs> continuing climbing up. And uh, I feel we will not be lonely in our journey and more and more women will join us in climbing the staircases. Uh, with that, uh, let me start with the main topic. And this is a very general slide, which actually there is a worldwide effort, as we all know, in answering the question, how could quantum technologies transform our societies? And there is a very special focus and stress on materials, so I show three examples uh, which are all devoted to the material specific research. Uh, CEFIPRA which is one of the CIFR which is the main fund, uh, funding agency in Canada. You can see that and this is actually a team activity. We have all realized in this modern era everything has become a team activity. So you can see in this list of people they are from different parts of the world and they are all material scientists. Some of, most of them are actually materials physicists. Uh, there is also example of material chemists uh, like Tagagi. So they have been all put together a lot of effort in answering this kind of question. The other example is the Center on Quantum Materials at uh, University of British Columbia. Again, uh, there are three institute, Max Planck, University of British Columbia, and University of Tokyo, building up this Center for Quantum Materials. The other one I show is basically uh, an SIF center dedicated on 2D crystal consortium, uh, which is one of the considered as an important quantum material. Well, I 
uh, I'm showing this slide just to tell at least the general public India is not lagging behind. I mean, it's some way it's lagging behind, but better late than never. So India has also started getting big on this quantum technology. And this is from the budget space of our finance minister. And uh, a big budget was actually promised uh, over five years as a part of a new national quantum mission. And this is yet to take off, but the promise is there. And we hope soon there will be some implementation of it. Uh, well, this is again very general slide. And just to motivate you, especially if we think of quantum technology in terms of some solid state device, making quantum computers, there are several different platforms that have been discussed, like supercomputing loops, trapped ions, silicon quantum dots, topological qubits, diamond frequencies, all within the solid state platform. We don't know which one will win, but uh, there is a crucial role of materials design because information is physically encoded in materials, so you cannot deny really the role of materials. So the idea is the following, that on the way of quantum technology, which is our the ultimate goal, some new physical concept, phenomena, functionalities, and materials will be explored. I give you one kind of concrete example. You start with a theoretical concept, like a Marana based com quantum computation. That's a theoretical concept. But for the concept realization, you need to think of a system where to find such Marana particles. And they can be topological superconductors, interfaces. I, I put some of the examples. Now, that is not even enough because finally you have to make them. So, you have to get into the materials design for shortlisting candidates which will show some of these properties. And that lead to finally a laboratory growth and characterization. Now, what are quantum materials? That definition is actually very loose and if you ask different people they will give different answer i am trying to give one answer which is a very simplified answer of course at zero kelvin everything is quantum so in that way every material should be quantum but what we mean by quantum materials were their properties even at finite temperature to describe them we need a fully quantum mechanical description. That is one definition. The other definition is people think where the electron-electron correlation effect needs to be taken into account to describe their properties, but that's also a manifestation of the quantum mechanical effect. And the other definition, which is also often used, your quantum mechanical effect is so strong that basically leads to destruction of any kind of order. So that kind of material you can also say are quantum materials. But I will take the path is the first definition where you take the prop materials like a superconductor or a magnet. Their properties you can see at finite temperature still to describe the superconductivity you need to resort to quantum mechanical description. So that is my thing. So these are all properties manifestation of some of other kind of quantum mechanical effect. Now for understanding and prediction on quantum materials, as I mentioned, you know, science has become a team activity. You alone cannot really make a breakthrough in terms of anything. So again, this is a crosstalk and mutual collaboration between the experimentalist, theoretician, and also a third vertical where people, they compute and simulate things. So synthesis, characterization, design, fabrication, prototype, and modeling, all of these has to go hand in hand. And what I will focus, given you know, I, don't, I have a limited amount of time and also my expertise, is on computation. So I will focus primarily on one vertical of this uh, triangle. Can computation create the next wonder material? <clears throat> so what we do is basically theory supported 
computation using the power of high performance computing. And this is kind of a really outdated list and the list is no way complete. It just tells you some of the institute and organization which hosts some of this high performance computer. But this list is really outdated because the government has come up with this national supercomputing mission where the mission is to install petaflop machines under this mission at different corners of India so that people will benefit those who want to do computation out of these machines. And we are now in the third or last phase of this national supercomputing mission and in this third phase nine more supercomputers will be installed and uh, SNGO Center which is a much smaller in size compared to many of the IITs that are listed there uh, has been actually uh, put in this list and hopefully because with CDEC we have already signed the MOU and the space has been identified, uh, the creation of this data center has been planned. So we are very hopeful this year itself will have the machine. <coughs> and this is supposed to cater the computation need of not only SNGO Center, SNGO Center is just the hub, but all the institutes in and around Calcutta. So what I will do is basically tell you about computation that involves the electrons because the, many of the properties are dictated by the electrons, which is the glue that binds atoms together. So the goal is to calculate the electronic properties in an ab initio and or first principles way. So why and what is a first principles approach? It gives a way to calculate properties of material that are dictated by the electrons in a time and before it can be tested in a time consuming or costly laboratory experiments because if you are thinking of a new property, new material, before you go to the lab, it is much easier if you can predict some of it in through a computer. <coughs> it screens the huge pool of materials you have and narrow it down. It retains all chemical and structural information and provides microscopic understanding. So there is another triangle. You know the composition. And these days, you can even calculate the structure of the material. I will show that. And once you know these two things, this kind of calculation basically helps you uh, in predicting the properties. At the heart of it, there is a kind of some self-consistent cycle, basically that iterates between a Schrodinger-like equation. This is the only time I will show some equation. That's a Schrodinger-like equation, but it is not quite Schrodinger equation because the potential here depends on the density which is your output. So your input actually depends on the output. See, therefore, you need to have an iterative mechanism and the iterative, you are iterating between this Schrodinger-like equation which is known as Kohn-Sham equation and the Poisson equation which is the inverse problem knowing the potential, what is the density. If you know the density, what is the potential? solving that. So you basically iterate between the two. <coughs> what are the quantities you can calculate? Structural stability you can calculate in a very precise manner because total energies you can calculate with a great accuracy. So you can predict whether a material will be BCC or FCC because you can compare their energies in a very accurate manner. You can calculate what is known as band structure. That's basically the energy dispersion of this electron. And since you can calculate the band structure, you have an access to the optical properties. You can calculate the phonons, both in harmonic and quasi-harmonic approximation, giving access to Helmholtz and this free energy. All of these are zero temperature calculation. You may need to do finite temperature and there very often what we use is some ab initio molecular dynamics which unifies the quantum mechanics with molecular dynamics because you use the Schrodinger-like equation that I showed 
to solve the electronic degrees of freedom, while you handle the ionic degrees of freedom, which are much heavier, you basically solve using classical Newton equation and connection between the two, that means the force acting on these ions are actually calculated in a completely quantum mechanical way by solving this electronic problem. And we also have a way to handle the strong electron-electron correlation level. This is a too technical thing, but anyone interested in the audience, uh, we can actually, uh, I'll be happy to discuss that. So these are some of the things that you can calculate and some of the technicalities. <coughs> so what I will try to show you that through such kind of a technique, you can basically address three different kinds of problems. The first category of problem is the structure property relation. That means the material is known, its structure is known, someone has measured their crystal structure, the properties are known that has been made in the measured in the lab. What you know, want to know is the link between the structure. What are the changes in the structure that affects the property in a certain way? Because the structure has many different coordinates, many different things. What is the key parameter that actually influences the property? So these are one kind of problem. So what I will show is the example of the superconductivity. And in this room, everyone knows about the superconductivity. Well, basically, below certain critical temperature, your resistivity really vanishes. And you have a zero resistance state as found for mercury. Now the TC is very low. 4.2 Kelvin. So this is the famous plot which plots the year in x-axis and in the y-axis what is plotted is this critical temperature and the goal is to push this critical temperature as high as possible so that you can make use of this superconducting property at an elevated temperature. That's the goal. And still the golden age of superconductivity is the copper age of superconductivity because at ambient condition, of course, people have attended much higher critical temperature, but with extremely high pressure. So that, that technical application of that involves something more. So you can see this cuprate, they have the essentially the same, you know, it's a family of compound. They all have copper and oxygen, which is common to all of them. <clears throat> and so far under the ambient condition of pressure, that's the highest TC reported. It is not quite the room temperature, but it is above 100 Kelvin, even pushing it to 150 Kelvin. Okay. So now, this is the phase diagram. So in the phase diagram, in one axis, I have the temperature. In other axis, I have the doping, because all these materials has to be whole doped to get into the superconductivity. If you don't dope, it is an antiferromagnetic insulator. And then by doping, a dome-shaped superconducting dome that is known as. And the highest point of this dome is basically at optimal doping. That's the highest temperature you can attain. That's fine. All of them, they are all having copper oxygen, which is considered to be responsible behind the superconducting. But some has lanthanum, some has bismuth, some has thallium, some has mercury. And this maximum TC is quite different. For the lanthanum compound, this TC is 40 Kelvin. While for the mercury, this TC is 90 Kelvin. It has doubled. So by changing lanthanum to mercury, I have done something to this system to push the TC from 40 to 90 Kelvin. So this is a measured thing. These materials exist, people know about it, but we want to make a link between the two. What makes a change in the structure by replacing lanthanum to mercury and push the TC two times more? What is the reason? So this is basically the crystal structure that is well known. And uh, you have copper atom, which is shown as red ball, surrounded by the oxygen, which are yellow colored ball and they are plain which is shown as this pink color shaded thing. So they are planar structure and you have in between some of these things like lanthanum. 
But what is more important, there are some oxygens which are out of this copper oxygen plane and for the experts these are known as epical oxygen. And what we found is that these distance between this pink shaded plane to this oxygen which is out of plane is the most important structural quantity. So if you look at the band structure, so called band structure, I don't know how many of you have seen band structure. So this is nothing but the energy dispersion and so it is the energy versus wave vector plot if you like and zero of the energy is set at the Fermi level and uh, this is a spaghetti of bands, very complicated. But at this zero energy, there is only one band that is crossing the Fermi level and that basically describes the Fermi surface which the experimentalist can measure. Well, uh, for a non-expert, this red colored thing looks pretty similar, but for an expert actually they are quite different. But what is actually uh, demons, you know, manifestation of their difference is the shape of this Fermi surface that is actually quite different between these two different compounds and which is measured in the angle result photo emission. If you look at the wave function that basically describes this single red colored band, this wave function is very different between the lanthanum compound and the mercury compound. For lanthanum compound, this wave function is pretty complex. It is basically a hybrid between different kind of orbital degrees of freedom. For mercury compound, this is really, really extended in two dimensional. It is much more two dimensional while for lanthanum, this is more three dimensional. It is more compact in plane but has an extend in the outer plane direction. And what we find if we define a dimensionless quantity which is called the range parameter of describing this wave function it's two dimensional spread of this wave function that actually correlates very nicely with this single structural quantity that's this distance this distance for lanthanum compound is 2.4 angstrom while for mercury is 2.8 angstrom just by that you make this spread very different we repeated it for almost all known high dc at that time i mean after that no more has been discovered way back. So this is a semi-empirical plot. We did not compute the transition temperature. This is a measured transition temperature and this is this range parameter. And what we find that this single quantity actually correlates with the superconducting DC. Now the lesson we learned, if you can make this wave function really, really two dimensional your TC will be higher and higher and how can you make it more two dimensional is by increasing this particular distance. And following our prediction of course some two layer, three layer has been made and this TC which I showed here as 125 that was actually pushed to 175 Kelvin but after that the material did not form. That is a different problem. So the other example I want to give is some low dimensional quantum spin system. So what are these objects? They are basically transition metal oxides with a small spin. So I use the word low dimensional. Structurally they are not low dimensional at all. They are three dimensional. They are not like nano object. They are three dimensional. Thing. So why do I use the word low dimensional? Even if structurally they are three dimensional because of the presence of this transition metal, there are magnetic centers and these magnetic interactions are highly anisotropic. Even if the structure is three dimensional, only in one particular direction, the magnetic interaction is strong. In other direction, the magnetic interactions is very weak. So magnetically, this object is a low dimensional object. And why the word quantum spin? If you look at all these transition metals that I have used, they give rise to a small spin, spin of half or spin of one and that makes the, these two factor small <coughs> spin together with this low dimensionality of the magnetic interaction that <coughs> makes the effect of quantum fluctuation very, very important and as a result you get some of these phenomena like spin gas states 
I will not elaborate because this is really again at the expert level. Spin chart separation, quantum criticality, all of these are effect of this two quantity, the low dimensionality of the magnetic exchange and the smallness of the spin. Now often the true nature of this low dimensionality, you have no idea of it, if somebody tells you just the compound. So what we do, we do such first principles calculation, come up with an effective model because electron-electron interaction plays a big role and then we employ some of the many body techniques like exact diagonalization, uh, quantum Monte Carlo or Dana um, uh, DMRG kind of thing to arrive to a physical picture and by that you can calculate quantities like magnetic susceptibility which can be measured. They had no idea the experimentalists just by measuring the susceptibility. What is the underlying spin model? How do the spin interactions talk to each other? So it is our job to make this connection or you can even calculate the spin wave spectrum which you can actually compare with the neutron experiment. Uh, how much time I have? 10 minutes. So I will go very quickly. So this is an effective tool in uncovering structure property relations. The other kind of thing, we are becoming a little more ambitious. Now, we, I talked about materials known, properties known, we are making a connection between the two. Is there a way to predict new functionalities which experimentalists have not really explored, but these materials are known? So I show one example, which is that of the metal organic framework. So what is a metal organic complex? I know this is a you know, gathering of physicists, but I'm just trying to tell you that because the problem is a physics problem. So you have again a transition metal center, which is a magnetic center, and that has some organic ligands connected to it. Why the organic ligands are important? Because they're very flappy. They can be externally part of very easily. So what is shown here, you have at the center iron 2 plus, there is no periodic table because it is completely physicist world. So iron 2 plus has D6 electron, let me tell you that thing. And because of the presence of this organic molecules around it, each of the iron is now surrounded by 6 of the nitrogen atom. As a result, iron D level, which if you solve the hydrogen atom problem, where five-fold degenerate because of this presence of this nitrogen atom which is in some octahedral coordination, it splits into three-fold degenerate and two-fold degenerate. Now there are two ways you can actually arrange these six electrons. Either you can pair them up as is shown here, then it will be actually a diamagnetic atom because S will be equal to zero. I can also arrange them in this following way and as a physicist, you should know about the Hood's rule because in this is actually preferred if I have can overcome this energy barrier because I am converting two of the green spin to red spin. So I have to overcome an energy barrier but in this way I maximize the spin. So it is a competition between this energy level and the Hood's rule. Hood's rule favors this but the splitting favors this kind of spin configuration. So by external means, actually you can tune this energy separation and therefore make a transition from two different kind of spin state and it comes actually with the change of color. So it's actually a very interesting concept. Now we want to make this phenomenon cooperative by putting one magnetic ion next to another. So I have a spin crossover. This is called a crossover because it's at the molecular level. It's a crossover. But I put one molecule next to each other and make them talk to each other so that the entire phenomena becomes cooperative. So all this spin crossover happens at the same side at all magnetic center and it becomes a spin state transition. And if it becomes a spin state transition, there is detailed theory, I will not get into it. It may show up with a history effect. That means this low spin to high spin transition in the heating path and cooling path that will differ. That means you can impart a memory effect to 
this entire thing because your system remembers which path I followed. And it shows a bias stability as is shown here. At the same temperature, you can actually have two different colors of this compound depending on which path you are in. <coughs> well, this has, this I have already said, and the possible candidates, coordination polymers, the chemists have come up with this idea where you put this magnetic sector next to each other and makes a polymer which can be one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. There are hybrid perovskites which can be another material. You need to talk, make these molecules talk to each other as strongly as possible. Well, these materials technologically are very important, but to compute them, there are several different challenges. First is the strong electron-electron correlation. To describe their magnetism in a correct way, you need to handle this strong electron-electron correlation effect, complex geometry of the material because of this molecular structure and etc. Very often we have to handle some 400 to 500 atoms in the unit cell and you can imagine all of them has that many electrons in the SPD F level and you have to handle all of that. And the third one is probably most important to capture the electronic and structural changes under external perturbation. And these are the, some of the techniques we use. And because of the lack of time, I will just show two examples where we predicted a pressure by using pressure as an external perturbation. You can basically show such kind of the cooperative spin crossover or a spin state transition with the hysteresis. And we also come up with the mechanism how to manipulate the width of the hysteresis, both in the temperature. Uh, this one is the example of the temperature wave. This is with the pressure wave. And we also have now shown it with the light, so which you might be interested how we can manipulate this. So it designs new functionality. It is possible. Now you have to, which we are trying with some of the chemists in the IIT Kharagpur, uh, basically motivating them to look for some of the thing. And we have joint paper now with this chemist. So they are working on it. Now, uh, five minutes or two minutes I have? Five minutes. Now, you know, when you are becoming ambitious, you become more ambitious. So can you predict new materials altogether, which did not exist? So we had first kind of problem, materials known, properties known. We made a connection between the two. Second set, materials were known. Properties remained un unexplored, so we are basically guiding the experimentalists. The third one is even more ambitious. Can we really predict new material which did not exist and thereby tell some of the synthesis people to please make it? So I will come up with the example of magnetic material. I don't think I have to read out. We use magnetic materials every day. It's very surprising. Maybe you don't know even. 5% of the known inorganic materials are magnetic. Rest are all non-magnetic. Finding a new magnetic material is a huge challenge. And we became more ambitious because we wanted not only magnetic material, but specific kind of magnetic material like ferromagnetic half metals. So what are ferromagnetic half metals? We all know what is a ferromagnet, like iron is a ferromagnet. But now the Electrons which are now spin polarized because they are in the electron spin in this two direction they are polarized in case of a ferromagnet. The electronic conduction will happen for the electrons with one specific spin polarization but not with the other one. So in a certain way it is called a half metal because one spin channel conducts the other spin channel does not conduct. So what are these importance? Very simple one for your information, carrying information from one side to another. In addition to the charge of the electron, you can now use the spin of the electron and that gave rise to a first field called spintronics. So you need such ferromagnetic half metals and to make device the, in the spintronics, you also need antiferromagnetic metals. So what are antiferromagnets where your spins are antiparallelly aligned, but I want them to be metals because I have to make the device where I will put all this ferromagnet as a pinning center with these antiferromagnetic metals. 
nature is not very generous. Both ferromagnetic half metals and anti ferromagnetic metals are rare in nature. Most ferromagnets you know of, you can think about them, they are all metals but not half metals. And anti ferromagnets, those are the material scientists in this audience, all the examples you know, they are insulators, they are not metals. So, some of these properties don't go together. So we need, new, we need new materials with the related properties and we focused on a very specific family. These are known as double proskite. Some of you who are condensed matter masters uh, with a special paper in condensed matter in ferroelectric, you have come across the term which is called perovskite. It's called ABO3. I see some, some people shaking their head. So there are some people who have condensed matter in, <laughs> as their special paper in masters. Well, you take this ABO3, now make it double. So then the formula becomes A2, B2, O6. But since you have B2, instead of a single transition metal, you can use basically two different transition metals, B and B prime. And solid state chemists, they are fantastic people. They can do miracles. To me, they do miracles you can actually make them order. This B and B prime, you can make them order. Therefore, you have such kind of octahedra, B prime O6, B prime surrounded by 6 oxygen, B surrounded by 6 oxygen, and they are in a checkerboard pattern. So why did we think of this particular family? Because many of them are magnetic and magnetic with high spin. <coughs> so to cut the long story short, this is again an uh, article actually in the Solid State Chemistry Journal. And what they have done is a great bookkeeping. So th at the A side, the general formula was A2 BB prime O6. At the A side, they put divalent cations like calcium, strontium, barium, or trivalent like lanthanum. And then they move across the entire periodic table as a combination of B and B prime. And what you have, all these little boxes are basically one BB prime combination. The green ones are the compounds that have been made, synthesized, reported in the literature. The yellow ones are the compounds that have been made, but they don't form in a double perovskite, perovskite structure. Their structures are something different. The violet or the blue ones are the cases where you need high pressure, high temperature synthesis, the normal route of synthesis doesn't work. Red ones are very few because people are very afraid to publish their negative results. So there, there are attempts, but attempts fail. The compounds didn't form. But what caught our attention, there are many white boxes. No one has tried to make it. And uh, people will not make things unless it's interesting. Why they didn't make it? So we thought of using machine learning. Is it possible if there are so many such kind of combinations we have to look at? For the studying purpose, can one use machine learning? And which we used. And I will not get into the details because the time is running out. And this is a very standard technique. And I think my student taught me how to do some of the basic machine learning. Since my student taught me, I think it is simple enough one can at least the level we are using. So, and we scanned through some 412 BB prime combination. We found out of that some 33, which with a strong confidence level, we said that if it is attempted, they would be met. 60 with a moderate level of confidence. For 29, the prediction was unresolved. For 54, again, with a very strong level of confidence, we could say that even if you attempt, they will not be made. And we then, after we have shortlisted how whether they will be formed or not, through our first principles calculation, together with some model Hamiltonian study, we looked at these properties of these shortlisted compounds in a closer way, and we found several examples of ferromagnetic half metal that we are looking for. And one example, one signal <coughs> example of an anti ferromagnetic metal. And currently, we have a collaborative project with Moscow State University where they are 
trying to make some of this metal uh, materials. That's my punchline because Rupa said I should have a punchline. The punchline is material matters. New materials in design is one of the key topic in modern research. And this is a fascinating playground for future. And we wrote an article in Bulletin of Material Science. So if some of you are interested, you can have a look at it. And acknowledgement to numerous students and collaborators who contributed in whatever little I told you. And thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks so much, Questions? Hi. So, uh, excellent talk. Uh, I just wanted to know, see, density functional theory is kind of, um, a, it addresses large conglomerates of uh, this thing now. And um, when you posited this entire enterprise by framing it in the context of quantum uh, uh, technologies, etc., um, the bigger the system, the more the complexity that you have to deal with. And in quantum systems, you typically want to reduce it to a few level system, etc. So, actually, do you? Yeah. see what yeah. is the pathway you see towards yeah, yeah, reducing yeah, it's, this it's a very good question and uh, you know since i made it very general and uh, really reduced the level i didn't explain all that so basically if you have seen that in the example of the high tc cuprate there were spaghetti of bands what we do actually in our group we do a low energy modeling exactly what you said we want to reduce the degrees of freedom we start with a huge number of degrees of freedom, which the DFT deals, but then we actually do a technique, which is known as a downfolding technique, and construction of some effective one-year function through which we actually reduce these degrees of freedom enormously, and we deal with only few degrees of freedom. And then the model that comes with this few degrees of freedom, we solve it with a many-body technique not really coming out of the domain of the density functional theory. Yes, absolutely. So to put a provocative point just for your comment. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is that when you reduce it to these few degrees of freedom, then is the, de I mean, density functional pathway actually useful or you can just start with that? No, density functional part is very useful because that is the message I wanted to give when you are deriving this few degrees of freedom Hamiltonian, your chemical rigor should be kept intact, should be encoded in there. If it is not encoded, we could not explain all this IPC trend. Thanks. So uh, you mentioned about this pressure-induced hysteresis uh, uh, and all. Mm -hmm. So uh, this technique can you also use to explain this uh, shape memory type material like Yes, uh, yes, people have used. I didn't have that example and personally I have not that done that work. But employing such technique in the shape memory alloy, I can give you all literature, huge amount of literature. Very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Sudeshna Sinha from Aisar Mohali. Sudeshna is a, she's a professor at, a senior professor at Aisar Mohali. Uh, she works in the areas of nonlinear physics. Her research interests include nonlinear dynamics, chaos, complex systems, networks, and computation, much decorated like her predecessor. She's also the fellow of several very uh, important uh, organizations and academies. Uh, the title of her talk is Complex Systems, Surprises from the Interplay of Order and Disorder. Thanks. So first off, of course, thanks to Randini and Urvashi for having me here. Um, I will confess that I know these occasions uh, have this deep and serious purpose, which it indeed does, and we will have panel discussions on that. Um, but for me, I confess, it's an, it's an opportunity to meet my wonderful, terrifically smart uh, women scientist colleagues. And you know, I, if it, it's an excuse, but it's a wonderful excuse to hear their science and talk about stuff which is science and not science as well. Okay. So we are having fun. Okay. And so anyway, so what I thought I'd um, kind of uh, talk about today is this uh, uh, field of complex systems. And uh, in some sense, um, this field has got a little bit legitimate of late, uh, partly because there was a Nobel Prize with the word complex system stuck in the citation. 
we can't have it better than that. Uh, so uh, this was recent. Before that, we more or less struggled with this idea that these guys who do complex systems are always sort of, it's a shady word, where they take all this phenomena which they are not getting a handle on, push it under the rug, which is an umbrella rug, uh, which is stuff which doesn't fit concepts we yet know of. That's a big rug. Okay. So, uh, so what I thought I'd do since it's a general, uh, whatever, small but a general audience, um, I'd start with a very shallow crash, uh, whatever, intro on the concept of chaos and then go on to say a little bit of what complex systems is about. Okay. And um, uh, so whoever is an expert in the audience, uh, you must, uh, well, forgive me uh, for lack of rigor. Uh, as I have, of course, uh, Shubra has said, uh, we were discussing, uh, you know, but uh, in the interest of reaching a slightly broader audience, I will keep it a little light. Okay. So I absolutely love to start off with this. It's a spin on Eugene Wigner's uh, quote, uh, but I have twisted it a little. Classical mechanics is what I'm going to talk about, okay? And uh, classical is maybe a polite word for old. You don't want to call them old field. You say classical field, makes it sound a little better. Uh, but it's a seriously old field. And what amazes me, when I even teach young people uh, you know, physics 101, which is mechanics, um, is the unreasonable effectiveness of it. I mean, it has no business being this good. You know? And it's a workhorse. It's a workhorse for engineers all over the world. It's a workhorse for many physicists also. Okay? And the second thing I, I personally like about it, uh, because a bit of me is like an applied math person, is that it is extremely rigorous mathematically. So it is rigorous. You can set it up. You can write the equations. And those equations seem to hold for everything from atomic to planetary scales. I, it never ceases to wonder and you're like how the same bunch of equations can describe such large scales. So, concept of chaos could be thought of as a new kid in a very old block. Okay, So it's a new frontier and in some ways if you want to put it a little more bombastically. But it does have a, a point of reassessing the classical physical world. So a lot of classical physics starts with foreseeing the future. That's how astronom uh, not astronomers, sorry, astrologers are in business. And you know all those columns in Times of India, which we would say is, is my PRL going through this week, or you know uh, we all do it. Uh, but so foreseeing the future is is a big deal. And one of the beautiful things about classical physics is it's deterministic. Okay, so which means that if you know all the properties of a system. The system could be a single particle, it could be weather patterns, so you know the scale could be anything. Uh, and if you know the laws of physics, big if, but if you know it, then you can put them together to predict the future. And that is what you have as a concept of a clockwork universe. The surprise was that an extremely large number of very simple processes can give extremely complex behavior. See, if a very complicated thing gave a very complicated behavior, you'll say, oh, well, I mean, you threw in so many things, obviously something complicated came out of it. The surprise were extremely simple things gave extremely complicated behavior. That was the surprise. And it was so weird that it appeared, though you were using completely deterministic laws, it appeared to be following random forces. It was as if it was knocked around by, by some random uh, force. People couldn't, practically couldn't tell. So you started using the word determinism and unpredictability in the same sentence, deliciously contradictory. And this is what uh, necessitated this paradigm shift, and we have this uh, chaos uh, theory. Um, I have this slide, which is uh, to say that the word chaos, it's, it's, it's interesting to see sociologically because it actually is used in commonplace language commonplace not just today in English language like Webster dictionary but even the Greeks had it uh, meaning abyss and you know something grand all the Greek stuff is very grand uh, but, you know emptiness of the universe and stuff like that uh, the Chinese I gave this talk and then they came and showed me the symbol and I have taken a screen grab and I put it they said we also had uh, chaos uh, Empress of somewhere uh, had uh, talked about it apparently uh, but 
in ordinary English language, we use it all the time to describe everything from politics to traffic. Uh, you know, so, so we know this word only too well in this country. The part which I find interesting is a commonplace English uh, word became a technical term for the first time in about 1975. This was in the American Math Month Monthly, so it's actually in, in the math literature that it became a technical term. And the first paper which used it as a technical term was one by Lee and York. Um, and Jim York is very much still uh, alive. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so he said, period three implies chaos. So that's how something happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I couldn't quite, um, uh, 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 I mean, there were things, uh, yeah, so that's a difficult question. I should probably have, uh, do a little more uh, research into it. Uh, nobody, if anyone in the audience has a good one, I will uh, put it in the next slide for the next talk. Yeah. Chinese huh. the, the word chaos is pretty neat uh, sounding word, right, for something which is, uh, so, so, so you know, so uh, the, what a concept is, and what the word used to describe the concept is something. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so just a little more story. So the first hints that uh, nature can be both deterministic and unpredictable actually goes back a long time. Not that it, they knew what it was, but they got a hint, and this was actually a competition. And the world loves competitions, and um, so it was the three-body problem, the famous three-body problem. And Poincaré won the prize without actually solving the problem. How mathematician of him is that? You know, he says, "Okay, this is a very difficult problem, and I'm telling you why it is so difficult and why it can't be solved." And the thing is, and the last two lines are important. The important thing is that small differences essentially blow up in your face extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, which is what underlines unpredictability. So it's effectively, you can't really tell what happens later on. So of course, the present determines the future. That is definition of determinism. The word determinism means that. But the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. They are actually deeper words than you might think. I just stuck in approximate, but that's uh, what it is. In a completely different scenario, in the 1960s, Edward Lawrence, not a physicist, an uh, atmospheric scientist, was studying a weather model on a very early computer. You know, the time where you would stop it, go for lunch, <coughs> restart it, and people would do it routinely. They'll take the last bunch of data and restart it and make it uh, go on. And what he found was wildly different results, which was independent of his lunch. It was dependent on how much he stored his data. So if he stored it in one part per million, he would get a certain thing. When he put it in like 10 parts per million, he got a completely different result. This rattled anyone who was trying to say simulations for me too is some kind of reality. I mean, the Rishi does simulations, and we all feel a way computation is our, our reality. So this was very disconcerting in some ways. and. Um, so the only reason I sell it is that it is actually widespread in nature. So you just have to go up one level of complexity to get it. You don't have to put in the works to get chaos. So simple pendulum two-body problem, textbook. You're supposed to do it in your 101. Just add one more bob to your pendulum. Put one more bob, double pendulum, all bets are off. You absolutely can't do it in the full sense. Just start, okay? One two-body. Textbook, three body, all bets are off. So here is a picture I stole, stole off uh, Wikipedia, and it is a double pendulum. It's absolutely fascinating to watch it because you know there are these little uh, betting games saying this is where the bob is going to do a rotation and here it's going to do a vibration, and everyone loses that bet. So in the framework of mathematics, we have two kinds of things. One is flows, where we um, describe your so these are dynamical systems because they are, uh, it's a framework which takes the state of a system forward in time. Simple as that. There is dynamics, things move in time. So one is flows, where you describe it as uh, differential equations. Okay? The others are maps, very popular, I love them too, uh, which is 
discrete time. So that is where you take a state at some, so time is like an integer counter. So at time n, n plus 1, n plus 2, etc., etc. And if you think of it, a lot of life is actually stroboscopic. Because you know, you measure things, you know, in whatever you say, whatever is your sampling rate, it is actually a discrete process. So it's not a, a bad model of the world. And uh, what you get is an orbit. And so the question is, how large does the system have to be in order to exhibit chaos? And the rigorous result is n, if you have ordinary differential equation, n has to be greater than or equal to 3. If you have maps, if it's invertible, which just means that its inverse also exists and is unique, then you can need just 2. So you just need two, two couple variables to get chaos. And if the map is non-invertible, so that it's un uh, it doesn't have a unique uh, uh, inverse, then you can get chaos even with a one-dimensional map. Doesn't get simpler than that. So in short, you have to deal with chaos because it's there in even the simplest things. So here is a picture of uh, one-dimensional non-linear discrete maps. N is your counter of time. And as you can see, they're cr really simple. And that really messy time series there has come from iterating that on top, which you can do even on a pocket calculator or on your cell phone, literally. So it is a, it's, it's, it, though it's as simple as that, so, and it is ticking like clockwork, and it gives that mess. So if you saw that mess, you wouldn't relate it to something that simple. So that is one thing I would like you to carry back. And because uh, I put this in in the morning, because I saw cats, and I saw Ranjini feeding her cats. And I know Urbashi has cats. And all these quantum people have cats. Uh, so we too have cats, uh, dead or alive. Uh, we like them. And this is a famous uh, cat due to mathematician Arnold. Uh, it's an area preserving two dimensional <coughs> map, just to be a little bit uh, um, technical. Uh, but it's an invertible map. So I needed two dimensions to show chaos. It's a representation of what happens due to that, how simple that is, 2x plus y, and x plus y, okay? And what it does to that pixel in one iterate, it gives you that mangled cat, poor cat, uh, and it, it's, it's what it does in just one iterate, okay? So it's, it's a very, very powerful thing, and it comes from stretching and folding. So if it was just stretching, then it's boring because things fly off to infinity, what's the fun in that? The fact that you sort of push it back into finite spa phase space is what gives it. So in complex uh, systems, the basic thing is the whole is more than a sum of parts. So you take that, that was still a low dimensional object, you string them together, and you can make complex systems. And now you can get things which are counterintuitive. That was counterintuitive, now you're putting them together to get more surprises, okay? So it might seem, you know, that you might do some reductionist approach, like you say there's an emergent level. It might be uniquely determined by the physics operating below it. So you know, just that science X is applied science Y, but that is not how it works. That's how all of us are in business. If it was, then we just all do fundamental stuff at home. That's not how it works. At each stage, actually you need new laws and new concepts in order to be useful. And more is definitely different, okay? And uh, so to bring you back to this uh, Nobel Prize of a couple of years ago, the word was that it was on understanding complex systems. I find this Nobel Prize extremely interesting because it tells you how interdisciplinary all these things are. When my physics friends saw it, they were like, who on earth is Manabe and Hasilma? Like, you know, and I absolutely understand why they didn't know them, because they are atmospheric scientists, but this is a Nobel Prize in physics. And the thing is that a whole lot of my friends actually knew them quite well. So, you know, we, we cut across barriers. And uh, the umbrella thing was still complex systems, okay? Uh, so the way to study complex systems is to build models. And here is a schematic, since to take a, uh, to follow Shubra's thing, a picture says it better than words. So, so this is what I would say is the essence of scientific modeling. Uh, to me, I love that quote. I don't know where I picked that up. Or maybe I'm misquoting. It says that models are opinions embedded in mathematics. I like that because I like the math part of it. And it is definitely my opinion that this is important and this is the key feature and this is what I'm putting it. 
if your opinion is important, pe people will you know, uh, go with it. Okay. And there's a whole thing from the cartoon to the complicated and physicists do both things. One gives broad understanding and one gives uh, quantitative predictions. Uh, so the usual recipes are that you have a local dynamics, which is you know low dimensional stuff, and you string them together with links. So there's local nodal dynamics and there's links. And the interplay of that is a big outstanding question. So uh, there is a little hierarchy which I like to put up, which I'll, and then I'll just illustrate it with two small examples from my own work. So um, in all our models, we have to take care of space, because these are extended systems, lots, bunch of them together. So space or extent in some sense. Time, because of course, dynamics, I love dynamics. And state variables, because there's something which, you, which is of physical interest that you're measuring, that you're keeping track of. Could be temperature, pressure, velocity, whatever. And here is a hierarchy of models, um, which I like to show. It's sort of my thing. Um, that you have, for instance, you can discretize any one of these things and get a class of models. Like if you had partial differential equations, you would have space is continuous, time is continuous, state variable is continuous. If you have oscillator chains, like say five harmonic oscillators in something, then you'll have Space is discrete because each of them has a number. But of course, you're writing a, a differential equation, so you know it's in the second one. Couple map lattices, which I'll show one example from, where you have space is discrete, time is discrete because it's a map, and space variable is, is uh, continuous. And cellular automatons, Wolfram will tell you the world is a cellular automata. Uh, don't believe him. Uh, but um, he would say everything is discrete. So even your state space is a finite state. But please remember, each one of them is not a poor man's version of the other. So it's not like cellular automata is a poor man's PDE. They have different uh, ways in which to you know, address reality. So now I will very quickly uh, just give you one example from my own stable, because of course I have the slides for it, um, and answer one question just to give you a flavor of how surprising things can be. So here is a question. What is the spatiotemporal behavior of a connection of elemental chaotic dynamics? So chaotic systems are doing all this extremely complicated behavior. You string them together in a network or in, a, in some lattice. And what happens? Do you get more of the same? Does linked chaos give you just more complicated behavior? Or are there any surprises? Okay. And so here is a uh, specific example, which I will very, very quickly tell you. Here is a set of, say, 100, if you want to fix a number, n um, nodes, that is to say, uh, elemental objects. Each one of them is a chaotic map of the kind which I showed you, extremely complicated. And they just talk to nearest neighbors. So there's a local on-site map, which is chaos, fully chaotic. And there are these neighbors, which it's talking to. Now. If I put these chaotic systems in a lattice, by lattice I mean a regular network, like a ring. So say I took 100 of them, they are talking to nearest neighbors, and I put it on a ring. Technically, this is what is called a bifurcation diagram. So on one side, I'm cranking up the coupling string, and on the y-axis, I'm literally taking a snapshot of the entire lattice at all times. And all you need to take away from this is it's a mess. Okay, So I, if I say this is spatiotemporal chaos, that is to say it's still chaotic in time and there's no correlation in space, I think you will buy it. Now, I take the same chaotic maps and I connect them with random links. So I'm throwing apparently more randomness because there it was on a regular lattice, but now I put shortcuts in space and I have put in some randomness there. Okay, so this is what I'm doing. The regular lattice was there. I started rewiring them, cutting the links, and making it more and more random. So p equal to one in this uh, is a parameter which gives you increasing fraction of random links. Okay, and now, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm going forward. This is what I get. So these are the same set of strongly chaotic logistic maps, but now. 
they are dynamically changing random connections. So you might not take away any other thing from this talk, but I want you to take away these two pictures. I have, what have I done? I've taken these completely chaotic local dynamics. Now I have put random connections on it, and somehow the random connection has killed the local chaos. So my disorder has actually killed the other disorders. They have sort of given order. And this is not just order. This is spatiotemporal fixed point. It doesn't get more order than that. It is like literally each one of them are sitting at the same space, uh, I mean, at, at synchronized at the same place in time also. So it is serious order. So from serious disorder, by putting in these connections, you get order. So that is what uh, complex systems about. You know, you, you get these extremely uh, uh, unexpected results, uh, which which you have to uh, deal with. Do I have 10 minutes? Ah, OK. Oh, oh. oh. wonderful. OK. Uh, so uh, ah, yes. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm saying, could, could I go on and then take the question? Because I am slightly, then, then I can maybe finish a few more examples and then I'll get back to you. Huh? Sorry. Huh? Ha, ha, ha. Right, right. No, no, I, 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 I'll take that uh, comment later. Huh? So, so just, just to finish my story a little bit more, whatever, I'll stop whenever my time is up. Yeah. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this was one of the things. So, uh, um, so actually, I was trying to sell this for a while to my friends in uh, conferences, and no one was buying it. They said, you go and do an uh, analytic solution of it. And anyone who has been in the business knows that you cannot do an analytic solution of it, because it's just too hard. Um, however, the, I sort of thought I could flip the difficulty into an opportunity and try to look at the thing not as a full-blown linear stability, and I, I'll say just two minutes of technical words, uh, not as a linear stability problem, which would in, involve random matrices and um, that to varying random matrices in time. So it is not possible. However, if I close my eyes and make a cartoon of it, that's where modeling comes in, you say, each one of them has been seeing this neighborhood of uh, changing links. So everything is a blur for each map. So I can do a mean field analysis. You know, physicists love it. I mean, uh, the DFT is born out of things like that. So I can do that. And the good news there is then, then in the mean field thing, I can do it exactly. Okay. So uh, if I can do it exactly, which always makes theorists happy, if you get a simple expression out of it, it makes us happier. And um, this is the bottom line. It tells me that the regular nearest neighbors, which is p equal to 0, is the parameter, which is you can take loosely as fraction of random links. 0, which means no range of spatiotemporal fixed point. And the fully random connections gives the largest range of fixed points. Okay. So uh, you can also, so my little point in this uh, very shallow uh, uh, whatever uh, discussion of this is that uh, you can do uh, analysis, not the uh, full-blown analysis, but you can make this um, sort of uh, you know uh, little shortcut, which actually works very well. And this is how well it works. That solid line there is the analytical um, expression. Oh, I think maybe I could even do things like that. Yeah, I can. Uh, so this one here, these. Uh, these dots and symbols are things from simulation. And of course, you do all the careful things, go up lattice size, and everything falls on the same place. So this is pretty, pretty good. And uh, this dotted line just tells you that if it is a dilute number of random links, your, uh, your, uh, your um, uh, spatiotemporal fixed point increases linearly almost. So it does really well. Okay. Right. Um, this is more of the same. Um, so I uh, will, sorry, I will skip two, two things uh, here. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll come to this, OK? I didn't uh, get my time properly. So what I thought I'd do with whatever is left uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, talk is to give you a few examples, most of which will be a little bit uh, pictorial, OK? So just to be a bit light before lunch. So now I'll give three examples. 
One of them is a ring of couple cells. Okay? Uh, for, for, from the modeling point of view, it's nice because it goes to a different class of models. The one which I showed you was coupled map lattices, so, so time was discrete. Now these are differential equations, so it's in, a, it's in the next level in that hierarchy. And this was done with uh, Shomdatta Sinha. Uh, it, it helps to, to get uh, friends who are in mathematical biology. They have really nice uh, differential equations and uh, apparently they model uh, interesting stuff like uh, minimal biochemical pathway, uh, which is what she gave us. So this was the set of equations um, uh, which I put in a ring. So this is the picture. So on one side, I have those biochemical pathway on a ring. So P equal to 0 is a perfectly good lattice. You know, it's a regular network. Everything is on a ring. People are seeing its nearest neighbors. No random cross, cross connections, shortcuts, nothing. And if you see these, these are sort of, they don't look that regular. That's, and it is true. If I did a put an order parameter, which we have, it's going to not show order in space or in time. Here I've put an extremely dilute, just see, it's 0.05, so it's a very, very small number of random rings. And that is enough to push this entire system into what is called synchronization. So they are moving in time up and down, but all the cells are doing it together. So again, a little bit of random links goes a long way now to induce spatial order. So in the last one, it was space, space and temporal order. Now it is temporally there is oscillation, but now it is giving you spatial order. So but in some sense, it fits this thing that sometimes disorder can kill disorder in some ways. Uh, <coughs> so this maybe I will skip. Um, this one I will keep. So uh, my uh, student, uh, Vivek Kohar, was a student at that time. Um, so this is 2003, so I always stamp it BC before COVID because it is on infection spreading on a dynamical changing network. But it wasn't so fashionable then, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, but it was a mathematically interesting problem. So what Vivek did was he took a SIRS model, that is to say susceptible, going to infected, going to refractory, back to susceptible. So mostly like common cold, influenza, where you know all of us essentially every now and then fall sick, even if you've had it forever. So uh, that kind of a situation. And the question was that if you have these individuals on a, on a lattice, do you actually, does the infe uh, infection spreading depend on whether there are shortcuts in space and whether the shortcuts change in time? So it's not just that there are shortcuts in space, they might also change, right? You might take a flight to, to Bombay one day and to Delhi the other day, you know? So it's not just that you're going long distance, but you're changing your length. So what happens then? That was his question. And um, in terms of modeling, this is one level down in the hierarchy. This was a cellular automaton. So I thought that I'd show you one differential equation, one maps, and one cellular automaton. So technically speaking, this was a cellular automaton. And this is uh, one picture which I can share from there. So this one is when the network was not rewiring, uh, was rewiring slowly. So it was like taking, uh, 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 sorry, I said it wrong. So, so this one is when the network was rewiring slowly. So it's like static connections. There may be a few spatial shortcuts, but you know people are staying put where they are. Even if you know once in a while they go to a certain localities, and this is what is called an endemic state. So your your infected number is never peaking, so flattening the curve in some sense. So everything is spread out, but nothing is sort of getting together and you know making a massive thing which no one can deal with. Okay, the one here is it's it's rewiring at somewhat faster space, and here it's rewiring very fast. Forget these numbers because they are to do with the model, which I haven't put in, uh, but this is, you can take it as fast rewiring, moderate rewiring, and very slow rewiring. So what it says is that if you change your connections fast, you will start getting these synchronized infection uh, 
you know, build-ups, which means that you're going to have, uh, you know, this situation where there is an epidemic spike. So this is, this would be like your epidemic spikes, and this is endemic thing. And so, which of course, in some sense, uh, uh, makes sense. And in fact, our uh, referee had uh, given us a few nice diseases which he thought fit the bill. I didn't even know it. I went up to WebMD to check those diseases. They're very scary ones. Uh, but he said they were good for those. Um, and uh, uh, so we put them in the paper. I haven't put them here. But, uh, but I would say the central observation is this low quasi-fixed state, endemic infection, which goes to self-sustained oscillation, which is like periodic outbreak of disease as the links are switched more frequently. But if you look at it mathematically, it falls in the same sort of story which I've built so far, okay, from the beginning. Okay. So five minutes, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I will, I will more or less uh, uh, end in, in five minutes. Uh, so I should, uh, I thought I would just flash this without uh, saying too much. Um, so I had uh, managed to, you know, by giving this talk somewhere, uh, I managed to convince Puneet Parmananda, who has a nice lab in IIT Bombay, with coupled electrochemical cells. And uh, so, so you know, this is where, you know, uh, experimentalists, if you can convince them to do something, you know, life becomes so much better because, uh, you know, together it looks like a, something real. Uh, so, so what, what uh, so first of course, uh, Sudanshu was my student. What he had found was that there is another way in which you can get disorder if you get it to mean heterogeneity. So if you say uniformity is some kind of order, so a homogeneous system is more orderly, a heterogeneous system is more disorderly, if you say these words, then what he found was that if you took a, a network of chaotic systems and you threw in one different chaotic system, everybody's chaotic, but you threw in a different one, that difference made everyone collapse to a fixed point. It was quite dramatic. So then we thought, okay, it's dramatic in, 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 in the simulations, um, uh, uh, Puneet managed to set it up in an experiment and he found, uh, so we wrote a paper called Asymmetry Induces Suppression of Chaos and we went on to also show that you need not be a different chaotic system, you might be the same sort of chaotic system but running at a slower time scale. So we essentially had, you know, uh, oscillators which were written by same differential equations or modeled by same differential equations, but running at different time scales. And that also uh, was a kind of heterogeneity, which uh, made everything collapse to it. And this was a picture from his lab. Um, so here is the part where you switched on that heterogeneous system, and it all flattened out like this. So it's spatiotemporal fixed point. And otherwise, it was going its merry way, oscillating about. And so every time you threw in a heterogeneous system, it manages to, you know, that uh, to kill the oscillation. So it suppressed all the oscillations. And uh, two minutes, uh, I, I promise I will stop here. Uh, so this is the last thing I wanted to say. Not only is random links good for giving you synchronization and spatiotemporal fixed points, it also does this other thing called taming of blow-ups. So this was uh, Anshul, oops, sorry, uh, my uh, uh, another student of mine. So he was a very careful guy, and he came and said everything was blowing up in his in his uh, in his program, uh, which is very distressing uh, for if anyone. You know, you you go back, you debug it, and uh, but then I took him seriously. So then he had these oscillators, chaotic oscillators, in a ring, and it was blowing up. Uh, and I said, okay, just throw in a few random links and let's see if something happens. And this is what happened when it was put in a random thing, it managed to synchronize and to, to make the dynamics more orderly by just doing this thing. So not only was the stuff which was blowing up uh, kind of you know, brought back to a reasonable part of phase space, it was also actually managing to get some amount of order both in space and time. So, uh, so this was the last thing, I. Oh, so maybe just this one. So this is a Fitzhugh Naguma model of neurons. So some people I might like neuron, neuronal models. So when this was regular, these spikes ran off to infinity. Like so, so you know, these are spiking systems. The so spike will hit the ceiling if, if it's on a regular ring. 
put in a few dynamic, you know, random links, and all the spikes stay nice and contained. So explosive growth was also prevented. Okay, so I come to my last thing, and I will take questions. So this is uh, what I hope I just thought I'd uh, share a few fun things on complex systems. Um, and uh, the point is, there may be surprises when you put together nodal dynamics and connectivity. It could happen that something which was complicated in the node and something which was complicated in the links, together they get together and become orderly. So disorder and disorder might give order. And I also very rushed two minutes, tried to say how it could mitigate catastrophic uh, loads. That's it. Thanks, Sudesh. Sorry, Sudesh. Had a question. I, just, I need to thank you for. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> so I wanted to thank you for that very clear perspective on dynamic systems. And uh, no, I just had a remark. No, the, the, this is like the curious phenomenon that you were talking about. The, I mean, all of them had that common theme. So that reminded me of a, a soft matter example. You know, these uh, colloidal particles. Mm -hmm. So, so you, if you, if you take colloidal spheres of two, two different radii, m many large spheres and a few small spheres here, yeah? and then you find that the, there is a phase separation and uh, clear order. So uh, these are hard spheres. So it's basically just entropy is there. There is no energy. Right. So en entropy is associated with disorder. Right. So right. Or order, uh, uh, order emerging, emerging right. out of disorder. In fact, in the soft matter right. lab, I think Ronjini probably yeah. has so, right. yeah. so there's right. another context that I was right. actually thinking uh -huh. about, which is, you know, in imaging, uh -huh. we can only image through really turbid media, uh -huh. but not, you know, when the turbidity right. is moderate. Right. Right. So right. it's the same thing. Right. That, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. well understand why it happens. There are also yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. One is uh, this uh, example that you gave. How would you describe it in the entropy picture? Because you know it's drilled into our head about how entropy is worked yeah. and all that. Second question is you a small thing. You mentioned something about a different chaotic system. What did you mean yeah, by different? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but the, uh, so. I will not answer the entropy question so much because uh, in some sense uh, I, uh, uh, it is pretty well understood in terms of uh, dynamical systems and also uh, the, the, the fixed point solution of it and, and stabilizing it. So uh, it, since it's such a neat and complete explanation, uh, uh, I uh, would not, uh, uh, I, I think that would explain it fully. But the second one I can say a little bit more. So what I had meant was, was this that um, so suppose you take uh, you connect maybe five uh, chaotic uh, electronic circuits of a certain kind and you throw in a, a one uh, thing into the ring which is different say maybe it's an electrochemical oscillator maybe it's a neuronal oscillator something the, the point is that somehow that dissimilar oscillator which is also if, if it didn't talk to the others it would have been chaotic you know, uh, as in properly, uh, well and truly. But together they somehow, uh, the only possibility that it seems as if they have is to go to kill all the oscillations and go to a fixed point. Now, of course, the, uh, the thing is, is the fixed point stable? That for me is the big question. And, uh, and you can show that it is a stable fixed point. But uh, in terms of things, it is like uh, I have a bunch of systems which are similar. And I have a small number of dissimilar ob objects there. And some of that heterogeneity in, in my entire network is enough to induce order. So that was uh, what was the bottom line. And of course, there were, uh, I mean, different uh, uh, students took up different examples. So that you know, there are enough uh, examples of it. Uh, I showed three of them uh, because they had uh, experiments to go with it. But uh, the others are, of course, uh, numerical examples. Whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, we'll do uh, Pramod, uh, Sadek, Sanjeev, and Shobhan, and then anybody else because it's lunch time. Uh, so yeah, I know. We can go <laughs> on and on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, okay. and maybe, yeah. A couple of two quick yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, one is that uh, you mentioned these fixed points emerging yeah, out right. of these chaotic yeah. systems. Yeah. Are there some, is it a very general uh, rule or are there some certain uh, 
Uh, only certain get systems the, can. The, get the fixed point here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I didn't show the, the whole analysis. So the, uh, there is a, a certain uh, class of local maps. The interesting thing is it doesn't matter what the details of the map is. All that it ma all that matters is the uh, okay. So if the f of x is your um, dynamical rule, or, uh, your f prime of x at the fixed point is all that matters. It turns out after you do all the analysis. So it ma it does matter, of course, what your local uh, uh, object is in order to get the spatial temporal fixed point. But it it doesn't depend on the details. It just depends on your local instability of the fixed point. Which, uh, so in fact, uh, I didn't show it. There are uh, so like a whole bunch of examples which fall collapse on exactly the same thing because they just match this broad rule. Uh, so, so yeah. Question, uh, second question yeah. uh, regarding the brain: uh, okay. Is it is it a chaotic system which is kept under uh, you know a stable condition in the, with this sort of a principle or not? Because I'm asking this I wish I knew. <laughs> there, are, there are certain treatments for Parkinson, for example. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, what you yeah. do is true, to true. introduce yes, yes, an yes, extra signal that. in yeah. order to stabilize true, the system. True, 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 true. True. Yeah, yeah. So uh, indeed, a lot of them do say that uh, you know this, the suppression of oscillation or even uh, if it is uh, stopped to reintroduce it or even the epilepsy treatments uh, for a long time we were in business because of that. Uh, um, so um, it's a mixed uh, uh, verdict, if I have to be totally honest, in the sense uh, biology is too messy, there are no control experiments, uh, but uh, to, to, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, maybe there is a broad principle. Uh, I, uh, you know, I feel a bit uh, constrained. I mean, I don't feel like uh, saying the words that yes, it matters, you know, but uh, I do think that some principles of it uh, do go through. Uh, to what extent, I don't. I, I wish I knew. I, I, I think in the interest of continuity of my passing, I think you have to vote for all of them. And then I show you. And then everyone is hungry and we finish. Okay. Yeah, I have one question. So you are saying that if you drop in one um, odd one, right, right. That, uh -huh. and that kills the chaos. Hmm. So it seems to me, I mean, in your system, you need a long range interactions. Otherwise, possibly, uh, how does it? Uh, right. Do uh, that? right, right, right. Uh, so, so uh, what you're saying uh, sort of might, uh, uh, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, uh, uh, there is some, some uh, I think uh, you've got some essence of it absolutely right, and uh, that is to say, what does a random link do? It is a shortcut of information. So it's somehow managing to get across an information uh, where this one would go all around the ring. So if you take, you know, uh, average path length, for instance, in in a in a lattice or in a in a uh, random lattice, it's much shorter in a random lattice. So if you look at it from the information uh, transfer point of view, it is indeed true that that seems to be one of the reasons how it manages to, 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 to do it so fast. And if it's dynamic, you can imagine how short the path length is. Because it's literally uh, spreading its information in time as well. So OK, I missed one spot. Next time, you know, I put my uh, antenna out there and, and grabbed it. So yes, I, I think you're right uh, in, 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 a, in some very general sense. Yes, OK, okay it's a related question. So, uh, so I was wondering that uh, <coughs> This link you mentioned, mm -hmm. so what is, uh, how do you introduce mathematically or does it depend oh. on nature of the link? Ah, so you can do many things. So one thing, link is of course, like suppose I wrote a map, which is here is my local uh, map, and I say I'm linked to nearest neighbor. So then I will put local term, f of x, something, something, and then I to give, put some coupling string and then pick up the state variables of its nearest neighbor. If I want to have random links, I'll pick up the state variable of a, you know, of a non-local uh, random neighbor in that same equation. So the mm. equation will have two parts: the local part, which is full-blown chaotic, and the connection part. Uh, so a lot of stackback people are with the connection part. So a lot of network people would are so interested in the network properties. But I, you know, I, I'm a dynamics person. I just like dynamics. So, so I want to throw in dynamics on the nodes and of the links. So, yeah. So, in the equation, it's very simple. You just put it in, in yeah, the yeah. coupling part. So, usually, what we write is what is called an adjacency matrix, a connectivity matrix, which has, uh, you know, uh, could be weighted, could be unweighted, and will reflect the topology of the links. And then you just put that. So, you have a summation over that matrix elements. 
connectivity. It's just the connection things, and you can even yeah. put weights there if you want. No issues. Sir. No, I was uh, thinking little bit physically. So huh. by link, if I couple them by some field, for example, huh. that it will fill the field for only this, and it, it might be some electric field or magnetic right, field. Right, right. I was wondering, depending on the nature of field, whether it could, that yes. So I think it's like a, a cottage industry now. I mean, I shouldn't see these words. Huh? As in, you can uh, try this kind of uh, different kinds of uh, things, and you can have links with varying, uh, you know, uh, strengths. Could have power law details. Could have, uh, you know, all kinds. Then it could be linear coupling, non-linear coupling. Uh, <laughs> all kinds, yeah. But then also, it's a zoo of things. Uh, yes, so yeah, so you know, know well, well, a chapter of a thesis of uh, a different thesis, <laughs> and, and other people I've been doing. It it holds for a much larger set of uh, things than we even dared to hope for. This is what I will say as a thing. It seems to have some basic things, but they seem to be very broad uh, classes. So you know, uh, uh, not nitty gritties of the okay. details. So that is the part I like. Uh, it's. Somewhat broad. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so the, I have a very quick speculative question. Hmm. So, the thing is that we saw this that the order emerges. Hmm. So, these are all dynamically, but they are deterministic systems. They are deterministic. All of these are deterministic all of systems. Them are full because you calculate it again and again, you will get the same Absolutely. answer. Absolutely. If I start with the same random number seed, yeah. Yeah. So the the important thing is that so could I look at it like this that mm -hmm. when you get into the chaotic parameter range, huh. you go through the system is going through very rapid oscillations, and the moment you introduce a certain randomness mm -hmm. in this particular system, what doesn't matter what the mechanism of randomness is, you basically damp the the high frequency oscillation. So when huh. you see high frequency oscillations on your space you time, there for one minute. Um, thing is that that's the weird thing about chaos. It is not high frequency. It is a broadband spectrum. So if I did a Fourier transform of a chaotic system. Correct. You will see I, the I see all frequencies. I right? agree. Uh -huh. So the power spectrum right. is, is all over yeah, the place. Yeah. How one over the, but what I'm trying to say uh -huh. is the maybe the power spectrum is all over the place because of the sampling problem. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that even if you put a band to it, even if you uh, put a band. No, what, what the, the speculative, this is purely speculative. Sure. Huh. I have some examples of stuff which I have studied in the past, but uh -huh. uh, which I can, we can discuss later. Mm. But um, the, but the thing is that, so if you put the damping element, mm. because the, the mechanism is elusive, the, why is it that a certain small amount of randomness is collapsing you into specific state? Mm. So essentially, if there's a certain select parameterization where the system becomes chaotic and you move away from that uh, select parameterization uh, right right I, I now i got, got what where you are uh, going going right so yes uh, so so this sort of thought process i did have myself so what what i thought was would be a good uh, uh, exercise which i didn't show is to use what is called robust chaos where there are no you don't find these windows of parameterization and so that my uh, postdoc Shoma De, who's a woman actually, uh, she, she has sort of showed that you know it goes through because I also had a slight doubt that maybe you know you're pushing it in this this parameter thing but that one is not true so it is it is robust to that yeah. so we tried a few uh, uh, you know mathematical cases where uh, this uh, if this was the mechanism then it should have failed but it didn't fail so I uh, assume that uh, that was not what was given Maybe we could uh, probably. <laughs> so in case I, 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 yeah, I, in case I didn't. Yeah, okay, so nice talk, Krishna. Yeah. And since nowadays people talk about usefulness of science, and like this, like this, uh, we also heard this communicating science. Uh, so, do you call the simplest uh, useful example of chaotic system is the just simple random number generator? which everybody uses irrespective of whether you are doing quantum stuff or computational stuff and it just uses a very simple map basically xn plus 1 equal to axn plus b modulo m right? I know what you are saying <laughs> uh, and of course many people have tried to say it but uh, it is that's the whole, whole thing it is uh, so at, I mean superficially it looked like a random number generation mm -hmm. uh, so there are one or two maps which mm -hmm. like the shift map which is actually like a Bernoulli shift so it's a honest to goodness thing 
but not all things because you they, they have a distribution and so you know because people were trying to use it for uh, chaos communication cryptography and then you know uh, all these people were saying oh but you know we see a pattern in it which is actually it's difficult to see but you can through uh, so it is not like a, a as uh, as featureless mm -hmm. as it would seem offhand. So there are some examples, as I said, shift map is one of them, uh, 2x modulo 1 map is one of them. Mm -hmm. These are uh, good examples and there are electronic versions of these. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, uh, not every uh, chaotic system will fit the bill. The exact, st I mean, the standards which you want of, you know, uh, how your correlation should actually vanish and all that. It is very tempting to a community because I know with so many people uh, mm -hmm. Try to do this. So, uh, so there will be only few chaotic system which, which are will good be as, as good as a uh, as a uh, modulo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, it is somewhat. I mean, it passes the bill mm -hmm. somewhat. But you know, if you really want to sell it, you would have to do you know all the tests. It it wouldn't pass uh, mm -hmm. quite as well. Uh, except as I said, I called a few few maps. I know for sure they are uh, provably. Uh, it, uh, a burn on shift, so uh, that is like a yeah, like the uh, uniform random number. Ha, ha, for so example, that was like a so, but not all. Okay. Yeah, you have to be a bit careful. Okay. Yeah, but people are trying. Yeah. So, well, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so really curious about this uh, first example that you showed, chaotic nodes going to a fixed point yeah. upon um, a random connection. So, uh, I have many questions, so let me ask one or two. Uh, how, da how large does the network need to be? Can I just have two or three nodes connected by a you know, right. couple, couple of yeah. bonds? Yeah. That, that I can answer quick. Yeah, so it should be, um, so I will use the first vague thing, sufficiently large, anything more than 10 fits it. Uh, but uh, if it is too small, uh, that is so two or three won't cut it. And the reason is, uh, if you do the li linear stability analysis, it will stabilize certain perturbative modes might get stabilized uh, uh, because of, of, so it becomes a little system specific. But anything uh, which is, you know, uh, so 10 upwards, so I, all my results were from 10 to 10,000. It makes no difference, yeah. But extremely small, two, three, I would uh, be very skeptical because I think uh, they might have uh, special modes which might just get stabilized. Uh, which, uh, yeah. so the next thing is, how do we, under is there a physical understanding of why this is happening? So for example, can I think of the bonds as trying to synchronize the two nodes? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So uh, as I said, of course, I can uh, do the linear stability analysis in the probabilistic picture exactly. Uh, but if you want to have it in words, uh, uh, I think all of you are almost saying, saying uh, probably you've got the idea. It is sort of true that it is, uh, you know, it's the system is trying to adjust to too many people. So sometimes when you want to adjust to too many people, best thing is to do nothing. Everyone is doing nothing and sitting in the same spot. I mean, that's the best adjustment. So maybe it's a bit like that, that the only possible solution which satisfies everybody is this one. Why that is stable is a different question. Yeah, and finally, so you had this, just one, so you had this uh, small world connectivity. If I change it to some, let's say, random regular network with a given number of uh, coordination uh, neighbors, then does that also work? That, that, that would be okay. That would be okay. Ha, that, that is not an issue. So, Sumati, that's the last question. That's the last word. I can hear you. Up, up. There is one button. Yeah, uh, just a quick question, which is yeah. that there is at some point an onset of this uh, hmm. where you get to the stable point. Right, right. Very but sudden. Uh, it's sudden. But the question is, what is the scale? Uh, because you've got a certain amount of randomness. Right. Is that scale in any way uh, uh, universal? Uh, how does it depend on system size? Right. Because there, right. it doesn't. I mean, is there some? Yeah. So essentially, what is the right. scale right. at which right. this right. happens? Yeah. So, uh, 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 yeah. So the first thing is it does not depend on system size because these are uh, what uh, uh, these are like um, uh, uh, like a bifurcation point. So uh, you know, like it, it doesn't matter actually what what the system size is. It will take place at that point. Uh, sharp. There's no 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 uh, uh, problem with that. But it does the exact uh, number. Say you know say 
uh, here it was at two third. That would depend on the local properties, and um, so it will depend on the literally the the instability of the local map at the fixed point. So that is what it seems to. So depending on that, some might come a little earlier, some might come a little later, and of course in uh, 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 I have not. Uh, done that because that is going to be system specific. The approach to it might be different. It might be through intermittency, it might be through other means. That I don't know. I expect that to be system specific. So you're saying that, yeah. the, that uh, the actual point can be determined by the functions, the, your map of the itself? the function of the local map. Yeah, you huh. can determine it by You can determine, determine it by okay. pretty much by hand. Uh, All right. As in, by calculation. <laughs> I think we have to wind okay. up now. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Shubhavuti Goswami from uh, a senior professor at the Physical Research Laboratories. Uh, also much decorated like her predecessors. I seem to be saying the same thing over and over again. Her areas of specialization include high energy physics, astroparticle physics and neutrino physics. The title of her talk is The Invisible New World. Thank you very much, uh, Ranjini. And uh, I would like to thank Ranjini and Urbashi for organizing this and, and RRI for organizing this and inviting me. I would also like to thank Director Office and Bani for very smooth arrangements. So I, I was told to keep the talk at a level of you know beginning PhD students so I don't see them so much <laughs> but maybe they are in the YouTube yeah, like and the yeah maybe they are in the YouTube <laughs> and so for all of you it may be a little bit simple so I will just have a brief plan first I will give a history and overview of neutrinos and then I will talk on neutrino oscillation and then I will discuss the current scenario and some research directions these are all you know uh, different so I can stop at any time when my time finishes. So you know the neutrino started with we all know with uh, Pauli when Pauli proposed it in 1930 and what he said was that dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen I have hit upon a desperate remedy to save the law of conservation of energy. So what was the problem with the conservation of energy that he had to propose this spin half uh, particle. Uh, so before I come to that, I thought that you know, who are the radioactive ladies? Maybe because it's Women's Day, we can take a look at that. And uh, when I give this talk to the students, if I ask them, the only answer that I get is Marie Curie. But uh, what I read was that in Institute for Radium Research in Vienna, 32 women and 65 men scientists worked during 1920 to 1934. And in Radium Institute Paris, about 47 women worked with Madame Curie, including Irene Curie. So, you know, there were a lot of women and I just picked up few uh, to just uh, in the honor of the International Women's Day. And uh, now I come back to the topic that what was the problem for which he had to propose the neutrino. Uh, it is uh, that, you know, in the beta decay, nuclear beta decay, that time it was known to be a two body process. So an electron is emitted and it is a two body process. So the energy conservation will give us precisely the energy of the electron. However, in the experiment a continuous energy spectrum was found and Pauli proposed the existence of a neutral particle which we now know is an anti neutrino and this then becomes a three body process and the energy is shared between the electron and the anti neutrino and neutrinos help in restoring the energy conservation. And uh, uh, Paul, uh, Pauli had named it a neutron, but then the name neutrino was co coined by Enrico Fermi and who gave a theory of beta decay. Neutrino means little neutral one in Italian. Now the neutrinos were proposed to be massless or very small mass. They are neutral particles, they are weakly interacting. So th that makes it very difficult to detect them. So these are often called the ghost particles or the uh, invisible particles. And uh, after uh, it was first detected in 1956 by these gentlemen, Rhines and Kawan, 
25 years after neutrinos were proposed and they used anti neutrinos produced in nuclear reactors. So, they used this kind of a relation anti neutrino capture on proton and it emitted 3 gammas in coincidence and that was the signal here Rhines and Kavan with their instrument and Nobel prize was given to F. Rhines in 1995 for this discovery. Of course, it is not given posthumously. So, Clyde Kavan did not get it. So, uh, after the electron neutrino was discovered, it was suggested by Bruno uh, Pontecorvo like uh, in 60 around the same time that uh, neutrinos produced in uh, sorry in uh, muon, uh, muon decay may be different from neutrinos produced in beta decay. And by the time cosmic rays were discovered, so we uh, it the existence of muons were already known. And in 1962, this experiment was carried out using a beam of 15 GeV protons in the AGS accelerator in Brookhaven. So, what they did was that you know they produced anti neutrinos from pion, they are hitting the target and they calculated how many muons they are getting and how many electrons they are getting. And they found that they have only 29 muons but no electrons, which means that they, this is a different type of neutrino than the electron neutrino which always produces a electron or an anti neutrino anti electron neutrino will pro produce a positron. So, this established that there is another type of neutrino and this was the first high energy neutrino experiment and the 1988 Nobel prize was given to Lederman uh, Schwartz and uh, sorry I did not name the write the name for the uh, discovery of the muon type of neutrino. And uh, what the Nobel citation wrote was that for the neutrino beam method and the demonstration of the doublet structure of the leptons through the discovery of the muon neutrino. And it was a crucial step to the current world view of particle physics which we call standard model. So, we had a Pauli's neutrino was an electron type neutrino which produces an electron and they discovered a uh, Melvin Schwartz and Steinberger discovered the muon neutrino which produces a muon when it interacts. And uh, so, now we know that there are three types of neutrinos. The tau neutrino was discovered later which produces a tau lepton. And in the standard model, we have these three types of neutrinos in association with the three charged leptons. And these are massless in the standard model and they have only uh, weak interaction. So, that takes place to, through some kind of you know the weak interaction mediators are W and Z uh, bosons. So, there are uh, many sources of neutrinos including uh, laboratory as well as many natural sources. Neutrinos are produced during big bang like the cosmic microwave background. We also have a cosmic neutrino background which are called the relic neutrinos, but they are of very low energy and have not been detected yet directly. There are neutrinos coming from the sun, the supernova explosion in the they are produced in the atmosphere. Then there are also high energy astrophysical sources uh, which can produce neutrinos that uh, you know this kind of neutrinos of and at least one or two events have been detected now by the ice cube experiment. And there are also re nuclear reactors. I talked about the Rhines and Kavan experiment and the accelerator through experiment through which muon neutrino was discovered and these experiments have further developed now and they span a very wide range of energy from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 16 like 15 16 electron volt. So, they, they uh, help us to probe the universe at different uh, energy scales. <coughs> Now, as I mentioned that they are very weakly interacting and to stop a neutrino one needs lead shielding 100 light years thick. So, the time that uh, light takes to the distance that light travels in 100 years and in comparison for x-rays it is 0.24 millimeters. So, you can see how uh, weakly interacting it is and uh, if I have a detector uh, of very large one needs very large detector this is a comparison to a human size and you can see 
and then only you can get enough number of events. One has to go deep underground. Most of the neutrino detectors are deep underground because one needs to know the background. So, you know, a neutrino is producing, say, a muon. That muon should not come from any other source. So, one needs that kind of measurements. One needs observations over a large period of time to collect enough statistics. So, uh, one of the largest underground detector is Super Kamiokande detector in Japan, which uses 50 kiloton of water. And it is um, like it has the active detector element is the photomultiplier tube and the neutrinos and, uh, and water. So, neutrinos passing through water, they interact with the water to produce electrons and which will generate Cherenkov light to produce signals in photomultiplier tubes. And with such a big detector, they observe about 30 neutrinos per day. So, the question then arises is if they are so difficult to detect and one needs such big uh, detectors, why should we try to catch them? First of all, they are everywhere and uh, second is they carry information from stars. So, they are coming from free first place unless we are producing reactor and accelerator to study special properties. They carry information from stars in the sense that because they are uh, weakly interacting, they do not interact. Supposing neutrinos are coming from the sun, they will come directly, whereas a photon will scatter and rescatter, so it will take much more time. So, neutrino can carry information from star and they pose interesting puzzles and you know we like puzzles. So, that is one of the things. So, neutrinos from the stars like neutrinos come from the sun. So, the solar fusion reaction which produces heat at light also produces the neutrinos through the proton-proton cycle. And in fact, Hans Bethe proposed to study solar neutrinos to test the hypothesis of energy generation in sun. And this experiment actually started the whole industry of neutrino oscillation. I will come to it. Neutrinos were also detected uh, from the supernova 1987A, which occurred in 1987A in, Feb in 1987 February. And actually, only 1% of, uh, of the supernova energy is released in photon. Remaining 99% comes out as neutrinos. And there are theories which say that these neutrinos <coughs> help the supernova to explode. And they arrive 10 hours before light, so they sort of probe, uh, give an early warning. Now, this detection was a serendipitous discovery. It was not planned for it because, you know, it, you really do not know that it would, have, it would happen. And this uh, super Kamiokande I mentioned, its predecessor Kamiokande, which was about a 5 kiloton detector and some other experiments at IMB and Buxton, they recorded some events for this supernova 87A. You can see these are very handful of events, but at least they confirm the hypothesis of supernova cooling by neutrinos. And these were such uh, important discoveries that in nine, uh, that uh, Ray Davis, who star pioneered the uh, first solar neutrino detection experiment, uh, which I will come to, and Koshiba from the uh, Kamiokande experiment got the Nobel Prize in 2022 for uh, starting a new field of research, which is neutrino astronomy. And this is a picture of, you know, how sun looks through different messenger and we can uh, study the sun from in various wavelengths and this is the neutrino and you can see that it carries the information from the solar core, you know. So, different radiation can give you the information at from different parts of the sun at different, but here neutrinos can carry the uh, information from uh, the solar um, core and actually the ice cube experiment in uh, South Pole has detected uh, the very high energy neutrinos, which I mentioned in the neutrino source site. In 2013, the first detection was there, uh, there. And then in 2017, they could correlate their neutrino events with a flaring blazer. So, that sort of started has started the field of multi messenger astronomy, which is studying astrophysical sources through different radiations like you know we know we can study through electromagnetic radiation or light and uh, through neutrinos through gravitational waves so neutrinos are an important contributor in the field of multi messenger astronomy so now i will come to neutrino puzzles and uh, the uh, one of the puzzling features was that supposing a neutrino passes through a distance it changes its flavor so, if I have a muon neutrino uh, uh, producing and it is going to the detector 
and then it can get converted to a tau neutrino. And uh, uh, we will uh, go into little more uh, deeper in this and we will see that this is possible if neutrinos have mass and mixing and this conversion probability can be oscillatory. This is the in very you know uh, not uh, very uh, this is an overview of what is the neutrino oscillation is which has been observed in terrestrial detectors. So, the basic picture is very simple quantum mechanics that uh, when neutrinos have mass then supposing I consider two neutrino flavors then they are not this flavor neutrinos nu mu and nu tau which are produced through weak interaction uh, are not the uh, states of finite mass, but they are mixtures of these. So, supposing I have a light state and a heavy state and they are uh, uh, states of definite mass. So, now what we have to see is that how this superposition of mass states evolve in vacuum. So, what happens is as the neutrino travels then the heavier part will fall behind and the lighter part will go ahead and as a result supposing we start with a nu mu which is a certain proportion of nu h and nu l heavy and light at a, at a later time it will be a different combination and uh, then that will uh, change the flavor at birth when we are detecting it. And this was actually first predicted by Pontecorvo and who also predicted the existence of uh, muon neutrino and he first predicted the existence of neutrino oscillation. So, it is very simple quantum mechanics to see what will be the probability in a two flavor system. So, these are the mass states are your you know stationary states which will propagate like e to the minus i e t nu 0 simple Schrodinger equation we can use and then uh, this energy can be written in terms of uh, uh, because this relativistic p square plus m square by 2 p and because this m 1 is not equal to m 2 a phase difference develops and then we start with a new t we evolve new 1 and new 2 with different energies then what happens is that after a later time if we find the probability of a new e to remain as a new e we will see that it is not 1 but that probability is reduced by this term this theta is the mixing angle between the flavor states and the mass states this delta m square is the mass square difference m 2 square minus m 1 square L is the length traveled and E is the energy and if this is all we are doing in vacuum and oscillation probability will be 1 minus this because probability is conserved. So, actually I said we have 3 neutrinos, so one has to really generalize this picture and uh, so what to note is that this probability is not sensitive to the sign of delta m square because we have this sign square. Uh, so, here it is the whether delta m square is greater than 0 or less than 0 it would not matter and not sensitive to the octant of theta because this theta is sin square 2 theta. Whether theta is less than 45 or greater than 45 does not matter. It is not sensitive to the absolute masses also because it is always measuring mass square difference. So, these are the parameters for neutrinos. So, now I will discuss how neutrino oscillation was discovered. Now, first hint came from the solar neutrino. So, I talked about the proton-proton uh, chain which produces the uh, neutrinos, but this is actually a chain reaction and uh, from we have neutrinos coming from different reactions and we can have uh, the energy spectra. So, there are pp neutrinos which have low energy, 8 boron neutrinos which have high energy like that. This shape is determined from nuclear physics but the normalization depends on the standard solar model calculation and this was developed by uh, the scientist called John Bacall. And uh, so, the first change came from in uh, 1968. So, this experiment started maybe 2, 3 years before that and this was in Homestake mine in USA in South Dakota. So, what they did was they took a clearing fluid and they made neutrino interact with chlorine and then it will produce a argon and an electron. And what they did is they kept the uh, source exposed to target exposed to the sun and then they extracted this argon chemically and studied the radioactive decay of argon and then they counted the number of electrons produced from which they counted the number of electrons. That is why it was called a um, radiochemical experiment, it was not a real time experiment and it is they are uh, actually observing less than one event per day. 
and what happened is that you know you can expose it for a finite jumper of this depending on the uh, lifetime of 37 argon for that particular process. So, what they found was only one third of the predicted neutrinos were found and this prediction was from the standard solar model that I mentioned. So, uh, so the, uh, the thing is that what, I, what are the uh, possibilities, why this is happening? The first uh, thing was that the experiment is wrong because it is difficult to detect handful of argon atoms. And then uh, people also said solar model calculations are wrong and then it was also said that the solar electron neutrinos getting converted to muon or tau neutrino. So, like there is some kind of a conversion or oscillations. And you know I did my PhD on this around, uh, I submitted in 96, so around 92 to 96 and even at that time all these uh, explanations were valid. And there were many new experiments pro uh, done to check this. And this is a summary of all the experiments. So, apart from this is the chlorine experiment, this is the Kamiokande experiment and the super Kamiokande and this is a gallium based experiment which are sensitive to low energy neutrinos. This yellow is the prediction of the standard solar model and blue is the prediction of the uh, you know observation. And what is seen is that all in all the experiments the observation is less than the prediction. So, that was the solar neutrino problem which remained unsolved for almost 30 years and finally, it was solved by the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada which uses heavy water instead of the ordinary water that the super Kamiokande and super Kamiokande experiment was using. So, what is the speciality of heavy water? The interaction was taking place in Deuteron and there were two types of reactions possible. One was a charge current reaction where the electron neutrino was giving, you know, there was a, this uh, interacting with deuteron and the final state there is an electron. So, neutrino is not there in the final state. Another is the neutral current interaction where a neutrino remains a neutrino. Now, this reaction takes place only for the electron neutrino whereas, this reaction takes place for muon and tau neutrinos. Now, if you know, then what will happen is if we take a ratio of the charge current to neutral current ratio, if there are only electron neutrinos, then this ratio will be 1 because here we will have only nu E. But if there are muon and tau neutrinos in the solar uh, neutrino flux, then this Cc by Nc ratio will be less than 1 and that is what they found. So, that concluded that the solar electron neutrinos are getting converted to muon and tau neutrinos. So, this was the solution which was proposed that you start with one flavor of neutrino, they propagate in mixed states and when you come to the detector then they are a mixture of all three types. That is why detectors which are sensitive only to the electron neutrinos observed less neutrinos and actually the matter effect is in important here. So, that we can uh, see. Another hint, another hint came from the atmospheric neutrinos initially and which is the neutrinos produced by the cosmic rays and actually the first observation of that one of the first was in the Kolar gold mine in India of the atmospheric neutrinos which are produced from the when cosmic ray hits the air molecule to produce uh, pions and then these uh, muons decay to produce all types of neutrinos and anti neutrinos. And the super Kamiokande detector actually found that there is a deficit of the neutrinos which are passing through a larger distance. So, these neutrinos are passing cosmic ray neutrinos come from all directions. So, there are some neutrinos which are passing through only 20 kilometers and there are some neutrinos which are passing through the solar uh, through the earth's matter and those neutrinos were uh, shown to be less in number and this red is the oscillation, this red is the data and green is the fit with nu mu nu tau oscillation and you can see that the oscillation fits the data so well. So, super Kamiokande conclusively proved that there is oscillation of muon type of neutrinos and for this the Nobel prize was given to Kajita and McDonald in 2015 for the discovery of neutrino oscillations which shows neutrinos have mass and because this says physics beyond the standard model because in the standard model we do not have mass. And there are many other experiments which have proved the uh, shown oscillation using controlled sources accelerator and reactor and sharpened the parameters. So, now we know that there is a three neutrino oscillation taking place and the electron muon and tau neutrinos are combination of three mass eigenstates 
and this is the way we write it as a matrix. This is called the mixing matrix or the PMNS matrix and the main goal is to determine the parameters of the PMNS matrix. So, we have measured lot of parameters, we have measured the mixing angles, we have measured the mass square differences, but and they have been first the oscillation is discovered, then you know they are uh, measured uh, much more precisely. However, there are some parameters which we still do not know very well. One of them is the neutrino mass ordering, which is that you know these states can be arranged in different ways. So, the what is not known is whether the third state is below this or above this. From the solar matter effect, we have some idea that 2 is greater than 1, but we do not know whether 3 is above this or below this and we have two types of ordering, normal ordering and inverted ordering. And also we do not know whether theta 2 3 is greater than 45 or less than 45. And uh, here I have shown that when I have a 3 cross 3 mixing matrix, it is just a unitary matrix. So, it will have 3 mixing angles and 3 phases and one of them can be measured in oscillation experiments, but this is also not measured very precisely as yet. So, the question is why these parameters are so difficult to uh, determine. Uh, one of the main problem is that there is a presence of what is known as degeneracy. And what is degeneracy? Degeneracy is different set of parameters giving the same probability. So, uh, I hope I am able to convince you that in this the main thing that we calculate is the neutrino oscillation or survival probability. We use it to calculate the observed events using the flux and the cross section. Now, if the probabilities are equal, then you know different parameters can give equally good fit to the data. And uh, this is what we studied that you know there is a we had proposed in 2015, people were studying this degeneracy separately from a long time, but we proposed we realized that there is a combined degeneracy which can studied in a general way and that is making this uh, de de uh, determination of parameters very difficult. So, we proposed that we should study this in this delta C p theta 2 3 plane. So, I will sh uh, just explain that what is the degenerate solution. So, here I have taken one example NOVA which is running in Fermilab and what I have done is here I have uh, given you the values of allowed parameters in delta C p and theta 2 3 plane which is allowed for say neutrino run of NOVA. So, NOVA can is an um, accelerator based experiment, it can run in neutrino and anti neutrino mode and this blue is the actually the true solution. So, we assume a true solution, we do a chi square analysis of a fictitious data and we show that you know there are this magenta, these are the purple, these are the wrong solutions. And then, so these are degenerate. So, this is your true solution, but in the parameter space you can find many other solutions which gives equally good fit to the data. And what we showed was that if we take uh, anti neutrino data like this 6 plus 0, if we split into 3 plus 3, then one of the solutions can be removed. This is the wrong octant solution. So, so this way it helps you know in combining different uh, things to uh, address these solutions and that is one of the major role of uh, research now. There are other uh, problems which I am not uh, mentioning and uh, there are many current and future experiments which are looking into these and Kituke and NOVA are running experiment and these green are using atmospheric neutrinos, blue are using reactor neutrinos and uh, this red are this beam or accelerator neutrinos. So, the main feature in the beam experiment is that we have high in uh, the new beam experiments like T2K and NOVA are the current experiments that we have higher intensity beams and we have bigger detectors. And for atmospheric neutrinos, the main feature is that the atmospheric neutrinos pass through the earth as I showed you during the atmospheric discussion and it can probe the matter effect in the neutrinos. And what is the matter effect in the neutrinos? Because in matter neutrinos interact with the electrons and what happens is that gives rise to a potential. So, this is like you know a photon passing through a medium. So, that way when a neutrino passes through a medium, it can give rise to a potential and that changes 
the mixing angle theta in matter and the mass square difference in matter uh, from the vacuum value. And if you see the mixing angle, then you see that if the density and the energy is such and the parameters are such that this condition is satisfied, then this theta m can be pi by 4 in matter, which is called the Mikhaev smirnov wolfenstein resonance. So, this is what you know matter adds this kind of uh, richer features here and for antineutrinos actually this potential changes sign. So, if in matter delta m square greater than 0 gives resonance in, uh, in, uh, in uh, and then for antineutrinos delta m square less than 0 will give resonance. So, then there will be there can be a possibility of differentiating whether delta m square is greater than 0 or less than 0. So, it is sensitive to the ordering matter effect. So, this is a cartoon which shows that you know in vacuum we have a effective Hamiltonian, we have eigenstates, we have eigenvalues. In matter there will be a potential, we have matter mass eigenstates. So, you have to diagonalize this, it is really easy. You have to just diagonalize this and you get the matter mass eigenstate, matter mass eigenvalues and then you just evolve them. So, I will come to INO on which I have worked a bit and you know this is the India based neutrino observatory uh, which were uh, supposed to come up by now, but uh, as you must be knowing there are a lot of problems it faced, but the physics was good. So, I thought I will discuss. So, the thing here is that it has a magnetized iron detector. So, they could identify neutrinos and antineutrinos and I said that the, for neutrino and antineutrino the matter effect is different. So, you know by identifying that it can uh, study that matter effect and actually study the mass ordering that was the thing of INO and I just thought I will flash this slide that there are so many uh, women who are working in uh, INO, uh, women faculty member and their INO PhD program at 12 female and 13 male students uh, in their PhD. So, this ratio is very good. And uh, so, you know the future goals of neutrino oscillation I have already told what is the immediate goal. People are also studying synergy between different kind of experiment atmospheric and long baseline and then because these detectors are very sensitive one can try study different kind of new physics for instance you know dark matter or new interactions these are emerging goals in uh, neutrino physics. So, because I worked on synergy and I thought I will uh, talk about uh, this little bit. So, the synergy is like you know we do a chi square analysis and whenever we are uh, taking a, uh, finding a parameter we find what is the value of the parameter at the chi square minima. So, supposing I have experiment 1 and I have 2 minimas here. So, then there is a degeneracy I cannot separate. Now, I add another experiment it gives a minima here and another minima there. And why it can give it because different experiments have different baselines and energies and I showed you that the probability is sensitive to the energy and baseline also. So, depending on that different experiments can be sensitive to different behavior of probability. So, then what happens is when I combine these two experiments I can get a uh, definitely I can remove the degeneracy. So, this is what we worked on our group worked quite a bit on the atmospheric neutrino and long baseline neutrino synergy and this is one of the results we um, obtained which was that you know we were trying to see the CP discovery sensitivity. So, which means whether delta CP is different from 0 and 180 and this shows the sensitivity. So, this green is beam experiment T2K and NOVA and then this blue shows what happens if we add INO blue and red. So, let us take the red which is the more detailed analysis. And you can see here this uh, sensitivity is very low for these values and that is because here you know these experiments were not so sensitive to hierarchy whereas INO uh, the mass ordering and INO was uh, uh, very good has very good sensitivity to mass ordering because of matter effect. So, INO was able to resolve the hierarchy delta C p degeneracy and that is why it gave a very high uh, higher chi square. So, that is the uh, thing we obtained. So, that was an interesting result which showed most of the analysis before us was assuming one type of ordering. What we showed is that you know if we add the uh, atmospheric neutrino data then that can help and, and this is not true for INO it is true for any other atmospheric experiment as well. 
So, I think that I, uh, I also said that there are many apart from oscillation, there are lot of other effects which people are studying now, which are other you know uh, beyond standard model effects. So, these are some of the uh, research directions. So, maybe I will skip this because you know these are also some more details. So, I will come to the so what question which um, Shubha had uh, Shubha uh, what that you know uh, why should we do these uh, measurements. So, first of all you know from these measurements we now know that neutrinos have mass, we know that these masses are very small and a natural way to explain the small neutrino masses is via seesaw mechanism. And this relates actually smallness of neutrino masses with some new physics at high scale. So, there is a operator which you can write using the standard model fields which can give rise to neutrino mass. So, the idea is that you know at a high scale there is some particle we add to the theory and then uh, we generate an effective operator which can give us the neutrino mass. Now, this has some implications which is that you know this violates lepton number this is. So, neutrinos are leptons I said they are uh, produced in association with the electron muon. So, for each such kind of particle we can add a lepton number and the common uh, idea is that the lepton number is conserved. But, uh, if this kind of term we write then that will violate the lepton number and that will indicate the Majorana nature of neutrinos. Tanushri talked about Majorana quantum material. So, Majorana means the particle is its own antiparticle. So, there is a charge conjugation symmetry. So, these are the kind of implications which come and one has to see the, those in models. Another thing one ask is why there are two large and one mixing angle. So, we have leptons and quarks as fundamental building blocks of matter and in the quark sector all mixing angles are small. So, there are different kind of models and you know we did one study to see you know if we know the values of say the delta C p and then what the different kind of models predict as value of delta C p and whether then we can if we can measure delta C p very precisely supposing delta C p is here then at least this red and yellow models can be ruled out. So, these are the kind of things one does that you know uh, if you know these parameters then you can see which is the model that we can identify and these are your clues to a bigger puzzle which is what is the physics beyond the standard model because we do not really know it yet. So, apart from this you know neutrinos have apart from oscillation various connections this uh, the C p phase I talked about neutrinos can help in uh, explaining the baryon asymmetry of universe, there are models where not these neutrinos, but some other type of neutrinos can be dark matter. There are implications for collider physics, there are implications for Higgs physics, there are implications from nuclear physics, I talked about multi messenger astronomy, neutrino cosmology. So, there are several interesting connections you know which one explores in this field. And uh, so, I just come to my concluding remarks that we have remarkable progress and measurement of the remaining oscillation parameters in the immediate goal and there are lot of studies to probe BSM physics at neutrino detectors, but origin of neutrino masses and mixing these are still not known. So, before I end I just wanted to show because today is the women's day that we have a gender in physics working group which was established in 2017 under Indian uh, physics association. Some of the um, uh, members of the you know first team are there Tanushri, Projwal and Rohini is in the advisory committee and uh, there is a brief history of efforts of women in physics in India which was which appeared in a article in physics news by Sumati you can take a look. And we held a conference in uh, 2019 in Hyderabad University and we brought out a gender equity charter and uh, you know you can get the link uh, in the GIPWG page this is there and we have 500 plus endorsements and endorsing the charter means that in your immediate um, you know surrounding you will try to um, follow this uh, gender equity procedure. So, Please, if you have not, please do to take a look and it will be nice if you can endorse and uh, you can find it here and Projwal also uh, is here already. So, she can also take all about this and this is my last slide that we are going to organize the international conference on women in physics in online mode from 10 to 14th July. 
this is the um, uh, poster and here is the web page and please take a look and we hope that it will boost our efforts towards a more diverse and inclusive uh, physics profession and STEM. Thank you. Thanks to Babuti for that very nice talk and the wonderful ice cream analogies. <laughs> I now know what neutrinos are. So, uh, questions? Uh, the two things. One is a uh, comment, which is that when you said uh, the cosmic neutrino background, uh, of course, there's no direct measurement. Uh, but uh, it is also true that if you don't have them, yes. we won't match the you know uh, Planck the results uh, at all. all. So yeah. it's a indirectly we know indirectly that uh, yeah. neutrinos of that uh, kind have to exist. Yes, that has to and exist. Yeah. Other comment is Ice Cube. I get get to hear about Ice Cube a lot for uh, the multi messenger part of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but not so much regarding the fundamental uh, physics questions. I mean, in terms of, doesn't it talk much about the mass See, mixing uh, and uh, things? Ice cube has also, can also measure atmospheric neutrinos. Hmm. So they have uh, also, uh, because you know, even uh, for high energy neutrinos, there can be um, uh, like conversion, like if you have some kind of, what kind of neutrinos are coming and they measure what they call is the flavor ratio. So, th those kind of physics also they do, also they can uh, go little deep in the core. So, I thought if anyone is interested, I will have a thing. So, you know they dig this photomultiplier tubes in the ice and then they can go a little deep in the core and then they can have little lower energy. So, that is also their aim to probe, but the flavor ratios are consistent with the oscillation parameters that are measured. So. Uh, so, they have talk about, talked about that. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I wanted to make, first I wanted to refer to the neutrino background. In fact, before LEP measured the three generations of the neutrino, True. somebody like Joe Silk used to give talks and say, you particle physicists don't know how many generations of neutrinos are there. But I tell you from helium to uh, hydrogen ratio, that uh, the lithium to helium ratio, whatever it was, I tell you there are at, at, at most four generation of neutrinos. Yeah. So it was that important. Uh, yeah, it's, from it's very important helium. because you know there are also these so-called sterile neutrinos on which I work quite a bit. Correct. And they have serious trouble because of this exactly, cosmological Exactly, exactly. So I just wanted to say that since yeah. you talked of past, I mean I am even more no, from the past that you know this, uh, So that is something how things have developed. I mean, these cosmic connections it's are amazing yeah. story of today, but they have been in the making for almost since the time of Bethe. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. the giants like Bethe and Weinberg really are the ones who told us about it, given Weinberg. Even operators. from nucleosynthesis also. Yeah, that's why I said Bethe. I mean, I, I begin with Bethe what and Gamma. What I was meaning is that because they are so low energy that directly we cannot do That is right, but there is such there a lot of impact on fundamental fundamentals yeah. of cosmology. Mm -hmm. So I think I support uh, that it's no, a, no, I, I it's a no very, very important. It's uh, good that you mentioned yeah. it. And the second point I wanted to actually make was, which I find very amusing again, is that 1987A supernova, the experiments which actually detected it were looking for proton decay. Actually, So yes. this actually tells you that, you know, you can plan for X and yeah. serendipity changes life completely. So, Kamioka means Kamioka nucleon decay experiment. So, they were actually trying, starting proton decay and then they, and these atmospheric neutrinos were actually backgrounds for proton decay. And they, dif then they discovered the anomaly in atmospheric neutrinos. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about Ice Cube. How good is their directionality now uh, in order to connect any neutrino detection with I think it's quite good. I don't work on it, so I don't have precise answers. But at least you know they had uh, uh, they had correlated the events with the blazer, and this year also there is some correlation. So yeah, that's mostly timing uh, yeah. because the timing is consistent. But in terms of angular scale, yeah, I was wondering I how. Often I cannot say because okay. I really don't work on it. But see, they yeah. are measuring the Cherenkov cone, so. 
Yeah. There will be directionality, but exactly what the resolution is, that I don't remember. Yeah. So I have one question and one comment. Uh, the question is, uh, so in this mass generation mechanism, so you were talking about certain adding in certain operators and so on. Uh, of course, one, <coughs> even though uh, supersymmetry is not, uh, hasn't been detected yet, is there, are these, is mass generation, and this is, I guess, the question for anyone who's worked on supersymmetry, supersymmetric models, do these mass generation of neutrinos come out of supersymmetry? No. Even that is not... No. Uh, you have to add the... Uh, you still have to do more work? No, yeah. Okay. Right, Rohini, that is correct, right? More than that, yeah, you can still generate the higher Radiative, you can generate, maybe. That is the easiest way of generating masses. So that is not the there in the supersymmetry model? Yeah, that is not there in the supersymmetric models? It is, it is and it is not, because in the standard supersymmetric models, Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, so then another means. comment that I want to make, which is related to your last uh, slide, which I also want to make an announcement that please look at the IAGRG website where uh, we've also started a uh, working group on, on gender uh, oh. today. Today oh, we've inaugurated good. it. Um, and we also have your Hyderabad charter on it. And a very nice, uh, very nice little uh, poster, a uh, little, uh, what is it called, logo, which uh, Rajesh Kumble Naik uh, created, which is, takes G mu nu equals T mu nu, and that equal to sign has a beautiful symbol of the male and the female circled around it. So please take a look at the website. Um, yes. Can sure. I make one suggestion? Now that all the different people are setting up the yeah. gender groups, it would be nice if we can, mathematics also has a very good gender group. So does astrophysics, astronomy. It would be really nice now if we can link all these together. So in, uh, in the gender in physics group, we have representative from, you know, high energy physics group. We have a condensed matter group. We have representative from the astro group, gender group. So, you know, we would be happy if, you know, we have a representative from the group in our group. I mean, not so that, that we can coordinate. Kind of saying that we try yeah, to create that's a, a separate resource thing. where everybody, everybody okay, is, yes, every, yes. you know, every, you click one place and you will be able Rainy to grand unified do the finger, group. grand unification. Yes. Yes, Shobhan. Yeah. I yeah. think it is better not to link them to the academies. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sir, I, I just had a silly question. So, you showed these images of the sun, images of the sun in different frequency yeah, yeah. ranges. So, in visible range, it looked perfectly round, uh, but in the neutrino uh, figure, it sort of looked fuzzy and also asymmetric. Is that just, uh, I mean, why is that? I was just wondering. The main thing is that, you know, neutrino fluxes are produced along the um, solar core and so and they are in different numbers so this is kind of a um, uh, imagination that you know if the how many neutrinos are coming from the core and so but it is not a, if you see the profile and the flux then it's not like that symmetric so so many of neutrinos are produced in the core then it kind of falls like that okay. so then as you go it becomes fuzzy okay okay Uh, the last uh, program, I mean the last uh, item on the program is the panel discussion on uh, digital um, innovation and uh, technology for gender parity. So our, uh, we have our five panelists here, so I will just uh, introduce them very briefly and I hope they'll say one or two lines about themselves. Uh, so this is going to be chaired by uh, Rupamonjuri Ghosh, who's our who's a part of our council and, you know, as we've just discuss, discussed, you know, always very easy to get for, <laughs> you know, these uh, very important events. Thank you very much for your constant support. Uh, the other participants are Anushwa Bhomik. She's, the, she's a fellow at AMD Athlon. Uh, uh, Dr. Sita, who's an honorary member of RRI. Uh, Professor Rohini Godbole, we all know her from ISC, Center for High Energy Physics, and our very own Urboshi Sinha from LAMP. So I think I'll just leave the floor to Rupamanjari now. So uh, I know that uh, it's the fag end of the day. Uh, you've been listening to excellent talks, but nonetheless, it gets tiring. So uh, we have a power packed panel to charge you up, and uh, fantastic women. 
and I think even brilliant people on the other side. So I'm terribly excited to be, uh, uh, to be moderating this. It's a formidable task. But essentially what we are planning to do is unpack, as I said in the morning, those of you who were there in the morning, uh, that this is to take up the UN theme and uh, which is uh, for this today's uh, International Women's Day, Digital Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. So uh, that's what we'll do, but I wanted to start by uh, celebrating the leadership that you see here and on the other side, because uh, essentially today gives us an opportunity to celebrate these excellent women leaders uh, who are making changes that uh, we have been all waiting for. It's a slow, probably a slow process, but nonetheless it's happening. So uh, uh, you heard the introduction and I'll ask you maybe to add one or two lines about what you do. But uh, what I, I, I'll throw maybe four or five questions, uh, starting with one panelist and then uh, I'll ask another one to pitch in. And towards the end, maybe we'll have some common comments. It all depends on how the time goes, and I hope somebody is keeping track. When I'm terribly excited, uh, <laughs> I forget to look at the watch. So uh, really, thanks for having me uh, to do this. Uh, I'm here more to learn uh, from this extremely distinguished panel. So we have, of course, Professor Rohini Godbole, who is a physicist, well, flavor of physics everywhere. Uh, she has also done tremendous work on uh, gender parity and uh, you know I'll actually start off with her but it depends I mean Sita on the other hand you know of ISRO fame most probably you have seen her interview somewhere this is how I recall the name though uh, part of Raman Research Institute right now Anushwa uh, by the way does silicon design engineering so uh, she leads the group and from the industry perspective we'll have some and uh, I don't need to talk about Urvoshi, all of you know, but quantum technology being one of those things that uh, where uh, in the technology world there is a lot of expectation and maybe a lot of hype as well. We need to hear from her when she leads such a group. Uh, what is the gender, you know, if you look at it through the gender lens, what does it look like? So I would not be talking much in this session but uh, I'll be leading, uh, I'll throw leading questions to our very esteemed panelists uh, for their uh, viewpoint. So uh, let me uh, start with Rohini. Okay. And uh, it's something that's close to your heart. Uh, and I mentioned even in the morning that there is still uneven gender representation in STEM. STEM or now STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or add the A for art and design, multidisciplinary uh, curriculum, there is still used to be a really bad gender representation. Things are improving, uh, but a major problem is what we call the leaky pipe, you know, between education and employment. You can take it from PhD to postdoc or any uh, degree that gives you an employment and then finally the employment ratio. So the gender ratio is actually strikingly different. So I'd like, uh, your comments, and I want elaborate comments, because you really have worked on this and you have the data at your fingertips, really, on the situation and more importantly on possible remedy, please. Rohini. Thanks. Just, you said that you don't keep track of time, but I would like you to keep track of time and stop me. Oh. <laughs> because I do get carried away. No, no, please. Okay. So, I mean, as you said clearly, I mean, I have some numbers here which one had been collecting for a long time. So as I, and I am keeping this only to look at the numbers. So if you look at it, the absolute numbers of women in education started increasing from 1974 onwards. Before that, it was actually quite pitiable. In general, anything, no, forget about STEAM. And then if you look almost exponentially, the number of women in education and that once you said education, it started increasing in art, science, in, uh, continuously. In engineering, it was hovering around 10% when I was in college, which is 1970. But by now, even engineering education, women have come up to par. So indeed, in just and if you go to the All India uh, Survey of Higher Education webpage today, you will actually be surprised 
that the number of women enrolled in science courses all across India actually is now equal to the number of boys enrolled, for example, the latest number. So if you were to believe the AISHE page, we have achieved gender parity in education. You know, but this is always the funny part. The devil is always in the detail. You say that, okay, on the average, 50 percent, in fact, there was a Deccan Herald uh, uh, news item, maybe because of Women's Day, few week, maybe a week ago or 10 days ago, oh, that in Karnataka this year, more girls took admission in engineering than boys, science and engineering. So we are really well off to a good start. And then when you go and start looking, and this exists in the survey, you look at this and you look, ask the question of student participation from colleges to state universities to central universities to institutes of science, education, research to IITs and then to the holy of the holy, the institutes of eminence. And you will find a continuous drop off. And I've, I have told them exactly in the order. So that's something that you must realize that it's uneven even in education. That is the first thing that as the perceived level of an institution has increased, so has the participation by girls in education in the, those institutions. Don't ask me to explain this because this is not something on which I have researched. So I wholeheartedly agree with you that though there is a perception and which is a good thing, it's not just a perception, number of girls have increased, but it is still extremely uneven. And at the end of it, when we say that where it matters, where there is an impact, the gender is very uneven. So that is something we must remember. And the reason I bring it out is that because the things like AISC web pages are something that the reporters, the common person is going to throw at you and say, why are you complaining so much? So we are complaining because of this. So it's even just in education. So I mean, and as it is, what happens is that we had collected some data long time back and now it was supported by UNESCO data that in India, the fraction of girls in STEM education, even in these high institutions, still is quite good, has been good. And if you look at uh, percentages in BSc, in PhD, it's about 25, 30%. In a, when I say a PhD of a decent uh, level, there are about 20 to 30 percent in physics at least. In biology, it's even higher. But then what happens in PhD, it goes down a bit, but not much. Even in PhD, now, you know, the baby is 35 percent in MSc, 30 percent in PhD. And the first step where it drops off like a rock is PDF. And that, of course, is the traditional reasons parents and the girls themselves, nothing wrong in it, wanting to settle down. And here I am reminded of a very famous question that Rajdeep Sardesai had asked Sanya Mirza in her early days after she got married. So he said on the interview, TV, so when are you going to settle down? And this was the time when she had been number one in doubles and won the uh, you know, championship twice running. Grand Slam championships. And then she said, what do you exactly mean by settling down? <laughs> then he said, oh, I, 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 of course, being Raj, and even, this is Rajiv Sardesai, right? I mean, so what I'm trying to say is that this settling down is, of course, one thing. I mean, there is nothing you can change there. And not that you have to change. But I think the real drop off begins because of the mentoring that we give. I, very often I've seen, in, even in IISC, a big senior person, mentor, and most of the time it's girl, boy, both looking for postdocs. He has got a good postdoc in UK, no? Why don't you just go and look around? Maybe you'll find some soft money position. It's better to stay together. Now, my point is that it's not the mentors who should tell it's better to stay together. If the two people decide that that's their choice, let them do that. 
and many of the people in my generation and i see some people sitting in front of me here who actually made the opposite choices who actually decided that they were going to stay apart and uh, give more importance to science so that is one step first cut off that comes that's the expectations of the society scientific society from women and the importance they give to career of a woman in science and i can tell you this in the 30 40 years it hasn't that hasn't changed the numbers have changed but 40 years ago somebody was said to me oh i didn't realize you're so serious about science and i really don't know what i had to do to prove the seriousness because i was writing my five papers i was giving my three talks i was uh, participating in uh, pan you know all kinds of uh, journal clubs and the only thing i imagine that i they didn't think i was serious because of my gender i'm sorry but i mean i cannot now after 50 50 50 years back looking back i cannot see any other reason so that is the real in my opinion the first big drop off which comes after phd to pdf and then of course once you get into this uh, in a faculty job then this sort of keeps on going down and down and it's only i we still don't have very responsible uh, uh tenure policies i i personally like our own tenure policy right now it's very nice it says that you can ask for a deferment uh, stop the clock but you need not if you think it's not necessary and the choice is because this happened once we started stopping the tenure clock then the administration routinely told one woman now your tenure is going to be considered only after 2 years but she said i didn't ask you to stop my tenure clock so you know this is the kind of thing so that is certainly the, i personally feel very often the importance that the scientific community the society the family gives to the importance of a woman's career in science is something that needs to change and that is really the one of the major reasons why the big drop off happens because family and career balance i mean let's face it even a ceo and even a uh, uh, you know a lawyer or a engineer everybody has to balance career and uh, career and family of course you need supportive spouse you need supportive you know so you need to create your support structures but that's not something specific for women in science what is perhaps specific to women in science and that i think is really our problem generic problem is the time when the scientific clock is ticking and you have to set up yourself and say this is me this is my area your body clock is also ticking exactly at the same time and then you need to make very hard choices and some different people make different choices so again a realization of that and trying to see what we have done in india and i'm going to go to qs so but i want to say what we exist what exists now and what cure we have suggested and has happened is that women we give programs for them to come back as though you know yeah you know as though as a scientist you can stop working you can close the you know not just stop the 10 o'clock you stop the science clock you stop working and then you come back i mean after 2 years things have changed completely so even if such positions exist i don't think they serve much purpose. so they are there but they are a bit mindless and not as useful as such programs could be so then what is the solution so there are actually many things and i have listed them so i will just read them out so first and foremost which i already touched upon that we have to mentor good mentoring of young women because you know we also grow up in the society and we tend to imagine what is expected of us and sometimes nobody tells you take a decision like this but you are expected so that is where you need to mentor these people but even more importantly you also need to mentor the men mentor the mentors and i am very serious about that because i think that is where there is a big problem so this is one i would say mentor the mentors and mentor them of course mentor the women if i can now the reason i'm kind of saying this because always almost you say oh we must teach women this we must teach them leadership skill we must show them ways to come back as though they don't think of it as though they don't know it 
it's the men who also need to be taught. So that's what I mean by saying that you need to mentor the mentors. Then I would say responsible dual hiring policies. Now they are beginning, but there are indeed people here who are sitting in front of me who have bore the brunt of not dual hiring. And you are, you, you are looking at one person who conducted a marriage across two continents for 10 years. So the dual hiring policy is something we need to look at very open mind because I have seen and again I'm sorry here I would say a statement about administration not saying that this administration deals like this but too many times I have seen an administration to use this rule oh we don't want to hire people from the same family to turn down the woman I have never seen this answer being used to turn down a man a job so if you want to turn down a job, say, we don't want you. We don't have a place for your skills. We don't like you. Because that is something you can argue. And I have yet to see a time when a man was denied a job because his wife had already got a job in the institute. Exceptions may exist, but this is really the truth. So this dual hiring policy is a tricky thing. Is a, It's a think that needs to be treated with respect, treated with care, but I think this is something we need to really pay attention to. I mean, I think some institutes have lost out on very good people because they simply did not appreciate this. That's their loss. Then the third one, which is even more important, and I don't know how yet to bring it to practice, is that don't consider the biological age, but consider the scientific age. And that should actually be true for all awards, rewards, everything. That from the day, and it's not just us in, uh, women, but in biology, for example, your real progress starts when you have your own lab. In theoretical physics, that does not happen. But in biology, that happens. So start from the day you got your first faculty job. In 10 years, where do you expect a person to reach? Look at different awards, rewards, promotions with respect to that as the point. And when you are hiring, look at the person. If there are breaks in the career, give account, give, you do account to them. And I have tried discussing this very often, even on hiring committees. And it has not worked out for the simple reason that, okay, I also understand, uh, we are government funded institutions. And then you'll say, we cannot change rules. We cannot uh, artificial, uh, whatever it would be that we cannot introduce a new rule at this stage. So I think this is where, in my opinion, some reconsideration at the higher level is required. So this is uh, another sort of um, specific uh, thing that doesn't exist and which should exist. And actually, I think we need to make aware to various selection bodies, whether they are selecting students, postdocs, faculty, Please just be, do your selections purely based on merit and not any other <coughs> considerations. I'll tell you what I mean by that. People tilt their scales unknowingly. An example I'll give you is a book, <coughs> Miss Major of Man, where Gould actually has given an example, Samuel Gould, I, some of the people will know his name. He has quoted one scientist who actually proved, you know, in the 20s, 60s, 70s, there was a big debate whether the white Caucasian males have a bigger brain size, whether there is a genetic, uh, uh, this thing about, you know, eugenics, essentially, okay? So he actually did detailed research and has a paper where he proved that male Caucasian brains are on the average bigger than the white uh, uh, African Amer uh, American male. Okay, women, women didn't even come into picture. And then what people repeated, because this was something that was hard to believe. And it turned out that he had used skulls. And he was packing sand to measure the size of the skull. And he had just packed more sand in the white Caucasian male brains then. And it's amazing. I mean, you should go and read this uh, uh, Miss Major of Man. It's an amazing information. So this tells you, this is really the unconscious bias. And if that happened to a person who was supposedly doing actual experiments, how much easy it is for that to happen in a selection committee? So making a selection committee aware that this can happen 
and just look at the merit. When you are saying that I look at the merit of a paper, look at the merit of the work, if the person has worked only for four years, I normalize it with that, and then I look compare the two cases. This does not happen most of the time. So this is, and how to formalize this is something one needs to think, but I think that's where one, and the last but not the least, is the tenure policy which allows a faculty to stop the clock. And I think IISC right now has come up with, I believe, IISC is not a very woman-friendly place, I can say it here, but this is one amazing policy that they have got. And I feel that that is one policy, and at least we were able to implement it just using the council's blessings, and whether one can try to repeat, implement, modify, that would be very, very useful. And so this is the cures, and some of these cures we have actually suggested as recommendations in the STIP 2020, because this time the science technology policy actually has a chapter on equity and inclusion, where some of these biological age versus uh, academic, uh, what I call academic age or scientific age, then also looking at milestones, defining the milestones from the point where you get a faculty job. Many of these, and also tenure policies, many of these have been suggested, but I guess they need to be implemented on a fast track basis. The discussions have to happen at the fast track basis. And those, those things in my mind, at least for the elite institutes, they will provide a way forward. Because hiring, special hiring drives and so on is good supernumerary positions in students is good, but all of that can actually pay dividends if your mindset changes, and that change in mindset has to be in the hiring process very clearly. It's so nice, and uh, you know, uh, this is a good way to start uh, the panel discussion, and uh, I think there are many points that uh, Rohini had made, and I hope you're taking note. I'll still open it up, uh, just a brief, maybe Urboshi, uh, in your context, in this academic institution, your experiences. <laughs> Putting her on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, but. She's, she's not at ISC. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I, I'm in the council. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Yes, thanks, Sumati, for the encouragement. So, I mean, you know, first of all, I would like to thank Rubhumanjiridi for thinking of me as a part of this panel discussion. I mean, when we have Rohini and Sita and also Anushadi, I'm, I'm not sure what I can do here. But then having said that, you know, you've covered most of the points. I think, you know, it was, it was really well done. So the one point I would like to add, which probably was not, uh, you know, discussed a lot in detail with what Rohini said, is I actually would throw the ball back at, I see a majority of women here in the audience as well, and lots of them I know personally. So one thing I would say is that, you know, Rohini has pointed out the various policy changes that are happening or that are being written about, which hopefully will happen. Uh, at an institutional level, at a hiring level, at you know the other side of the table. But one thing I would like to encourage you guys to do is also bring about a change in yourselves. You know, uh, so I mean, you know, she kept referring to the people in the front, and I have a fair idea about one or two uh, such people, and these are actually role models. I mean, I'm not saying you have to stay separately from your worse half, uh, you know, I mean, let's put it as worse half. So it's not that you have to do that, but the point is that, you know, when there are important career decisions to be made, it is important that you actually uh, ha have this, uh, you know, uh, ability to uh, forcefully, uh, you know, have a discussion with either the spouse or the family, whatever be the matter may be, to say that, you know, this is something I want to do and kind of have that little bit of, a, I would say, guts to stick to it so that, you know, because all these policies will not be very useful if uh, we ourselves, you know, like to take the back seat. So, you know, if we are always going to have the, uh, you know, second, uh, play the second fiddle in the career choice, then, of course, you know, if this is something which we can't condition ourselves to change, then all these policies will not help for most of us, right? I mean, you know, I'm not an example of that. But then having said that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm also glad that, you know, I fall in that category of, uh, unfortunately, an IISC spouse, but nonetheless uh, a, a supportive one. But then, you know, this may not be the case for everyone. Uh, but then, you know, it's not like you have to leave the person or something, but it's just that don't give up too easily. I have seen that happen with many 
young women I know uh, who actually uh, say, okay, fine, you know, I will just, you know, take a five-year break. A five-year break you can't come back from. I mean, you know, uh, it's, so, the, the <laughs> and then Rupa Manjari, in the morning you mentioned this, uh, the one policy change which Rohini did not uh, touch on uh, this time was this family leave, you know. Yeah. So that is another thing which I think is a really, really nice idea. And uh, something that maybe, you know, uh, also should be thought seriously because, you know, the leave is for taking care of maybe a young person who has come in. Although, naturally, maybe we are still responsible for, you know, bringing that person in uh, to this planet. But then uh, that is, uh, you know, th that doesn't mean that the other guy, you know, other half again is not responsible for bringing this little person up. So this is something, again, I think, you know, at a policy level will be uh, very, uh, this thing. So coming back to uh, Rupa Manjiridhi's rather leading question, uh, you know, I, of course, have to give a um, uh, kind of answer which I'm not used to, right? Like, you know, I'm not politically correct and, you know, that's why panel discussion with me is not a good idea. Uh, but then having said that, I would say that, you know, uh, one thing that is positive about RRI is that we do have uh, actually a very high percentage of women faculty. We have very small number of faculty. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is an issue. So it's easy to be a high percentage is also, you know, I mean, you know, it's not like we have 100 people and we have 30 women, but then at the same time, if we have 23 people, we have nine. Uh, it's it's not bad. I mean, you know, so uh, it's not uh, all uh, to Tarun's credit, but you know, it's 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 been over the <laughs> over the last several decades that somehow this has emerged, and I think we are very happy to have that. But then, uh, if we take it out of the institutional context and and you know come back to the context that you raised in the beginning, which is about the field, I completely agree that the field is too much talked about right now. The one that I represent, and you know not always in the right way. And at the moment, we are. I mean, Tanushridi mentioned the national mission. It was declared three years ago. Uh, so hopefully this year we see a start to it. But there is a lot of uh, you know um, so, uh, sort of. Um, uh, problem uh, with actually having uh, leadership being given to women in uh, the quantum science and technology community in India. Um, it is very good to be in your 50s, to have gray hair. Um, I have colleagues here who fit that rather well. Uh, so unfortunately uh, for them, not all of us are in that uh, you know, domain. And in fact, uh, to be honest, I, you know, this is a friendly audience. I'll say that you know, I actually heard something very, very derogatory from a woman colleague of mine from a different institute who's a good friend of mine, uh, who's told me, you know, uh, of course, the work that you're doing is fantastic. And you know, everybody agrees with that. You know, we are on all these panels, and people are very, very appreciative. I said, that's great. So something good coming. And then she said, you know, one, two or three of them, these very senior people in a committee, they said they don't like something about you. I said, please, please tell me what that is, huh? because you know I can improve it. And I said, you you like to wear lipstick, okay? Uh, um, and so you know, of course, you know, it takes someone like me to actually say this in a panel discussion. But having said that, you know, I find that a very insulting comment, right? Uh, a very derogatory comment. Uh, of course, I have decided to wear it a little bit more, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so you will not find me without it. But it's just, <laughs> thank you so much. So, it is just, you know, that sort of sums up where we are, okay? So the fact that we have been working for decades in a certain topic or, you know, trying to really bring uh, the Indian uh, quantum scenario, let's say, in a global uh, scale and, and trying really hard to put us in some sort of a map, and I think we have succeeded to a large extent. But still, the comment uh, that you get uh, about people not liking you is the most frivolous one that you can probably imagine. So this is, um, uh, you know, our community. And of course, you know, we need to, of course, stick to, that is what I mean. I just gave a very extreme example, which is very personal and has happened three days ago. Uh, so having said that, I would say that, you know, we should not change ourselves to suit what people like, whether men or women, you know. If I, I like to, uh, you know, wear red, I will wear red. She likes blue, she wears blue. It doesn't mean that, you know, we have to, you know, so long as we don't do something which is societally incorrect. We, I'm not going to suggest that, but let us not conform. Okay. And so that is another way in which we can stop the leaky pipeline to a certain extent. If we ourselves are a little more determined to hang on, uh, by hook or by crook, right? Yeah. So I think I'll stop there for this question. Excellent. always say that bearing children is on, it's on, only a woman can do, but rearing a child everybody can do. <laughs>
No, I mean, excellent. I think uh, thanks for, for that point as well. It has been very rich so far, and I have turned only to my left. Uh, so I'll turn to my right, and maybe I'll uh, go to Anushka first. Uh, you know, we talked about some obstacles, some barriers, as I've been discussing even in the morning, uh, that's faced by more men also, but more women and girls to become uh, the, the topic of today, the digital. Uh, one part I made in the morning, you know, one about digital literacy. Second was about digital enabling, so innovators. So I'll turn to you to talk about the innovation part uh, because uh, sticking to the topic, innovation and technology, uh, what do you see in your field, in your uh, company, and likewise other? Uh, what are the barriers you have seen? What are the points that, like Rohini talked about in academia, that's the start point, right? Training in STEM, but then actual uh, in field, do you see the things changing in the, you know, the last 10, 15, 20 years? Where uh, do you think it's heading? What are the steps that you think uh, you may be taking? And I want you to also talk about, uh, you know, there's a trend uh, maybe with young people. It's very easy. I talk about this a lot. What kind of innovation or more what I would call inventions, just to distinguish from tweaking some specs to get into a commercially viable uh, startup, to actual inventions which the world is waiting for? You know, be it healthcare, you saw uh, the disaster we have seen, uh, Elon Musk's, uh, you know, space travel, whatever it is, to other hardcore, uh, basic science-driven, uh, you know, innovations or inventions that the world may be waiting for. And we find more uh, social me media hypes and therefore tweaking of digital platforms, more interest in those kind of innovations than the real hardcore invention. So science driven, basic, hard, difficult, the, that kind of a thing with uh, the young generation because you have done it a little differently, very hardcore. And I'll actually come back to you on the same question for comments. So Anushka first. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank RRI, Urvashi, Ranjini, and others to invite me here. I'm like feeling really humbled and honored at the same time to sit with all these eminent scientists whom I revered for a long time. Yeah, so yeah, just to introduce myself a little bit. So I work in advanced micro devices. Many of you may be using the laptops powered by AMD CPUs today. And that's especially our Ryzen lines of CPUs and Epic lines of processors are like now the world leaders in high performance computing. And I've been working with AMD for past 18 years, and before that I did my PhD, and I was a student at IAC along with Ranjini. Uh, so yeah, so I, I do like hardware design, basically CPU design is high performance CPU design is my area of expertise. Yeah, so just uh, I, before I start, I just like to add one or two comments of what uh, Rohini Ma'am has said and Urvashi has said. One thing to solve this uh, uh, like hiring problem is have more women in the committee. Uh, so like I just to tell like my team in AMD, this is the largest um, CPU design team all over the, globally. In AMD there are four design teams and my team is by far the largest and we ha look for really niche skills. We hire people with PhDs and I'm extremely proud to say like there's a very large number of women in my team and they're like doing the like, great work. They're like leading the CPU design uh, in for AMD. It's like a lot of these high-end CPUs coming, their key blocks are designed my team in India here. And uh, one thing so when we started, I was the first woman in the team and the, all the people were globally there and there's kind of uh, uh, like hurdles I met like okay these are people I don't know all these people like really senior people technology leaders with whom I'm just have remote working and uh, like working with them uh, so then the, what happened there was like a lot of mental blocks to get your voice heard right but then uh, the thing that happened to me uh, like helped me is like traveling there networking with people knowing them personally that kind of clears a lot of blocks so I would really would advice the young women out there doing science and all take every opportunity to like uh, interact with people know them and that will and i mean enable you that will remove a lot of your mental personal mental barriers that's one thing and the second thing that uh, really i mean how i attract a lot of women in my team is again when initially there were like more men than women in the team and even now it's slow but 
I mean, when we try to hire my first women in my team, and I hear this, all these comments from other men who interviewed them, oh, she's not good, she's not confident, and all those kind of things. And then I remembered one experience from my own interview process. One American like senior leader interviewed me, asked me a question. And I answered, that I think it should be done this way. And then this person asked me, you think or you know? Then I said, I know. Then you should say, you know. Like as women, we used to say, I think, I believe, it's just this, this kind of thing to trivialize our work, our knowledge, our abilities. That kind of goes against us a lot. And so that's why when women interviews uh, in my team, if some men comes, so say if there's a man inter I mean, getting interviewed and some other people, I don't generally go and do the first interview, like other people do the first interviews, and they come and say, oh, this people is not good, uh, we don't want to hire him. I said, okay, fine, I'll let go, I don't want to talk to him. But <laughs> if some women comes and then uh, guys come and tell me, okay, he's, she's not good, she's not confident, and all, look, and then I said, okay, let me go and talk to her. And this way, actually, you'll be surprised how I found so many good women, and they are doing fabulous jobs in my team. So I think having women and like understanding this perspective and then like some men managers uh, senior managers come and ask me how come you have so many women in a group i don't find women i said okay let, next time you have a good women candidate call me in the interview board i'll i'll be happy to go and interview them uh, on your behalf so that way like we need that mindset we need to understand that as women as uh, urvashi mentioned we need to be confident about our abilities we need to be i mean know what we are talking about but at the same time as men or other interviewers or whoever is kind of judging you they also need to understand this kind of shortcomings or that what we used to downplay our own abilities uh, so that really helps. Now coming back to the innovation and this thing, right? Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of hard, I mean, I do hard engineering. There are a lot of women in my team are doing this. And I mean, if we just um, do a little bit of uh, Google on like this woman called Dr. Lisa Su, who is a CEO of company. I mean, AMD is one of the biggest turnaround story in the semiconductor world, like from the bank, almost like a bankrupt company to the leading company. I mean, she turned around the company fabulously. Uh, so then there are a lot of like um, innovations happening, whether we don't know that these women are doing it, but in general there are big innovations happening. I mean, and then there's all these technologies like really enabling women to stay at work. This leaky pipeline problem that you mentioned, like when we started a long time back, it was very common when, I mean, women have babies, I mean, they will drop off or like take breaks and all. I mean, it's not acute as like... Uh, like I think the problem of that hard choice is like a little softer in our case. But now I think this, uh, I mean, working from home facilities and the mindset that's changing in the industry, right? Yeah, people can be productive while working from home. That really helps. I mean, I don't see like these, all these young women, you know, like, someone has babies and all. They are not like thinking of dropping off. Like now, like six months, you can take break and you can, there's a lot of, online material available to keep you up to date. Even in our field, it is very fast changing field. And, and another like hard problem in our field is like a lot of this information will not pub available in the public domain. A lot of this is internal, right? Only once you come in the industry, I mean, I will not tell you my trade secret, right? So it's not available in the public domain, the kind of technology we are doing. You have to learn it from inside. So we have our own internal lot of training materials. And we do it for both men and women. But the thing is, you can come and take advantage of these things. To, you have to continuously learn and keep yourself up to date. Yeah, so up to date. And uh, so that really helps. And this mindset in companies and the managers and s to see that, okay, people can be productive from home. Obviously, you'll be missing the networking and all those parts, but still it's better than not doing at all, dropping off, right? And I think now, at, at least in our field, in the software and the hardware industry, in industries which allows, like hybrid mode is a really good mode to work where you don't really need to go to the office every single day, right? You can kind of balance, have a little better balance in your life, I mean, work-life balance in your life. So that's one thing. And the last question uh, to touch upon the, I mean, if you want to see what's the, I mean, next big innovation coming, yeah, I'm not like the person who can talk about this. I mean, there's the like chat GPT people are working, like what AI-based revolutions and all are happening. I'm sure there are like a lot more of those coming in a way, right? I mean, AI and um, like, and, and we are looking forward to this quantum computing, right? And like in our field, I mean, I, I mean, because 
I'm in the work because the physicists done great job in all the semiconductor devices, semiconductor device of physics. But it's reaching its limit, right? I mean, we are now talking about five nanometer, three nanometer process technologies. But at some point, I don't think we can go below that. I mean, we kind of face that problem every day. Like now, earlier, I mean, just people will give me like some some million transistors to play with. Now every piece is like really expensive so we have to be really very innovative in our design to see every last transistor is used like very effective way so we're looking for maybe i don't know maybe uh, the quantum uh, quantum companies that say maybe single bit transistors you guys a uh, single electron transistors or something like that or some new not silicon some new device some new material science innovations that we are waiting for but on the on the software side ai side i mean i can just mention one innovation that's coming happening in bangalore I mean, one of our IAC uh, senior from, so um, she has um, d uh, done this company where they have, through AI, they are just uh, doing this healthcare like uh, breast cancer detection for women. Um, so I don't know, maybe you have heard the name of Geeta Manjunath. Her company is doing that. I thought that is a fabulous job, like innovations happening in India, right in Bangalore. And one of our seniors, I'm very, like really very proud of her. And uh, so yeah, there are like a lot of innovations happening. Women are doing great work. Yeah, and yeah, I'm really hopeful about the future. Very nice. And I think so what we are seeing is a uh, leadership position. Having a woman in there does help. And uh, or a feminist uh, man would also do. I mean, you know, it it does change. Uh, so I think uh, excellent. But I would like to uh, give it to you, Sita, for continuing on that same topic. From your ISRO experience, you know, space is another set set of uh, frontier. By so your experiences and uh, you know, in digital or technology enablement and technology. Development by that I mean uh, not just being literate, but you're contributing to the development of it. Mm -hmm. How do you see the role of women? How do you see uh, the barriers that have you experienced any in your organization? Okay, so uh, I have been in ISRO long enough, uh, nearly 40 years, 39 years. Yeah, I led the group. So initially there were, you asked whether there were different. Initially, as you said, there were perceptions that women would not continue in their career for long, Be especially because the space, uh, in, uh, space uh, organization is very demanding in certain respects. For example, you have to work in shifts. You have to work in night shift if you have a thermovac testing going on. You will have to continue for long hours, etc. even though they would provide us facilities like transport and so on. So um, when I joined, yes, there were not many senior women. There were just a couple of women, and they also, uh, 10 years or 15 years after I joined, they left. So there were not many senior women to look up to. So one had to grow ourselves, and that's where um, her comment that hang on. Uh, there, were, there were one or two instances when I, even I felt, should I change, should I leave, etc. This thought did come up. And I discussed with some people, and they said, no, just you've done gone this far, just hang on. And uh, one more thing is there are also re times when you just have to change your role. That's another stage when you ask yourself, do I change my role and go on, or do I just play a low profile and stick on to what I'm doing? So this is another decision you have to take. Because for a long length of time, I was doing R&D, and I was developing, designing, and developing. So at some stage, I, it came to go on to managerial roles. And that means take on less of the R&D and development take on less of research and go on to actual management, not only of the project, but also of people. And then it went on to actually going to management of overall projects, which was the last five years I did at headquarters, which was again a jump because it was totally paperwork. I mean, no lab, no nothing. And I was thinking, what am I going to do here? And so let me tell you what, what I could do when I went through these roles. 
um, when I came to the first management role as a in charge of my division, I wasn't going to be the head of the division at that time, and I knew it. But then I thought, what could I? What change could I do? And at that time, um, even though we were doing a lot of research, we did not have PhD students. So though we were involved in joint astronomy program for years, Dr. Marar was teaching there. I was starting to teach there. But no students would come to ISRO because it wasn't perceived as a research institution per se. So then I had to sensitize ISRO that we need to take this in these students and we need to set up an uh, interview panel for that. And that's how the junior research fellowships started in ISRO. And now many, many departments in uh, ISRO are taking up JRFs. And uh, though not to the extent of academic institutions, I would in I still insist that they should take many more and they should make this as a two two prong thing. One should be for project fellowship, which is merely for project, and one should be research fellowship where the student can go on for doing research and gain a PhD degree because they have connection with universities and IAC and so on. So that's one thing. Um, when it comes to the combination of digitization and this, um, when I went to headquarters, I, w I thought, what should I do different from what has been done before? Um, one thing was that at that time, till that time, um, in headquarters, the connection with the project itself, even the science projects, was minimal. It was only mainly for funding. Whereas I thought there should be a wider connection. And so I started with um, wanting to make the data obtained from the satellites, science satellites, open. <laughs> And uh, this was a negotiation I did with both uh, with the help of the people who worked in uh, Chandrayaan 1 project first to start with and the PIs of those instruments that it has to be made open after a certain time. It cannot be just kept closed. So that we started with Chandrayaan 1. It went on to Mars Orbiter Mission. And in AstroSat, as was decided, we decided to make it a proposal-based observatory. That means anyone can propose for observation with AstroSat. And so it is run as a proposal-based observatory. Anyone can propose for observation of a particular star or a galaxy. And they can, the, the data is given to that proposer for a certain length of time, which we call the lock-in time. And after that, it's made open to everybody. And this has happened, this has been enabled due to digitization. We could, we could actually check the data immediately after the data was received from the satellite by sending it to the payload operation centers with a VPN, AstroSat VPN we set up, get it back, get it verified, get it back, post it, post it to the PIs, then again, set the date after the lock-in period and make it open. There are hitches. There are hitches even today, seven years after AstroSat, maybe one to two percent data doesn't automatically get open. Why, where, I have to ask. But we have gone through it long way. And I hope this will go a long way in the next ExpoSat where the RRI experiment called Polix for studying the X-ray polarization is also going to be implemented. And of course, the Aditya L1, we're trying to reduce the lock-in period there because solar data becomes open much, much earlier than stellar data. So that's where I feel personally that digitization has helped a lot. Otherwise, the data would have resided with the PIs. You would, everyone would have had to ask the PIs through email or whatever, and then get the data personally. And this has helped a lot. Um, 
Of course, I also find that during the pandemic, socially, I find now that I have superannuated from ISRO, uh, I work with a lot of um, social investors, uh, outreach people, and so on. So I find that the, this, uh, di uh, this digital techniques have enabled a lot of underprivileged students to get access to education, to get access to good talks, lectures from people which they could not have imagined so far. So I see it as a positive sign of the pandemic. And uh, I hope this is extended well. But at the same time, I feel it should not be used as an alternative for in-person interaction wherever possible because in-person interaction are essential for a deeper understanding of the topic or whatever. And she asked me about challenges. Let me tell you just one challenge we always face in space science mission and that is to find the niche area what science experiment we can do because we are working in ISRO along with, for example, great big space agencies like NASA, ESA and so on and they have much better capabilities in terms of launch, in terms of satellites, in terms of, of um, science community in numbers and in quality. But we have a smaller quirk, smaller teams, but good in quality. So we always have to churn the uh, um, ideas to find niche areas which hasn't been done be, um, before, for which we are capable so that we can under, uh, take the best science out of that mission. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just checking the time. We are running out of time, and I have some interesting questions. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, you know, I'll shorten my questions. I have lots written already, but I'll shorten one, and I'll actually come back to you, Sita, first, and then maybe to Rohini. That we heard many, uh, well, uh, we touched upon, not many, of the kind of issues people face. And then we also heard very, uh, from prescriptive to very suggestive, uh, ideas of how to counter uh, these kind of problems that we face every day. And much of it goes beyond uh, infrastructure, regulations, and all of it. It's conditioning uh, the, the mindset of people, the, uh, the abnormal things that we have long learned, men and women both, to take it as normal. So you accept because that's the way you have been conditioned that things are to be. So the more discussions of this kind, more you become aware of what you are like as a human being. Uh, the, the, it can go on forever. But we are also talking about uh, systems to be put in place. So um, in, I, I think I'll turn to maybe two panelists and I'll start with you. Do you think your organization should set some measurable targets to ensure, and let's go back to the topic, digital, so if, uh, do you think that when the, the point I'm making is what I made in the morning as well, already we are aware of a gender gap, disparity in the gender landscape. You are adding digital layer on top. You have to make sure that the gap doesn't widen because of, you know, again, uh, inequal access to inequal enabling to inequal, uh, you know, development of uh, digital techniques. I talked about it in the mornings, you're not there, you know, voice recognition first was a failure for women. Airbags did not work on women drivers because they were never t done, <laughs> they were done for men by men. And uh, there are many such examples. So I think it's changing because the more you talk about it, of course, uh, next time you do see changes. But do you think organization-wise, there should be some measurable targets? The answer could be no. I even mean uh, things like selection committees, you know, we see that wherever we had a, a woman leader, things have changed. You've been able to bring in changes, but those are probably personalized. 
I have done very silly things last time. Maybe I mentioned here, maybe I did not. As selection committee chair, when you find, for example, uh, women candidates coming in, my uh, co-members were asking question, oh, you are from Bombay, uh, are you sure you would shift to Delhi? What, what does your husband do? Uh, is he going to shift with you? And after that interview was over, I tried to say that, you know, stop asking these things, stick to uh, the point, and we don't need to probe this, let them figure it out, whether they want to fight, uh, shift, whatever, how do you know, stop it. So it didn't work, next time it happened again, so third time a boy, a uh, man walks in, I started uh, as the chair, and I said that <laughs> you're married, so what does your <laughs> wife do? Uh, you're from Kolkata, you're shifting to Delhi, and the guy knew me. He thought I had gone a little crazy, so <laughs> he had this weird expression on his face. So I said, uh, have you discussed it with your wife? And she's <laughs> shifting with you. <laughs> and I think I just did it, then I switched back to normalcy, and I uh, did a proper interview. But the message was loud and clear to my panelists. They stopped asking so, such questions from next time onwards. But you sort of do it because you want to make a point. You know, the, the, like two CVs. Yeah, it needs to be done. But you know, these are uh, often things that you just cook up on the spot. You just figure out how to handle a situation which is going beyond your control. And when you are in that position, you can do things. Otherwise, you know, I couldn't do it when I was not the chair of the selection committee, for example. Yeah, okay, very good. So I think I can provoke a lot of these things I have you know, done, and some of you know the story of Fan. How you know, I think Sudeshna once long back told me, you look at two CVs and the guys would say, oh, uh, if it is a woman, you would say that very hardworking. You know, she worked with a, very, a supervisor who was really, really bright very hardworking, did so well. A similar CV, uh, and sincere and hardworking. And a similar CV, according to my judgment, of a boy, they would say, oh, he's a genius. Uh, so I, if I say that, you know, he also worked with a fantastic supervisor, how do you know it's not the supervisor's work? Oh, I mean, I know, I mean, it's like written all over. The guy is a genius, and if it is the woman, it must have been very hardworking. So, <laughs> yes. Hard working. So I think this is how uh, you have faced it, you have seen it being done. So when you have the position, you try to change it, saying that, you know, th this is again a uh, conscious bias. Anyway, uh, we can go on and on, but uh, just to uh, keep, uh, you know, I think end of the day, several messages to go from the thing. So I, I put it to you do you think institutionally, rather than doing this, what we have done? many anecdotes, many such things, and there are lessons from each one of these anecdotes. But do you think institutionally we should have some measurable targets that we put on, like she mentioned, uh, DST has actually taken up something. Uh, they're asking you how many women are in uh, top leadership positions, in selection committee procedures. Do you think that it's possible to even put a framework, some kind of uh, metric, to uh, a rubric maybe for companies, for academic institutions. I'll turn to her for that, but from your organization, do you think we could have done it more systematically rather than individually? Okay, so um, I can speak only for ISRO. Ararai, I think she will speak. Uh, in ISRO, uh, it is mandatory that every committee has at least one woman in the panel. And um, so whether it's selection committee, interview committee, even um, screening committees now have. Second is, uh, after, a, uh, after some time, um, initially the maternity leave used to be three months, and now it has grown to, then it went on to five months and then six months. And it was, to a certain extent, subtly perceived as, a, I mean, they are not available. So we had to tell them it is not only her family responsibility, but it's also a social responsibility. And uh, now the, the maternity leave, for example, is not considered as leave when it comes to promotion within ISRO. Only what goes after the six months is considered as leave per se. So that six months is actually discounted when you, it comes to screening or even um, even for actually s evaluating the performance of the person. So this is something 
I think maybe they are in academic institution. And so, and uh, crush, for example, is essential, I feel, in all uh, research institution. And uh, that is also coming up. And uh, these two things that um, mentoring, mentoring is another thing they have sort of set up. But as you said, mentoring, men you need to mentor mentors, what to say. Uh, but let me get the audience into the picture. How many of you have gone and mentored students? You would have faced the same thing when you were in school, right? What decisions to make and so on. So how many of you have gone and mentored your alma mater or your college students now existing there to say that you are working in this? and what are the challenges you are facing. So this is something, what I find is, she said as chairman of an interview committee she could do. We all have to examine what is in our purview to do and what we can do. So mentoring is one thing, so please raise your hands whoever has mentored in your, in your schools where you studied. Yeah. So that's one thing you can do, right? And then we, socially, we are also taught uh, to personalize the failures, our failures, and dedicate our successes. I think this, again, should be your individual decisions, how much you contributed, and how much others contributed, even if it's a teamwork. Take care to tell your personal achievements separately as the team achievements. This is one more thing I think should come. All right. I think we need more time to even discuss some of the points you made. But I, I'll stop there and I'll pass it on to Rohini to talk about the same thing yeah. and then the point you brought in. Thanks, Rupanjari. Uh, first, I just wanted to read from your, what I had written, but I didn't read. So let me just say that when I said that we should make strictly merit-based selection, irrespective of the consideration of things such as the marital status of the yes. candidate, or whether the candidate will be able to make the move if hired, and so on. So this was here, and I agree completely. But I think more than just, OK, of course, OK, to begin with, STIP 2020 now mandates that every hiring committee, selection committee, should have 30% women. When, when that will happen, I don't know. But the important point is that is not enough. In my opinion, the responsibility of hiring women or looking that the women are judged fairly, it's not only on those 30% women. I mean, they are, of course, going to judge academically. It is the mindset that you have to change. And I found it very well what is done in the West. At least I was member of an interview committee in the Netherlands. And uh, just before we went into the interview, we were given a sheet of paper. OK, and there were do's and don'ts. The do's where you do not ask the person about their st uh, social status. You do not ask them whether they can make the move. Those questions come with the institution head after the selection is made. So there are these rules. And there is this consideration that making people aware that, and, and it's very clearly written there, for example, that if a person has taken a break, if the person seems older but has, has had children in the meanwhile, for example, or somebody has taken a break to take care of the family, if it is man or a woman, etc., this is not mentioned as a gender dependent thing. It's really, yes. and this was mentioned clearly. And I think time has come where the institutions in India have to develop their own such documents. And there, whenever I have tried to suggest this, unfortunately, because we are state funded quite often, our hands are quite tied. And therefore, when, when we create such a, I, I imagine that council is normally enough to make such things. But that is really, it should not depend on Rup Manjiri Ghosh being the chair. It has to be a matter of fact, matter of rule always, that this is the way it should be. I mean, it's not, you know, Maybe one uh, Tanushri will do it when she is a director, but that's not it. That helps. I mean, in a tongue in cheek, I would say that the fact that we have such a nice IWD uh, celebration today here as well as in IISC, 
I have written in a current science editorial, which will come out tomorrow, where I've said that it's not an accident now, because I see that the chair of the council chair is a woman, IASC has a woman direct, uh, the dean. So I think having women in higher positions is, of course, the first and foremost, the necessary condition. But it's not sufficient. And this is what I wanted to say, that one has to set in place, institutions have to set in place absolutely important guidelines. And digitization, how that can help, yes. I want to tell you a story from uh, Australia. I was in Monash University, and in Monash, students are not given access to the course material till they actually fill up an online questionnaire, a form, to judge how aware they are of the bias and how they can work hard to get rid of the bias. So until they successfully get some a score, they are not allowed course material. And that is obviously could not be possible unless it's digitized. But I think an institution has to take the bull by the horn. It cannot just happen, depend on people. It has to be institutionalized. And Indian institutions, and Gati is supposed to, you know, gender advancement transforming initiatives, is supposed to initiate this but I think we are far, far, far away from that. And Athena Swan, in my mind, was a very good example where this has happened. Imperial has developed their own uh, set of directions that are given to the in interview panel. And I think we have to do that. We have to have our Indian versions of this, institutional versions of this, because it will change from institution to institution. It, I, ISRO may have a different set of instructions that that would need than what IIS you would need. And that is the important thing about institutionalizing this. And I think, I don't know, the, it will happen most likely when more women like you are there on the top. Perfect. This is what actually I was uh, asking, that rather than us doing it individually, systematically, what are the things? And I think, thank you for excellent suggestions. Urvashi, a quick comment. Yeah. I just want to say that from the RRI point of view, I would like to request Tarun uh, two things uh, as the director of this institute. Well, first of all, I would like to say that, you know, we are having this nice discussion today. It's nice, I think. Uh, we're having this discussion. Uh, it shouldn't be a one-day uh, discussion uh, that happens on 8th of March uh, every year, you know, with different groups of people discussing almost the same thing. So I don't know what is happening in the rest of the 364 days to actually, uh, you know, act or you know, act on these deliberations. So I think, you know, uh, because uh, most of us are uh, quite lazy, right? We, I mean, not you, I mean, you know, all of us, we are quite lazy. So we will get back to what we do, which is, of course, our science. So we will forget about today by day after tomorrow. Uh, and so then maybe some, you know, something should happen at a more regular basis, which uh, involves, uh, you know, figuring out are we really doing anything as a result of all these discussions and recommendations and suggestions that are coming our way? Or are we again going to have the same discussion uh, next uh, year, right? So that is one thing. The second thing is, you know, I actually see the reality in front of me. And I have been seeing this since today morning, 9.30 a.m. Uh, we uh, are celebrating International Women's Day, and I'm very glad that the women and uh, girls, uh, you know, uh, have all come out and, and supported this cause. But I must say that uh, we have many more men in this institute than the ones who are here in this audience. Uh, and I see them in other uh, colloquia and, you know, talks, and I know colleagues who are not here today. Some of them may not be in the institute, but I think some of them are just not here in this hall. Uh, so maybe, you know, because sometimes maybe you need to, uh, one needs to do something uh, forcefully just to make this into a habit because, you know, it's not coming naturally to us maybe to participate in this. Because there's no point in women discussing our, among ourselves what problems we have. I mean, you know, I think we all agree uh, to a certain extent on, on, on some general issues that exist and we need to solve. But this solution cannot come from the 50% either. And the other 50% is the more privileged 50% still. We would like to change that, we would love to change that, but it's not yet the case, you know, the to top people are still uh, your uh, gender. Uh, so then in some sense, maybe, you know, next time you actually mandate it as an attendance, you know, that, you know, people who are within this institute, who are uh, from the opposite gender, 
definitely should come and the women can join online. You know, because I think the women will join online, uh, but I actually am not going to go and look at how many are online here, you know, because that's not very nice for the visitors who have come here. So I think, you know, maybe some mandatory thing, maybe not as drastic as what I'm saying, but something that I'm sure you will think of, uh, which will ensure that we have some um, participation from all genders and sec sectors. I mean, there's no point. No, uh, this Emma Watson had a speech. I don't know how many of you have come across that. It's a it was uh, titled He for She. Sure. So until that happens, I don't see much point in I mean, going on like this. So it, it's an awareness that has to happen across gender. Otherwise, we are in trouble. I mean, we as a society. So because we're talking about institutional policies, but then, you know, while we discussed rather holistic things, at some point we need to look at what is today. No, one of the yeah. that I think seriously, I mean, I think there is a point where an institution can play a role. And that's what I'm saying when I said this. Is that, for example, I, you know, I, I, again I tell you this. We have to have Sasha workshops, right? My poor chair has to keep on sending five mails a day to tell, please come tomorrow for this. I mean, the point is, I don't know how to do it, but I think it has to, one has to think of it, is that when a new faculty comes, young faculty comes, young students come, we have to really have an orientation discussion. And it is not a discussion just about uh, uh, sexual harassment, which is where it ends, begins and ends right now, because they are legally mandated. And I think an institution has to develop a ethos. And that is something that can come when people are convinced, unfortunately. But on the other hand, we cannot just keep on waiting that it's a slow process. I mean, I, I can say that 135 years ago, most of us, a woman was not even supposed to learn to read and write. So somebody, I mean, there is a bit of activism that we will have to take. And I'm hoping here that our male colleagues will, who are convinced will actually help us to run that activism brand, the torch. And therefore, some kind of institutional discussions comes institutional measures. Like, I like this Monash University thing very much, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you just assess yourself and tell yourself how, how aware you are of the gender issues. And then it goes beyond that. And I think, you know, it requires, one needs to invest some money, one needs to have some HR company actually design this. They have to first invest, you know, interview the faculty, the students, to realize where lies, where the shoe pinches, because there is no one form fit for all. Only you have to design the shoe and to fit the foot. But I think really serious thinking of this variety has to go, and which is completely not even yet thought about in India. We are running terribly, uh, you know, behind time, perhaps. Sorry, but I, I think, no, 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 I, I think I, I actually anticipated it with a high-powered <laughs> panel like that. So, uh, okay, so I think I do have uh, some quick, two quick questions for all the panelists. And maybe I'll start with you, Anushua. Uh, we talked about the, uh, you know, the need or maybe the advantage of having a role model. So did you have a role model or a mentor and do you have one? And can you share with the audience? That's the first question. I'll go with everybody. One at time. Yeah, so at right now, of course, I have some role model and mentor, but they are not necessarily women. But when we were like growing up, even this term role model was no, not told us to us, but I mean, Subconsciously, of course, there were like a women role model in my life, and one of them was actually my uh, classmate. I mean, she was the topper in the university, and when we were in the engineering college, and we are like really, really minority, and then we always met to feel that we don't belong here. And then having her there, like doing like supremely better than everyone else, really helped all of us. To like, yeah, so that really helped all of us. And then we, I also have another professor who happened to come and join that time. We went professor, and she was an excellent teacher and one of the best teachers I ever had. And she was a huge role model for me during the growing up years in college. And right now, as I mentioned, our CEO is a woman, and I think that helps us, all of us, I mean, that we definitely belong here and making a change. And important. yeah, that's extremely important. That really helps. 
Um, yeah, apart from our few big role models like Marie Curie and so on, about whom we used to read, I had an aunt who was a chemistry teacher. And uh, so at that time, when I was growing up, there were very few working women. And she was a teacher right at that time. And she continued as a teacher till the end. And uh, she was my role model because I looked up to her. Yeah, I can work like her. Very nice. I, I often wondered personally if Rohini had a role model. And from where you have no, actually, I will. I have a. I have a role model, and my role model is my mother. And just to tell you the story, when she got married, okay. First, when she, my fa grandfather said, after SSC, I don't have money to educate you. I have to get you married. So she screamed, and she said, you know, I. I will. You just let me go to college. The day I, my marriage is settled, I will leave college. And my grandfather actually was not. Uh, he was a very considerate man. So he said, yes, I have to get you married, but on this condition, I'll let you go to college. And in her second year, she was actually first in the university. She had got a five-year scholarship for, for Banaras Hindu University to do her MA in Sanskrit, at which point my father <laughs> appeared on the scene. And my grandfather said, now, this is it. You promised me. Then my mother said, no, I don't mind. I don't want to get married. I will be a professor. I want to not go there. So he said, it's OK with you. You will, get a, you will be a professor, but rest of the society will tell me that I did not get you married because I wanted your money. So you please get married to this man. I have made sure that he is a graduate. See, in 1945, a graduate was a big thing. So after three of us were born, my mother did BA, external. After my fourth sister was born, she did her MA. Then she registered for PhD in linguistics. At, and she was a great dramatist, so she used to go to our school, period parents teacher association, she used to direct the plays. So my school Miss headmistress said, why do you want to do a PhD? Do a B.Ed. So at the age of 42, she went to a B.Ed college, got the best student award in that year in the B.Ed mm -hmm. college. I taught her how to do statistics because she hadn't studied mathematics beyond sixth grade. I mean, this is the role model for me. I didn't need anything more. She wanted to do it, she did it. So for me, that was it, you know. Wonderful. So actually, I would like to say that, you know, I mean, as Anushwadi said, that my current role model is not a female role model. But then growing up and till now, the role models who have been constant, one of them, unfortunately, is not with me anymore, my dad. But then both my parents have been my role models because mm -hmm. I have not been you know, ever told uh, what to do in, in, in some sense. So I was naturally inclined to science and maths, and, but I wasn't, uh, you know, forced to give the exam for engineering or medical, which was a very common thing to do even when I was growing up. I knew that I wanted to do basic sciences, and I have received complete support from my parents for whatever I have done so far, continue to, you know, get that support from my mother who is uh, staying with us right now. And without her, I don't think I could have raised my daughter the way I'm raising her now. I mean, she has uh, uh, family at home and I can't always be with her. And so I, I, I just must say that, you know, this is the uh, role model that is not necessarily a career role model, but which has enabled me to have the career that I have today. But having said that, in the career perspective, my role model is uh, Professor Ramon Laflam who's the founding director of IQC, where I did my postdoc. And, uh, you know, he's not a role model simply because, you know, he's an exceptional academic, right? I mean, everyone in our field knows him. He's um, exceptional in what he does. And, of course, I would like to emulate him in that, you know, try to achieve academic excellence to the ex extent possible. So that is, of course, one thing. But the reason why he, I mean, you know, there are many such people in our field. So that is not the only reason why I consider him my role model. But the other reason why I consider him my role model is how he reacted to two instances in my life one joyous and one shattering, you know. The joyous one I'll say first, that was when I discovered that I was pregnant. 
and that was when I was still a postdoc at IQC. And I wasn't sure how he would take it. He was the director also, he was my postdoc supervisor, and you know, we were doing interesting experiments. I would just go and say that you know, this would lead to a little break and so on. I wasn't sure you know, how he would take it, so I went and told him you know, this is what it is, and so in a few months' time, I would not be able to you know, continue for maybe a few months and so on. And so uh, I, was, I was not sure of the reaction, and the reaction I got was, Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I have two children, and they, I mean, you know, if you are blessed with uh, children, that's the best thing that can happen to you. They are the future. Go and, you know, uh, enjoy this phase, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just wonderful. We should have a celebration soon. Let's have a party. You know, so the, the reaction was, and I used to have another mentor. I mean, you know, there were few, I mean, in IQC, you have more than one supervisor or mentor, as they call them. Uh, the other one was the opposite reaction. I won't name him because, you know, obvious reason. But then he was like, oh, is that so? Then uh, are you going to leave tomorrow or is it like a f little bit long tomorrow? No, I'm just, you know, I'm just telling you. Uh, it's just about very recent and uh, no, no. So then we have to find a replacement then, you know? So then uh, what are we going to do? So it was a completely different reaction. And, and the second uh, instance was when I lost my dad. And, uh, and that was, uh, you know, when I, when Raika was born, three months later this happened. So very, very interesting year for me. And I wrote to uh, Ray Laflam that, you know, this has happened. And so he wrote back and, and he, he wrote three lines. I mean, you know, I mean, many people wrote many things and so on. And, and those three lines uh, strike, uh, you know, a chord with me. And he, he was, of course, you know, sad. He said that, you know, he's sorry to hear this. And then he went on to say that, you know, uh, however, I must say that, uh, you know, uh, your father's legacy lives on with you, and now you have a little new person as well. It will live on with that person as well. So, you know, you should ensure that it lives on and, and, and treat it that way. And, you know, so, so he, he could bring about a sense of hope. I'm an only child. Losing my dad was like, you know, something I still cannot uh, recover from. And so this is something I would say is what a role model is about, you know. Somebody who through his action can support you, uh, in academic and non-academic situations. So, you know, that is my slightly long answer to this uh, question on role model. No, I think we're Who's yours? Yeah. I mean, you know, just in case we <laughs> missed you. Well, no, I was uh, only supposed to ask questions, not answer them. Um, you don't get out so easy. You know, so. Uh, well, uh, my parents definitely, but not maybe in a direct way. Uh, I don't have one role model that way. Uh, my parents inspired in me whatever I am today. Also, not just my parents, my aunt, uh, my bua actually, my both uh, grandmothers actually, incredible ladies. But I think in some way uh, I take things from everybody without you knowing. Uh, I take things from my seniors, I take things from my junior colleagues, I take things from my students, and I'm very proud of that. I, uh, I notice differences, I notice uh, you know, what all we talked about. Without you knowing, I have taken a lot even today. So I don't look at one person as my role model, unfortunately <coughs> for me, because of the times I think I grew up with, what all I saw, and it needed, again, a diverse a spectrum to be covered in for me to look up to and I take it from each one of you without your knowing. Uh, I figured out answers uh, from what you are saying, things that are troubling me and the way I want to conduct myself. So it's a, again a very long list of people that I remember and uh, you come back in strange ways whenever I'm facing a thing. I suddenly remember I have discussed something with you, something with you over dinner at JNU in my house and what we have talked about. So it's uh, amazing. I even look at Tarun now, I see the problems he's facing I, and, uh, and uh, the way he handles it. No, I'm serious actually. So you learn all the time. I talk to you, Rohini in many ways is a role model for many of us. Uh, it's, uh, it's, no, it's, it's serious, it's really true. But uh, can I name only one? I probably can't. My parents would be what I am. Uh, it's uh, my mother at 94 is still alive. Mm, uh, so yes, so it's a, it has been uh, too full. I even my granddaughter now, you know, I have a foster daughter, then adopted grandchild now, and uh, life is a bit too full. I learned from her too. The amazement. She's nine year old. The way she looks at the world, and I wonder about how 
the next generation and the next generation, what's the world we are leaving behind? What is to be done about it? Sometimes I get very simple answers from a nine-year-old. Uh, my role model, maybe, yes, but you know, uh, all of you uh, together. So thank you for being there for, uh, for us with or without knowing. So uh, it's not a perfect world, and I, don't, I expect it to be imperfect so that all the fun stays right. You do not want a very perfect world, but uh, we have to learn to be in there doing uh, what uh, we think uh, we can contribute to and then have some fun on the way and I leave the world a little better than how you have inherited it. And I think that's the way I look at it. Uh, I don't want to talk anymore. Final comment from our panelists, and I'll end with that. You know, we can then break uh, for this. Uh, and what I want from each one of you, maybe a message final for today for the audience and for me as well, for all of us. So I start with you, Urbushi. So thanks for letting me at least have a last word in something, right? So um, I would say that, you know, I actually have a very, um, I mean, I thought about this because you told me that you will ask for some, uh, you know, I have to prepare a little bit about words of advice. So I don't want to give words of advice. But what I would say is, you know, let us actually come up with an international men's day. Uh, uh, I mean, I think, you know, that is something I have been thinking for a while that, you know, uh, otherwise it seems to me that this 364 of them are not meant for any, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little strange, the message is a little hanging in the air. Maybe, you know, this is for us and the other 364 are not, right? So I think, you know, we can sort of try and, you know, maybe through our social media, I don't know, uh, you know, young people uh, should take the lead uh, to come up with this suggestion that, you know, maybe we should celebrate men on a certain day as well. <laughs> just like we are celebrating women, and then the rest of the days are equally for both of us. So this would be my you know, um, uh, message to the last four seats, uh, you know, Rose, Reggie excluded. Um, uh, maybe Reggie as well, maybe Reggie as well, I mean, very supportive colleague. So I mean, you know, I think you should think seriously about this, because otherwise, uh, I, I don't know, really. Um, we are uh, just, I mean, the same thing that I said in a different answer to a different question. We should not just go back to having such discussions one year down the line. So, you know, it should be, a, so on a more serious note, it should be a, an evolving thing. It should be something which is there in our psyche, that there are certain things which are not right, certain things which are right, and so let us try and do something towards making the first a little more right. You know, we can't solve all problems of the universe in, uh, in this little room. But at least, you know, if we are aware, uh, if we are not completely just always opaque to everything around us and just concentrate on what we like to do, then we will naturally reach there. And so it's uh, whether one day or not is a different issue. But uh, at least, you know, I would say that the younger people should take this back is my uh, message to you. That, you know, have this as something that you have in your brain. You know, a little part of the brain is there which takes this in, and whatever it is that you need to do, whatever gender you belong to, you do that. So that, you know, maybe we can go towards something better than what we are. Otherwise, we are just stuck a little bit in this yearly cycle, no? So I pass it on to Rohini, who may have much better words of advice. Yes? No? Oh, she knows. Okay. She's supposed to be the international Tarun? Yes. In the WhatsApp group, along with some wish, uh, wishes, then this, uh, this thing came that why there is not. And then I just came to know before your, you made this comment okay. that there is a 19th November, which is International Men's Day. So I want to say <laughs> one more comment, which is that you know, in our institute also, always you know, there is a women's sale and women's sale are organizing women's day. Correct. So this time I told our director that next time you make a committee of men, let them do something for women. Yeah. So I just yeah, thought I like that, that it is like related to what you are saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No. So of course, I think this is, you echoed my comment, which I always make, that these discussions should not be restricted for International Women's Day or International uh, Day for Girls and Women in Science. So that's, that you have said perfectly, so I don't need to repeat it. But I think there is something else that I want to everybody to carry. That we are not striving for equity for women or for gender equity for correcting some historical wrong. We are not doing it 
as a charity to women we are doing it because diversity is going to add to science because we are not using 50% of the resources and anybody will tell you using your full capital will really you get your full returns so once we get rid of this that this is for women and by women so let us not think that this is a exercise for women and by women this is a exercise for science and it has to be a exercise by all then and then only it will have some impact okay uh, not an advice just a suggestion uh, anything we need to ask let us not fear asking so there uh, we are in a nice uh, environment we are already in a great working place so let us ask the experts wherever we we can and uh, our own achievements and our own um, learning experience i should say not achievements learning experience let us share with those who are looking for some guidance through whatever means you have digital or non digital and at the same time let us be human beings first and foremost let us use the digitization let us decide what we need to use of the digital world and not the not the other way around yeah so my message or whatever in like, instead means for all the young women sitting at the back so don't hold yourself back i mean you are more capable than what you think you are so always i mean take up new uh, challenges and all those things and um, yeah so and then i mean do whatever you choose to do without any apologies you don't have to apologize to anyone for anything and i kind of want to end with one thing that all of you should know like must know that this famous line from feynman's book titled what do you care what other people think so as women we tend to do a lot of times what other will think and you don't have to do that i mean do whatever you want to do do it with without any apologies yeah thanks your advice no, uh, i would not uh, give any advice now but i think it has been really really nice and a uh, big round of applause for the panelist here and uh, for the excellent audience that we have one more round of applause please uh, it has been a highly uh, educative and uh, you know inspiring day i would say from the start to this point and i thank ramon research institute uh, particularly the director and the other people in the director's office who have made our visits possible uh, and of course uh urvashi the chair from the morning it's been ranjini it has been really really nice and i think we have excellent speakers one left but the rest uh the scientific content of that the sessions were terribly good and i think it's uh, really shows the way and i think next one year if this is new year then next one year what all we expect in uh, starting from the new year today so i am looking forward to that and may you set the uh, take the leadership role set the ball rolling uh, we have come a long way a long way to go and making sure that the new transformation everybody is talking about that doesn't widen the already existing gap though a lot has happened lot more to be done and i don't think we'll ever get to a point where we'll say we that it's all that. done it's all very good this has to be a continuous a continually improving uh, system uh, where i don't want a uniform code for anything i talked about it in the morning and i want to emphasize that and maybe end with that note diversity is our strength and uh, that's particularly for a research institution for an academic institution even uh, day to day the challenges we are facing in this uh, you know disruptive world as people say innovation is the only cure for it innovation or inventions of the kind i'm dreaming of cannot come if all of us uh, look the same way thought the same thing trained the same way did the same thing so i think uh, diversity is our strength and today this day whatever you call it celebrates that diversity and that's the message i am taking back home thank you very much for hosting us and thank you very much urbushi thank you very much anjali let me thank uh, rupmanjuri for conducting the panel so efficiently yes
and also to the people in the office and the computer section without whom this would not have been possible. I'll ask uh, Tarun to please thank all our panel members and uh, end the day with the concluding remarks and then we go on to another high tea. Thank you. Uh, I won't take much more of your time. Uh, I did want to thank Ranjini and Urvashi for taking the initiative. So uh, I'm really glad that all of you agreed to come. And you know, I, I know it's how difficult it is to travel, uh, despite the kind of responsibilities you all have. I mean, you know, Tanushri, uh, you know, Sudeshna, they have responsible uh, positions, Subhapati, and so it's very difficult uh, to travel, but you made it, and you know, that's really a show of great support. And uh, also, I think the whole day was a very vibrant program. So I congratulate again the organizers and also the speakers for making it so. The panel discussion was what I said I was looking forward to. I, I do agree that you know it's not the first time you have been on such panels and these have been uh, repeated. Uh, but I, I think we have scope to go forward. And I do see, uh, largely my role would be to enable whatever suggestions come to go forward in some way. And so I would also require your participation. And it's not just the academics. I, I'm also reaching out to the staff, as you know, Ranjani had done when we had done the EDI and everything. Please you know, suggest concrete proposals for what can be done. We we'll look at it and try to you know, make the best possible implementation of the same. Um, so I hope uh, next time uh, we would have a better, uh, you know, world from where we move forward again the next year and also let's see if november 19th is celebrated uh, in rri that might be very interesting to do okay <laughs> okay thank you very much and uh, again uh, thanks everyone let's have a round of applause for Everyone. And uh, there's high tea and other plans that the organizers may have talked about. Okay. Thank you. And many thanks to Tarun for enabling this.